We'll get started in about three minutes, please. We'll get started in one minute. If you could wrap up your conversations and come to the table, that'd be great. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. The uh, third meeting of the Commerce Data Advisory Council is formally called to order. I'd like to welcome everybody to the uh, David Skaggs Research Center here at NOAA in Boulder, Colorado. We are grateful to NOAA for hosting this, this meeting. Uh, Tom Carl, you'll see over here to my left, is the director. Sorry, I had it here. Yes, the director of the National Centers for Environmental Information for NOAA, and he will be joining us at the table. He'll be speaking later this morning in our session on NOAA's big data project. Um, in addition to the people that you're familiar with at the front, myself, Ian Kalin, the chief data officer for the Department of Commerce, Daniel Castro, one of our co-chairs, and Austin Doerr, the chief of staff for ESA and one of the drivers of the, of the CDAC. What's ESA? ESA is the Envi uh, Economic and Statistics Administration for the Department of Commerce. Um, and ESA works very closely with the Chief Data Officer and the Commerce Data Services team that Ian and his staff are putting together uh, to, to drive this effort around commerce data forward. Um, we have two new faces at the table, though, and I'm happy to announce Shyam Sunder, who is now the lead for, for the data initiative for the Department of Commerce. Our former Undersecretary of Economic Affairs, Mark Domes, has moved on to to new and, and big things, and Shyam has now stepped forward as, as part of our leadership here. 
And Tyrone Grandison has joined us as the officially chief. Officially now. Officially now, yeah. as the chief data officer. I mean, the deputy chief data <laughs> officer. Sorry, I didn't mean to fire you, Ian. The deputy chief data officer. Good luck on your new venture, Ian. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Appreciate <laughs> it. There it is. And so, uh, so this team, this effort is coming together, and I think that, that the council is ready to kind of push us to the next step. We're excited about this meeting and, and looking forward to this in our, in our future meetings. Uh, a couple of housekeeping items. Um, should we have to evacuate the building, we would go out that exit to the back and to the right out of the building or up the stairs to the entrance you came in. Restrooms are right around the corner to the, in the back. Um, I wanna remind us all that the room is miked and so be, be conscious of that through the course of today and tomorrow. If you need to have a private conversation or make a phone call, you can always step out to a, a room we have here over on the left, to my left. Uh, it's a, we call that a quiet room. Um, also remember to turn the mic on and off when you speak. They're very sensitive. Uh, I want to thank a couple of people right off the bat. Sarah Venema and Holly Palm from the NOAA facility here have just been instrumental in, in pulling this all together, and we're deeply appreciative of their efforts. Uh, Mike Mascola and his team are putting together the audiovisual work and, and ensuring that we have a good live stream, so we appreciate their efforts as well. I think that's all I have to say as my opening comments, so I'll turn it over to Ian Kalin, but welcome everyone to uh, the Commerce Data Advisory Council formal session. Thank you, Burton. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'll start with just a few more housekeeping items, a few more thank yous, and then we'll, we'll kick off the agenda. Uh, first, in terms of the logistics, in addition to the uh, uh, restrooms and breakaway areas, uh, coffee and refreshment, uh, breakfast refreshments are in the kitchenette to the side. Uh, we uh, want to remind you that uh, given that this is a very public uh, uh, forum, uh, a public participation event, um, we will try to be cognizant of the fact that not everybody knows everyone here at the table. I think at this point we've done enough great work that you may want to just you know, go straight to the person uh, and uh, chime into some of the details, but be aware that there are other folks that are not as familiar. So depending on what we're talking about, we may have to give a, a little context, and we'll get to that uh, structure, agenda by agenda topic. Uh, if you have a specific question, reminder, you can kind of raise your, raise your card like this, and uh, Bert and I will keep track to make sure that we can be respectful of people that have specific questions, and ensure that you have an opportunity to join the conversation. Uh, another round of th thank yous. Uh, the tour this morning, I hope you found it as fun, as interesting, as exciting as I did. So an extra round of thank yous to the great folks at NOAA uh, for hosting us in their beautiful facility uh, and providing us with some really exciting foundation for the amazing data, important critical data that uh, we're basically here to talk about and that's coming out of this fantastic government and research facility. Uh, I also want to give an extra thank you to Burton, Austin, and especially Tanja in the back. None of us would be here without Tanja. So thank you all for making sure that this event is uh, as seamless as it is so we can just jump in here and get to work. Uh, as a reminder uh, uh, for the uh, thank yous and, and logistics, though, uh, within the public format, this is not only being live streamed, it's on Twitter. So hashtag CDAC meeting, CDAC MTG. Uh, we already got a bunch of stuff. Actually, Secretary Pritzker just gave us a good a shout out just this morning. Uh, thank you, Mike Kruger in the back. <laughs> so uh, we're up, we're live, we're, we're broadcasting, and we are here to talk about uh, some really important aspects of the data ecosystem and the role that the Department of Commerce is playing and should be playing. Uh, we've teed up uh, some amazing uh, uh, subject matter experts to talk about very specific topics, and this is the, the, the tradition now with our council. Uh, what we're basically looking to achieve is a bit of a, a show and tell, and then some advice about how we can do better. Here's some stuff, here's what we're working on. There's a, a hopefully an appropriate level of detail for us to make informed decisions and, and assessments as to where there are opportunities for improvement. And then at the end of each basically agenda section, we will seek your advice, your counsel, literally, what should we be doing better? And then from that, of course, we also wanna provide some accountability for the previous recommendations that this council has made. So uh, I'll uh, say also with a bit of fun, the, this is kind of a fun time and place to be here in Boulder. Uh, obviously a lot of great weather and climate information coming out of this city and, and that's part of the reason it's on the agenda. Uh, it was actually kind of fun on just on the drive over uh, to Boulder from the airport. I felt like we were coming home because there's literally, and I forgot this, Commerce City is not that far away. So I felt kind of like a fun homecoming. Oh, I, I didn't know we were here the whole time. <laughs> uh, there is, of course, uh, some uh, uh, accidental coincidence of really interesting, I'll say, market factors. Who knew that so many political leaders or want to be political leaders, wanted to come to Boulder last night. Um, kind of fun to see how folks are talking about the role of government. Uh, and of course, for those of you that are watching the news, uh, 
by, almost by sheer coincidence, there is some big news, and I'll say loosely the data sector. Um, is all public, right? So uh, I'll just say loosely, IBM and weather stuff, that's fun. Uh, the White House uh, just released yesterday the national government, uh, the open government national action plan, basically setting the priorities for data for the administration for the next year. It's the third iteration of that plan. Number two, climate data. Printed right out there saying that this is an, a, a priority for the administration. Uh, we have uh, a number of, of other activities. Actually, from, even just from timing perspective, there's even other public councils about uh, uh, oceanic and atmospheric information taking place simultaneously elsewhere in the country. Basically, this is the right time to have this discussion. It is amazing how many folks are talking about the things uh, and try to figure out the things that we're going to be talking about here today. So it's uh, the right place to have this discussion. It's the right time to have this discussion. And I'm very excited for the next two days to see uh, what will come out of uh, your recommendations. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over briefly to Dan, uh, co-chair. Uh, unfortunately, Kim Stevenson is not able to attend today uh, for this, uh, the next two days. Uh, so we're missing one co-chair, uh, but very grateful as always for, for Dan and his support and leadership for setting up the agenda for this council. So, Dan? Great. Um, so I'll keep it short so we stay on schedule, but I just want to note this time, um, we did try and take a number of um, comments from everyone about what should be on the agenda. And so as we're going through the day, just keep in mind any changes you want uh, for next time or issues or, you know, just formatting. Uh, please let us know. Just this time, one of the things we're trying to do is obviously talk about different type of data. This is something that, Bill, you've you brought up before, and I think it will be a really good conversation to kind of you know move to a different type of data and talk about it uh, from you framework. Um, we're going to be looking at workforce issues, which is something, uh, Dana, you had brought up on the email exchange, and so this is also, you know, building off of that. And then last time we also were talking a little bit about OPM, and there seemed to be a consensus that there was interest in digging more into this, so that's going to be on the agenda for tomorrow. We also are trying to spend a little bit more time on um, getting updates mm -hmm. from the recommendations and discussions we had in the past, so we make sure we're not kind of losing any of those threads, um, and then just having more time to have discussions about recommendations. Um, so just again, if, if you, there's anything you, you like or don't like, you know, feel free to let me know for next time. We'll keep trying to change it. Um, and just again, uh, Ian, of course, has been a big driver on this, and, and Kim as well is not here. So just uh, thanks again to them. All right. Um, one more thing I was actually going to say. The uh, way we're framing the agenda, I'll say, has kind of three anchors. Um, first anchor, uh, I'll say loosely, environmental data, basically morning session. Afternoon, uh, we have follow-ups and recommendations, uh, as well as a discussion around the departmental plan, and I'll say loosely workforce. And then tomorrow is cyber and data privacy. So those are kind of the anchors. Those are the bookmarks, so to speak, as to what's going to be going through. Uh, it was actually kind of fun to, to take a tour of this great facility to see some of the basically weather, atmospheric, oceanic data in action. Uh, and now, uh, with a, a look to the calendar, a look at the agenda here, I think we can go straight into the, to the first topic. So uh, let us introduce our first presenter for, for our third meeting here. Uh, as it was already said by uh, Burton, we are very privileged to have Tom Carl, director of the National Centers for Environmental Information, uh, here at the table uh, and representing uh, a number of the great uh, leaders that send their regards, but unfortunately we're not able to join us at this uh, uh, table today. But we are very, very lucky to have Tom here. Tom, thank you for flying out. And we turn it over to you for your presentation. Uh, we'll have another presentation afterwards from uh, Brian Eiler, who I think a few of you remember from our very first CDAC meeting. He's come back for an encore repeat performance, and then we'll open it up for a uh, deeper discussion. So if that sounds good. Let's uh, kick it off with Tom. Well, thank you, Ian, and thanks, uh, Ian, uh, Dan, and Burton for getting us on the agenda. I think this is really important for us. We're trying to um, work our way through um, the considerable amount of data we have. I noticed that Ian's got I Love Data on his computer, and, and I love data too, but I also love water, and I know I can drown in water if there's too much of it. So uh, I'm hoping you guys can help us uh, ensure we don't, uh, uh, don't drown. Um, what I would like to do is just kind of give you a sense of, of some of the issues that um, are facing us uh, in the National Centers for Environmental Information. So I've got a set of PowerPoints that hopefully um, will give you a sense of, of what we are seeing as some of our challenges and some of the thoughts that we have about how we might address them and really would value uh, areas where you think you can help us think our way through some of these problems. So um, if I go to the, the first slide here, one way I tried to frame this um, presentation, and there's a, probably a million different ways we 
could have done it, but one way is to think about the volume of data we have, uh, the variety of data we have, uh, velocity uh, in terms of how quickly we can provide that data, and the veracity of it, and that is, how good is it? What does it really represent? And uh, I think that um, each of these aspects have different challenges associated with them. So I'll kind of go through over the next set of slides uh, some of the issues that present themselves to us and some of our initial thoughts and in, in how to really um, address them. So uh, on, the, on the first slide here, this is an important concept for us, and that is um, we think about data, the full life cycle of data, and that is how does the data reach us? And that for us means uh, usually, but not exclusively, talking to the people who are actually um, collecting the data, the observing system operators, or in other instances, um, uh, data coming to us via uh, other means, and we'll talk a little bit about that too. But we look at those as data providers. And so on this diagram, we've got a color-coded from light blue, dark blue, and then light lighter colors. The darker colors represent where we spend most of our time, and the lighter colors represent lesser amounts of time. But you see, it's really important for us to talk to the data generators, because we have to understand what we might expect, um, have a language that we can talk to them about uh, what their expectations would be on us in terms of providing an archive and access capability. Um, so that's, that's one important aspect of what we do. The other one is uh, listed in the middle, and that's where we spend most of our time, and it's called environmental record creation and preservation. And this really is an important aspect of, of what we call data stewardship. Once that data comes into um, uh, the, uh, I want to say the archive, for lack of a better word, um, how is that data handled? How is it quality controlled? What metadata is associated with that data? Uh, how do we understand the uncertainties behind that data? That's an enormous investment in time and resources, something that we take very seriously. Then subsequently, there will be um, a number of, of people who will want access to the data. So we have to kind of understand what applications they're anticipating using our data for so that we're not um, putting it in a way, in a format, in a manner that makes it extremely difficult for them to get access to the data. So we have to have some understanding of what they want to do to that data. And then uh, on the far right, you see understanding, you know, what decisions do you want to make with these data? And that could be decisions with other government agencies, and sometimes it's um, state and local agencies, sometimes it's within the private sector. Um, having some understanding of what those um, needs are are important because that affects um, all the aspects from collection all the way over to uh, how the data is stewarded in, in quality control. So those on the bottom, those um, individuals sometimes are thought of as providers, sometimes thought of as users, and sometimes providers are users, they've got a dual role. So we have to have a language that we can talk to these different groups to communicate what we do and why we do it in ways that they can understand. So that's a significant challenge for us. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. Uh, on the next slide, um, this simply shows the volume of data that we um, are dealing with in NOAA. Um, and as you can see, in 2011, we had a, a, a rapid, uh, or 2012, a rapid growth in our data volume. That was because the launch of the um, uh, satellite NPP, the uh, NPOS preparatory project, uh, as well as an increase in, in model output data that we brought in. And today, with our backup copy, we've got 24 petabytes of data that we're trying to ensure uh, we don't lose and can keep track of and manage. So it's, it's quite a, an enormous task for us. And that curve over on the right 
is only going to increase. Uh, we've got some important satellites coming up here. GOES R, the next generation of geostationary satellites, a new polar orbiter continuing on with the NPP uh, mission. Um, new plans on the horizon for phased array radar later on this decade, uh, and the model data continues to increase on top of all the other data. So clearly the volume uh, is, is going to continue to increase at an exponential rate. Um, so then the next question you might ask, well, is given that data, um, how much of that data is then provided to users and what are they requesting? And you can see here we've got this uh, partitioned out by fiscal years, going from fiscal year 08 to fiscal year 15. And then the dark blue is the satellite data. And as you can see, uh, satellite data is the most requested data uh, in terms of volume, uh, not necessarily in terms of numbers. These are volumes. And then you can see radar data, um, a little bit uh, less so. Um, and then model data. Model data, if you look proportionally, is the fastest growing in the last three years. And then all the other uh, data, ground-based, ocean-based data in the darker purple. Um, so this is a lot of data that's delivered, um, six petabytes, and, and it then you're going to see some challenges that we have uh, with respect to being able to deliver that just in terms of the velocity. Um, so clearly the data is used, a lot of interest in it, um, six petabytes, uh, and Brian's going to talk a little bit more about the big data project and, and the need and request for these huge data volumes and the experiments we're trying to do. So I'm not going to be touching on that, so Brian will go into that in a lot more detail. Um, with respect to the increasing volume, um, I just wanted to make note of some policies that are going to continue to put pressure on the demand for access uh, to the archive. Um, we have uh, an o a U.S. open data policy, and that is, you know, all the agencies now are asked to ensure that every time we go out and collect data, that data now is made available to the public, and that isn't just the NOAA data, but that's other agencies' data, National Science Foundation, NASA, uh, look at all the environmental agency data's, data sets out there. It's quite, a, quite an additional number. Um, within NOAA, we have a plan for um, uh, the public asks us to research results for PAR, and it has a lot of our scientists and observing system operators um, really wringing their hands, how do we ensure that we've got a data plan now for the data that we're going out and collecting? And um, in the past, I would say it's fair to say uh, a number of years ago, uh, data was kind of the last thing people thought about. It was often, you know, let's go out and collect the data, let's understand it, let's do some predictions. Uh, and now, uh, with the PAR, it has to be part of the first things we talk about. So clearly, it's going to increase the data volume. Um, there is new data uh, around NOTA that's, that's going to be collected. Um, a lot of demand for integrated data products. So data that um, might have been discipline-specific, now all of, a, all of a sudden, there's going to be a great need for data integration. Examples, if you're trying to understand coastal inundation, you simply can't look at sea level rise by itself. You have to look at bathymetry. You have to look at, at upstream rainfall from rivers and streams. We just saw an event in South Carolina, and we saw what the effect of, of winds and waves and tides and heavy precipitation. Um, all these things have to be integrated to really try and make sense of, of what we're seeing and try and avoid these hazards. Um, so big demand for blended data, and I'm going to end on what I think is one of the biggest challenges we face in NOAA, and that is blending data sets from a variety of observing systems. A real challenge because we have a lot of specialists, both scientists uh, and IT specialists are very good um, uh, in one slice because they're specialties, and now the real issue is going to be how do we combine some of these things. Another issue with these large volumes 
<coughs> we phrase it here, lossless, maybe it shouldn't be versus, but lossless and noiseless data. Um, we've looked at IT data compression, and that's helped us along this way. For example, with our radar data, we can compress it about 16 to 1, so our volume is not so great, and, and that's, that's a nice compression ratio. Satellite data, it's a little harder to compress that way. It's more 2 to 1. Um, in model data, I've got a question mark there because we're still trying to think through how we can best do that. And that's where we've got this thing called noiseless listed. Um, clearly, there may be some need in some instances to save all the data. But in many instances, we can think through some of the um, uh, scientific ways of compressing the data, some of the statistical ways, principal components, eigenvectors, how much um, uh, of the noise do you really want to save? And, and we know for some inst um, investigations, you might want to save all the data, but in many other cases, that's not necessary. Um, some investment in, in thinking through um, how best to um, compress that data from a standpoint of what science is going to be used with the data, what application is going to be used with data is really necessary. And so for the model data, we know um, some of the principal component analysis, some of the eigenvector analysis may explain 99.5% of the variance you can compress in a great uh, reduction in volume and throw out a lot of the noise that uh, uh, isn't really looked at very much. So those are all investments we need to think about. On the next slide, um, again, variety, thinking about the customers. I mentioned the three types of customers, kind of the providers, we have to talk to them. Uh, sometimes they're providers and users. They're interested in both what they're going to provide to the archive, but they're also interested in accessing that. And then the users who really are interested in, in trying to pull out of that archive uh, data on a range of space and time scales, different contextual ex expertise is needed. And so we have to keep in mind all those differences. And I'll show you a little example here of how that plays out in practice. Um, in terms of customer needs, um, we can think about um, different economic sectors. One way we thought would help us organize the data. Our data is by sectors. Um, in, in terms of registering users, we right now don't uh, ac actually have a, a data registration, but if we knew people voluntarily signed up for uh, registering their data and they were interested in agriculture, we probably could point them to some data sets that um, would be of particular interest to them, as opposed to someone who comes in, for example, in the healthcare uh, arena. Similarly, regional, a lot of people come in from a regional perspective. And societal challenges, I mentioned uh, coastal inundation, coastal resilience, there's a number of other societal challenges. So we could think about organizing our data along those, those um, lines. Um, I think that's a challenge for us right now, and we would welcome your thoughts as how best to do that. Um, one guiding feature that we also want to consider is um, and this is a qualitative assessment of, of some of our typical users. If you look on the left, the first row, we've got typical users. And, and by far the, the greatest volume of users, 70% in that donut, is that dark blue. That's the business community, the media, the public. And typically they're coming in for some qualitative information they really seem to prefer point and click graphics, quick assessments. Um, they don't want big data volumes, they just want low data volumes, but they come in frequently and they want their data uh, and information um, really um, uh, summarized in a fashion that makes it easy for them to understand because their primary interest is something else. They're trying to use this information for other decisions. Then you see in the bottom two rows a uh, different set of users, uh, researchers, um, climate, weather consultancies, uh, about 15% of our data uh, requests. They want quantitative information. They're doing digital downloads. Um, their access is, is uh, low frequency but high volume. And then there's another set of, of, of group of people we call value-added providers. 
they really want quantitative information. They also want digital uh, downloads, um, but they don't um, uh, want large volumes, but they come and ping on our data sets frequently. And we frequently find out about them when our systems go down because we hear from them that, uh, hey, you know, we've got some business model here and you're not providing our data and we need it on a regular daily basis. Uh, government shutdowns are good ways to find out who really wants the data as well. I'm not advocating for that by any means, but um, um, it, it has been uh, uh, some learning experiences there for us. Uh, the next slide shows some of the products that we provide. These are uh, taking the data that we come in with and, and doing some processing on them. We do have mandates in, a, in the National Centers for Environmental Information in terms of providing information. Uh, a lot of this is for uh, other agencies, but some are just congressional mandates. And you can see the products are from local all the way to a national scale. And they're put out from a daily, weekly time scale all the way to only once a year, sometimes once a decade. Uh, things like um, FEMA comes in and, and looks for when we've got major disasters, like a major snow event. You know, with a, want their snow data, and they want that updated when the snow event fall, occurs. Uh, that's kind of a daily, weekly uh, activity. And you look at the far right, uh, then we do national and international assessments. Uh, that's synthesizing all the data, putting it together in a way that we can understand how things are changing and varying and everything in between from uh, developing uh, tsunami warning kind of data sets to looking at uh, solar activity sunspots for power distribution. So you name it, there's quite a variety of environmental data that various users come in uh, to um, uh, try and access. Um, on the next um, set of um, PowerPoints, I'll talk a little bit more about, so who are these people and how do we reach them? Some of it is direct contacts. Um, they're often ad hoc. They come in through email, telephone calls. We get about 20,000 requests a year either through telephones or email or fax requests. We actually can talk to real people. We used to think a few years ago, boy, you know, we're going to get in the digital age. We're not going to talk to anybody. We're not going to need to be able to do that. Well, I don't think that's the model we're going <laughs> to probably end up going to, although I did hear, um, you know, we're getting better and better with um, uh, providing uh, um, artificial intelligence, giving information to people um, without a human presence uh, being there. Um, still, the human presence for our practical purposes we stop, find is still quite valuable. People frequently coming in not knowing what they are looking for, uh, people on the phone then uh, answering it. And quite honestly, um, I don't think it's possible to have a perfectly designed website. You always have people who are going to come in and be a bit confused. And by no means is our web our websites uh, perfectly designed. Um, there's requests for information. Um, we know that a lot of people have told told us um, we um, we want to know what you're you're about to do. So we've gone out and put out RFIs. Um, quite honestly, uh, kind of a low response rate. Not a lot of people reading those things. Usually the responses we get back are for uh, people trying to provide some services for the government, not, not essentially users. Um, I mentioned, you know, we thought a little bit about online user registrations. That's another possibility. Uh, we know other agencies have done that. We value your thoughts there. Surveys, we've done surveys. We've done those every couple years. Um, we don't get a high response rate. Um, usually there's several thousand people respond back to the surveys, which, which is helpful. Um, but considering, you know, 20,000 contacts a year and if you do web hits, it's far, far more than that. Um, in fact, if we count web hits, I think 20 web hits and we say we got a user and I think those things are up in the millions, so we know it's quite high. User workshops, we've had those in-person events, trying to bring together scientists, archivists, and users. And I think those are successful to the extent it, it, it increases our interaction from uh, our archives and scientists. 
but they're expensive to run, and particularly in days with travel constraints, they're, they're really not always that practical. We've done some executive forums. We've actually had ones with the Secretary of Commerce where we brought in some key um, uh, venture capitalists, some key companies come and tell us what their needs are from the data side. Uh, we did that several years ago. We thought that was quite helpful, but again, they're difficult to sustain and they tend to be kind of one off. So we're always looking for ways in which we can continue this interaction. I think this committee, that was one of the things we we're so excited about getting on this uh, agenda here because this might be a real opportunity for us. Um, on the next slide, um, we know that uh, um, the private sector is very interested in what we want to do. Um, and w quite honestly, uh, we are struggling. Um, I continually go back to um, our folks and say, we need to put up on the web what our plans are, where we're going to go. And I can tell you there's a lot of reticence um, well, what if we're not successful? I mean, so we're advertising what we might do, and we don't know we're going to be able to uh, quality control this data set. So I think we need to figure out a way to get out of the mindset of saying, here's the kinds of things we're, we're hoping to be successful, getting some comment and feedback. There's a lot of, of um, timidness, uh, I think, on our part of if we say we're looking at an area and then finding out, well, gee, we don't have the resources, we weren't successful in that area, uh, what the ramifications of that would be. So somehow we need to figure out a way to, to go out there and talk in an open environment. Here's the kinds of things we could do. Some of them may be successful, some of them may not be successful. I was out here yesterday talking to our NCI colleagues here in Boulder and that was one of their major concerns was how do we, how do we get those good ideas out there um, recognizing, you know, we have such tremendous uh, need and desire for performance metrics, how you're doing, um, can we be allowed to fail? And I think we have to be able to uh, work on that. Uh, you know, let's get some ideas out there. Some may work, some may not. Um, recognizing one size doesn't fit all, we said that. Importance of standards, talked about that. Um, I talked to Bill uh, Gale here a little bit earlier this morning. One of the things that we recognize it's really valuable to have a third party to be able to go and talk to about what we might want to do as opposed to having these one-offs um, which are difficult to orchestrate. Um, if there was a forum we could regularly go to that brought together a lot of data interests and we could talk about what we would do, want, like to do, get some feedback, um, that might be interesting for us. Um, we talked about trying to develop these partnerships. The big data partnership is one example for, for big data users. There might be others. Um, just looking at the time here, I think I've got a, a few more minutes, so not too far. Um, going on to velocity, so we've got um, high-O demand processing um, as a, um, a real challenge for us. And that is um, we recognize that um, a real critical role for us is providing what we call reference data sets. The data sets that you want to use to go and do all kinds of value-added applications on. And that then requires the fact that once the bring in the data, its real value comes in is ensuring its, its process to the, to the most um, and, and latest uh, scientific uh, um, uh, processing algorithms that uh, we can afford. Um, we recognize we're limited if we have all our data on, on ro robotic tape the reprocessing we can do is very limited because it's very slow to access that. Um, spinning disk is, is more expensive and we typically end up uh, just having frequently used data put on spinning disk. Um, and so what are some other solutions? And the cloud may be um, a real uh, uh, new opportunity for us. We've done some experiments. We've actually reprocessed some SST using, using some of the cloud capabilities and found we were able to reprocess much, much faster 
than the typical ways that we've reprocessed in the past. Um, looking at feder federated versus centralized solutions, um, moving data around has gotten to be extremely expensive and prohibitive within NOAA. So one of the things that we're thinking about is, is there a way we can f federate in place um, having common standards? Um, one example um, that we've struggled with is just moving the model data. Um, we've got um, model data that comes from our National Centers for Environmental Prediction in Washington, D.C. Uh, we've been trying to move that data down to um, our class facilities, which is um, here in Boulder and, and in Asheville. It's taken a couple years to move that data, and it's very slow, very cumbersome. There's competition on the machine up in Washington because they're doing operational weather forecasts. Uh, moving that data down here, uh, down here, down here, and in Asheville has been a real challenge, and so I think we need to think of some new strategies, uh, maybe to federate the archive, uh, keep it in place, having standards, having the stewardship uh, done in place. So that's some of the things we need to be thinking through. Um, you see here uh, our capability to move data has been in the order of two to five terabytes a week, and that just doesn't keep pace with the amount of data that NOAA collects. Um, what delivery mechanisms do we have? I mentioned CLASS. That's an acronym for our Comprehensive Large Array Storage System. I don't know if you walk past that here on your tour, but we've got one CLASS uh, facility here, one's in Asheville. Um, that right now contains all of our satellite data, and it's beginning to incorporate some of our non-satellite data. Um, and it, it's heavily relied upon for satellite subscription-based services. Um, and quite honestly, for our satellite data, it is the way to get um, satellite data accessed uh, in NOAA. Um, but then we have considerable other data that's still not on class. We've got another system called uh, Climate Data Online or Environmental Data Online. Uh, it's for our non-satellite data, usually less voluminous data and it's delivered usually within 24 hours, and it is an aging system developed a number of years ago, and we need to be thinking about how we're going to um, uh, move users from that system to another system. Um, I mentioned cloud access. Um, trying to figure out what we want to do in the cloud, there's a lot of issues there for us from security issues, digital signatures to ensure the data you're getting is indeed the data that's consistent what's in the archive, uh, making sure we can regularly update the cloud copy to be consistent with what's in the archive, either because the data's been updated or because it's been reprocessed. Um, we want to ensure we've got transparency in the data stewardship of anything that goes out in the cloud. Um, there is an enormous amount of investment in, in the um, environmental um, reprocessing of the data to ensure we've got good reference data sets. Um, that has to be understood by the data users. And um, I think I'll show you an example of, of what we do there here in a second. Um, in terms of, of the uh, potential solutions, um, that we might have in terms of velocity. Uh, I mentioned uh, within uh, our own data centers, our own uh, National Centers for Environmental Information, trying to integrate uh, in terms of a federated approach, uh, the big data partnership, there may be some opportunities there for us as well. Um, providing those data management tools and services that can really link together uh, the data uh, across NOAA and outside NOAA in many cases. Um, for example, we get data from uh, National Science Foundation who goes out and collects paleoclimate data that's provided to us in all different formats and trying to put that in a common way so people get access to. We have data from um, a number of agencies in terms of um, economic disasters from environmental events and from um, insurance companies in terms of what those uh, 
uh, events, costs. Uh, we pull all that together, pull all that data together, try to provide it so that people can get a common uh, look at what the cost of an environmental event is. Um, that requires a lot of integration, a lot of life cycle uh, planning. Um, so making sure you can discover and access the data, a whole set of challenges for us from metadata to catalog services to data management capabilities. Um, all those things are other opportunities for us to work with this committee on. Um, I did mention just a minute ago the importance of reference environmental data records. You see on the right here in this diagram, what you get if you just bring in the raw data from the different observing systems, and this is an example when you bring in brightness temperatures from satellites. Brightness temperatures are used for many, many applications. And if you just bring in the raw data and try to do something with it, you can see what you find is um, you can identify when new satellites come on. And usually people aren't that interested in knowing exactly when new satellites come on. Um, they can read that in the metadata. What they're interested in is can we get an environmental record that really reflects what's going on in the environment? And that takes a lot of processing and reprocessing. And that's what we refer to as reference environmental data records. Um, that is um, a huge investment in, in resources. Uh, we've been working with the research community to um, uh, ensure that their algorithms that they uh, have invested an enormous amount of time and resources on are well documented. People can understand what they get. And that um, is really important because people who then use this data uh, want to know where it's coming from. And that's the, the ability of us to, to track the source of the data. The next slide then shows, oh, I've got one more slide after this one. The next, next um, diagram shows um, how we want to use the language when we talk to our users about the data that you're looking at, where it's coming from. We've got something called tiers of data stewardship. And the most basic thing is just bringing in the data and preserving it with some metadata, doing some basic quality control, finding random errors and so forth. And then you see in the middle, three, four, five, some significant investment in scientific improvements, drive products. We've worked um, uh, some protocols in the community, published a number of papers, worked out with other agencies. Um, uh, these tiers of stewardship to get to what we call a gold standard, level six. We do have some data sets that we would say these are really gold standard data sets. They've been evaluated. They've been through the ringer, so to speak, and well documented. It takes a lot of steps in between to get there. It doesn't mean the data at level one or, or even through those different levels of maturity aren't useful, but that we have to be able to explain to users what it is you're getting when you want to use those data. And then lastly, I want to end with is, uh, this is an enormous challenge. Uh, this slide tries to show you just one simple question like, I want to understand how precipitation has changed at a given place on the planet. I can provide you an answer and I can go to a particular satellite from NASA. NASA's got a couple satellites. We've got a couple satellites in NOAA. Um, and I can give you an answer. There's some advantages in those data sets. This I'm gonna give us some global coverages, but there's some disadvantages listed on this slide in red. I can go to radars and give you another answer. There's some advantages in using that data and some disadvantages. I can go to precipitation gauges and give you another answer, specific points. I can go to models, and models have some particular advantages and disadvantages. Where the real value here is pulling all this together and trying to give the best answer, identifying the, taking advantage of the uh, certainties and uncertainties in each of these data sets, that requires an enormous investment in understanding these data sets and a lot of data processing and data access. So I think this is really the important challenges for the future. The problems that we want to solve, just understanding precipitation at a given location and then combining it, what we talked about earlier with 
um, tides and uh, winds and waves and sea level along the coast, you can see the enormous challenge of data integration, a, a real challenge for us, and we would welcome your thoughts on how we can work through this. And with that, um, Ian, turn it back to you. Tom, thank you so much for that uh, comprehensive uh, and insightful presentation. Uh, I think the questions in particular are those that are uniquely relevant to this council and also not just even to, I'll say loosely environmental data, but really all government data, some of the questions you asked. So I hope, hope we get to those. Uh, we do have two more presentations before the open session, but this is not a, a shy, shy group. So perhaps are there any folks that would like to ask some quick questions to Tom? Maybe just to clarify what was presented before we get to the active discussion and the other two presentations. I saw uh, Kati's uh, name at first. So Kati, please go ahead. Do you have any citizen science contributed data sets and what percentage of the overall data volume is it? Yes, we do have some citizen science data sets. Um, it's, a, it's a very small percentage of data volume, um, but some of it is quite, quite important. So, uh, Steve next. I have a lot of questions, but I'll just ask one now. Um, on the citizen, di uh, uh, citizen science, we have a lot of IT skill around the world today that's grown exponentially over the last decade. How much um, climate weather science skill do we have commensurate to IT skill in the population outside of NOAA? Like, I, I love the work you guys are doing. It's brilliant. I'm just curious. Uh, it's so difficult to chunk up, to, to make sense of all that data. How many resources outside of NOAA and outside of people like Bill and the weather community that is in the general population would you estimate there is? Um, it, far greater number than inside our... our in CEI. Um, we, quite honestly, um, if you go to uh, many of our professional meetings, um, enormous insights um, in terms of the data we have, and many of them come from outside the community. Have you ever considered um, engaging that broader um, community in helping to transform the data into um, make it more understandable for the general public? That is, have you ever considered uh, taking advantage of this broad external resource base to uh, work with the data itself? Yeah, I, I think I would say we've spent far greater investment in, in developing the reference data sets as opposed to trying to look at how best to integrate it all and make it more readily available. So that's an area where if you look at the proportional investment, it's small relative to kind of stepping back and saying, how do we get this data at these reference levels? Uh, a quick point of order for those that are participating uh, through the live stream or already getting some active contributions through Twitter. Probably should have said this at the beginning, but I'll, I'll say it now. Uh, we won't do full, we're going to propose that we don't do full introductions, biographies of all those at the table. We're just going to refer to first names and just get into the business. But for those of you that would like more information as to who's asking the questions, uh, who are the folks at the table, it is all available through our, our website. Uh, if you're watching the live stream, the links are actually there for the biographies of the council members. You can download the presentations that were uh, sent in advance. Most of the presentations are there, so you can uh, follow along uh, and get an idea of who the folks are at the table. But that being the disclaimer, let's get back to the conversation. So I think the next question was from Dana. My question is slightly at a different angle, which is that one of the things I can't help but notice is that you're studying the environment, right? A lot of this data is about the environment. And yet there's not necessarily consideration about how the practices of collecting, storing, sharing, disseminating data has itself an environmental impact. Um, the cost of storing that data you know, has implications for power, for water, for all of these other elements, the distribution of these, um, the, the backups of these. I'm curious, as you're starting to deal with you know, customers of different form, how much are you guys having a conversation about the environmental decisions that, you, that, that go into um, you know, making all this data available? 
Uh, when you say, uh, for example, energy needs to run a data center, is that what you're en driving energy at? Energy needs, coolant needs, right? The process of yeah. cooling data, yeah. what is kept in live storage, what is kept in, in, in cool storage, like all of these different layers of what we do with all of this data as you have these hockey stick curves that you're seeing. Because I think that there's, there's a desire to make all of this available and there's a desire to replicate and, and consider it. But there's also a trade-off. Because, you know, as we saw from, you know, your beautiful uh, global maps, it's like there's, there's uh, you know, offput from everything that we do. How do we consider the offput from the data that we're producing? Yeah, and, and I would say we certainly have considered the energy, for example, requirements for where we store our data. Um, has that been... Um, a driving factor, um, in some instances, yes. Um, where uh, I can think of our, our archive in Asheville, for example. Um, some of the considerations is, well, would, will we really have enough cooling capacity uh, to store all the data? Um, it turns out we, we have been able to do that, um, largely because we have a lot of data on tape as opposed to you know, all on spinning disks, so the cooling. So we, we've accommodated some of the uh, constraints that we've had um, through solutions that perhaps aren't ideal, um, but have been driven by, well, how would we work in an environment where we know these are gonna be some of the limiting factors, if that's, if that's what you're driving, driving towards. I think it's going to get much more complex really quickly, especially as we try to get more people online. And like this question of citizen science, this question of getting more and more people playing with this data is both a delight from an intellectual point of view and the possibility of, of making a difference, but the costs will be more than economic costs. And people don't think about, they think about the hardware elements. They don't think about the data elements of all of what we're doing. Karen. I really particularly enjoyed your last example with a simple question, but with so many data sources that could be pulled in to answer it. And kind of feeding off of what Steve mentioned about you know, um, helping you know, uh, the, the general public see that data, I sort of wonder about even if people within NOAA would be able to really quickly find that stuff. It seems like there's a big challenge in even a really technical person going in there and finding the resources. And I think that that's something that, that um, I remember too on an earlier slide that you had, the level of efforts were kind of color coded with dark blues being a lot of stuff. And one of the lightest ones was sort of in that um, space of showing what data is there and, and making it accessible. And I, I just, I, I wonder what you see internally as far as having people work together and knowing where your data is and how to access it. Yeah, no, I think w w one of the issues that I think we're going to have to address is what is it that we, being NCI and the federal side, what are we good at? What is it that we can do uniquely? And what are those things that others can do more effectively? And I know Brian's I'm going to lead and write to Brian here because w one thing and we'd love the discussion, we'd kind of go back and say, because we have discussed this with not all companies, a number of companies, where we've come and said, hey, we've got this reference environmental observing system, these reference data sets. Um, how much interest do you have in doing, taking this on? And some of the response we've got is, you know, that's an awful lot of investment. And we don't know how many users there can be for what, what investment we'd have there. And so what we've tried to say is, well, that's maybe where our focus should lie. But having done that then, you, then you see um, when we get these kind of big data initiatives that the government tries to orchestrate, and you got this 1,000 points of lights and trying, people trying to figure out, well, how do we connect all these things? We're just not that mature in that area. But boy, if you want to go to a specific data set, you know, we can tell you the uncertainties in that data set, what we, the algorithms we applied, what we want to do to the next version. So, 
And, and just a really quick follow-up. I was really sensitive to, to, to your comments about you know, putting out RFIs and not really getting a whole lot of response back because I think that it's really, you know, somebody like in a small business or a medium-sized business or even a big business doesn't have time to really probably pay attention to the, the RFIs that go out. So just like maybe some, some kind of challenge, challenge system or something where it's a little bit more PR to, to get some interest and enthusiasm and, and you know, some responses that are, you know, you might find somebody who could find a, you know, a business to do with, with providing that as, as a value add. And last question before we uh, proceed with the second of three presentations on environmental data. Uh, Vadim? Uh, great presentation. Enjoyed it a lot. Looking forward. Have a lot of questions on where we want to go, especially when you want to combine the data set. But what strike me is the amount of slides, the amount of time you spend talking about technical issues you have. You're talking about transferring of data of two to five terabytes per week. And you're talking about, yes, you have a lot of data, but your growth rate is five petabytes a year. We are living in the world, we are talking about exabytes. We are not talking about petabytes. Yes, petabytes is a lot, but five petabytes a year is not that much. And transferring five terabytes a day, it's a DSL line. What are the challenging? Why are we talking, why, you know, with, we're talking about satellites. We're talking about creating so much. I think download from satellites should be about the same rate in ter terabytes per day. So why are we talking about, what are your challenging challenges that you are striking and you're spending so much time on that pretty much basic technology today, the transfer of the data or storage. I was surprised to see that you consider spinning the disk to be expensive. Usually they are considered to be cheap comparing to SSDs. SSDs are expensive. Uh, where is it coming from? Is that not enough funding? Is that not enough uh, support? Is there not people to understand what is needed? What are the issues? Well, um, w clearly um, some of the solutions that we've come up with have been driven by the resources that, that we have available. And so, for example, if you look at um, uh, our model data in NOAA, uh, where we've got um, running um, our supercomputers, our climate models, all that data is actually stored on spinning disk. But there's a lot of different models um, that have been run and particularly some of the models that are used for what's called climate reforecasts and weather reforecasts, um, those are run, put on disk for, for a small bit of time and then put over back on tape simply because the cost is much cheaper for us to put it on tape. And the thought is, well, you know, you put on tape, it's not used as frequently, except if you if you really want to go through all the data, then it's a major, major investment. Um, and again, it's cost. The communication costs are not coming down as quickly as the spinning disk costs or the costs for uh, um, uh, computations. So we may, maybe you can help us think through, you know, what, what's our most effective model with the resources that we have uh, to try and address some of the issues. Clearly, um, I think the ideal solution for us would be one in which um, the data are quickly accessible, can be processed uh, very quickly, and there's no log jam in terms of um, putting out. Right now, we throttle, we, we have requests of users coming into our data uh, wanting uh, an enormous amount of data. If they ask for too much, we have to throttle them back because what happens is our systems get completely tied up, our communications, and no one else can get through. So when we see that, we call them up, talk to them, let's work out a situation where we can send you the data on a regular basis uh, and other users can still get in. Okay. I think we may come back to that topic a little bit too in a little bit, uh, especially with the next presentation. Uh, from Brian Eiler. Uh, he, as you uh, may recall from our first uh, CDAC meeting, he is the senior advisor <coughs> excuse me, to the Undersecretary for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Brian, welcome back, and love to hear a bit about the Big Data Project. Thanks. 
Uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for, for having me back. Thank you to Ian and uh, everyone on the Commerce team. It is a pleasure to see you all again and talk to you a little bit more about the Big Data Project. Um, if you'll remember, um, uh, right before uh, the first meeting, um, the Secretary of Commerce announced the Big Data Project at the American Neological um, Society's uh, Winter Forum in Washington, D.C. And we're, that was in late April, so now it's been about six months. And I would like to reintroduce the, the project to you all, go into a little bit more depth, talk about the work and progress we've achieved, and also spend a lot of time on the challenges that we've encountered. Um, the first thing I, I, I want to um, say about the Big Data Project, which I, I say at every opportunity, is um, in, in addition to all the things I'm about to talk about, the, the NOAA Big Data Project is a grand experiment. Uh, we don't know what the ultimate outcome is. Um, uh, we have some goals in mind, uh, and, and we have high hopes. Uh, but we're also there to, to, to learn lessons along the way. And, we're, um, and, and through this administration, we're, we're committed to learning those lessons uh, so that uh, we can serve uh, the American people and, and our specific stakeholder communities as well as we can. Uh, before I get started, I just want to do two quick introductions for people. Uh, there are two people here in the room uh, that I want to highlight. Um, uh, I, I, I work for the NOAA administrator, um, just trying to help organize this, this uh, kind of bureaucratic effort that, that requires all kinds of cross-line communication within NOAA. And uh, Ed Kearns, who works for Tom Carl uh, down in, in Asheville at our National Centers for Environmental Information, has been instrumental in uh, helping us get to where we need to be today. And I'm going to ask him to join us once we get into the question and answer session. He has the ability to talk a lot about uh, our, some of our data that we're working with with the Node Big Data Project on a technical level that I um, uh, probably don't. I also want to introduce uh, Amy Gaskins. Amy Gaskins is uh, as a contract with NOAA. We're bringing her in uh, full time. Today is her fourth day. Uh, Amy uh, is here to, to, to take over and, and lead the Big Data Project going forward. So the next time uh, CDAC uh, has a meeting, uh, we're going to spare her today. But uh, she's going to be in the hot seat either right next to me or by herself uh, talking about this. And we're really excited to have her. So with that. Uh, this was, one, this was the, my first slide in the last presentation. This will be the only repeat slide uh, from last time. This was just an intro to all the kinds of data that we collect. Um, what I tried to impress upon this group, the first time we talked, is just about the, the, the size and diversity, and, and diversity is really the key thing there, uh, that of all the observations and, and, and model outputs and products that we produce uh, at, the, at NOAA uh, each and every day. Tom Carl, I, uh, I think, did a great job of diving a little bit into uh, the complexity of, of, of archiving that and disseminating it and sharing it and, and having it be the fuel for uh, innovation on uh, for environmental information. Tom also talked a lot about volume, variety, velocity, and veracity. Um, the, the big data project, we hope, is one way to start learning lessons about how to address some of those issues. It's not going to be a cure-all for everything we do, but we really hope that we can make some progress along the way working with the private sector. Uh, we have, as Tom mentioned, all kinds of issues in terms of uh, technical deliverability, discoverability. And what I hope to talk a, bit, a little bit more today is also issues with general familiarity with our data. A lot of um, people and communities know about what NOAA does, but really getting into what these data sets are, what the possibilities are, what the quality of the data is, and what uh, the richness of the data is, 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 is a challenge we uh, face daily in terms of uh, trying to have work with others on our data sets. So here's the NOAA Big Data Project. It, it ba comes down to a very basic premise I think you can do in three simple points. The first one is due to a variety of accessibility issues, which I just mentioned, uh, some, I would say, a significant chunk of NOAA's environmental data is underutilized. Um, back in May, I gave one example of um, VIRS data. It's a, it's a satellite product. Uh, and it has a lot of commercial uses. But currently, 
the ability to download 24 hours worth of VIRS data uh, under the normal dissemination system requires more than 24 hours of time. And so what you end up is uh, an impossible situation where you can never keep up. Uh, the second premise is there is, we believe and, and, and we feel pretty confident that there is untapped eco economic value in that data. And so that gets us to the third point, which is the basis of the big data project. The idea is that the value of that untapped, the untapped value of that data can be leveraged to improve a lot of these accessibility issues and hopefully page for the staging of that data on the public cloud where people and organizations of all kinds can innovate as part of a market ecosystem. So traditionally, the way the government um, disseminates data, and, I'm, and by no means am I suggesting this is uh, an inferior way, in fact, um, often cases this is going to be the only way to disseminate data, is that we take appropriated funds and um, we take our data and we go shopping for data stores or we um, contract uh, with any number of, of uh, providers uh, to store our data and we do it on the government's dime and then we use those infrastructure assets to disseminate our data to all the various users. Um, we do that now. We're going to continue to do that now. Tom uh, talked a lot about how we use the cloud and, and, and there are a lot of proposals underway at NOAA to increase our use of government funded cloud services. Um, and and it's, uh, it's an asset we're going to continue ha to have to leverage into the future. But what the dig big data approach, um, big data project approach uh, is, is slightly different. Uh, we take our data and we move it uh, to cloud providers according to, our, according to the provider's needs and plans, not according to ours, uh, to help improve access to environmental data. The bargain's really simple. NOAA provides its data. Uh, the way we've got it structured right now allows for some cost recovery, but only cost recovery, uh, nothing beyond that. And it's, it's, it, it's very simple. All and any NOAA data is on the table for further dissemination. Move NOAA data onto cloud providers' infrastructure. Our collaborators choose which data sets to intake and how to use that data, and, and they stage it and disseminate it according to their own business models. We, back in April, uh, as we announced um, earlier, we signed agreements with five major cloud providers. Um, they are represented up there. It's Amazon Web Services, IBM, Google, uh, Microsoft, and the Open Cloud Consortium out of the University of Chicago. The way this works is NOAA provides its data, and the way it's funded is through the user community. We provide it for free. Granted, we might have some small cost recovery, but it's, uh, it's a minimal cost. And then uh, our collaborators find a way to provide value-added services, and it is the end user who then finds the economic solution for staging uh, that data along with the value-added service. So I chose Open Cloud Consortium because it is uh, a nonprofit and um, it's, the, it, it, it's, it's the least, quote-unquote, competitive. Um, they're, they're more interested in, in their own uh, mission, and so uh, it's the least controversial uh, example to use. This is, I, this is a theoretical example. I don't know exactly what Open Cloud Consortium is doing with UCAR, but I know they're in constant communication. Another way to look at it is, let's say Open Cloud Consortium, in partnership with UCAR, comes up with a derived product, a value-add service uh, together that they're going to um, produce as a product, and they can put that on the open market under the big data project, and they can come up with a cost, um, they can come up with a pricing system according to their uh, business model to make that economically viable for their plans. Um, and that's how it works. We do this currently under something called a cooperative research and development agreement. It's called a CRADA. Uh, this is a common tool within the government for tech dissemination. Uh, we've tried to craft our CRADA as flexible as possible in order to iterate um, all the uh, possibilities and challenges that we're going to face along the way. Uh, most of the time, CRAs deal with specific technology, and we are also researching technology under this cooperative and research and development agreement. But what we're also researching is 
understanding market solutions and the economics of trying to further disseminate um, environmental data that comes from NOAA. Uh, among all the provisions, and, and we're happy to give you a link to um, uh, this agreement to, so you can uh, examine uh, this agreement as it exists, uh, there are really two core principles. One, NOAA data as it exists now um, is not going to be exclusive to anyone. No one gets exclusive access. We will provide uh, all our data for free, but uh, we're going to try to keep it as open as possible. And second, uh, if you do, um, if one of our collaborators, one of the five I just mentioned, uh, distributes that data beyond themselves, we just ask that they do so on equal terms to everyone. That is to say, they can come up with their own uh, pricing model. It just has to be uniform so that there is no preferred status for uh, any of the end users. Uh, that's great in principle. What that means in reality is, is, a, lot of, is a series of questions uh, which we're committed to working through. So as we see it, what do the collaborators get out of this? They, they get the ability to work with um, to, and us and develop commercial data applications, um, not only for those data sets that are already available, but also for those data sets that have accessibility issues. Tom talked about some of our accessibility issues. Um, we have a lot of accessibility issues throughout NOAA. Um, and they're not all, it's not all just one accessibility issue. It depends on which data set you're talking about. And, and each data set has its own challenges. Um, our collaborators also have an invitation to enter into this research. Uh, we, have a, we have some goals on what we're trying to get out of the Big Data Project. Uh, that we hope to achieve in terms of increasing accessibility of data, but we're also in it just to learn lessons, to learn a little bit more on how the marketplace works for environmental data. Um, we're not suggesting we have all the answers. What we really want to do is have that interaction with, uh, with the private sector. And I think most importantly, what the collaborators get out of this is a level of NOAA focus and customer service that simply would not be possible under a different situation. Um, Tom alluded to this earlier, uh, the thousand points of, of access and thousand points of light. Uh, we can only deal with so many customers at once and the demand for our, our data is growing. We need partners to help funnel the, um, the requests for data, the requests for data accessibility improvements, and, and this is one way uh, to do it uh, because the partners, uh, the collaborators we've chosen to work with all have open clouds and they can help, once we can move data to their clouds, they can help us scale out that accessibility. Uh, so we're excited to do that. So let's talk about, um, well, oh, and then what do we get out of it? Well, on some level, if we're going to increase uh, use of cloud technology, uh, we reduce a little bit of our government infrastructure costs because now it's not taxpayer funding. It, th that is a, is a great benefit. It, it's actually not the most important benefit, in my opinion, um, but it is one benefit. We also have developed an ability to have market forces build an, a, an external mechanism, not an internal NOAA mechanism, but an external mechanism to help us prioritize our dissemination and accessibility efforts. And, um, and, because, and, and this is important because just making our data available and saying, you know, uh, through open um, kind of da data ca catalogs, which is something we've been doing for the last few years, is important. Uh, but what we're seeing is it's not enough. You know, it, it, and, and, and Ed mentioned this to me this morning. What we really need beyond that is to develop kind of expertise on the private sector to help work with us. So not only do they know that the data is there, but they have better ability to know how to use it. And last, and this, and this relates to that last point, um, what we're trying to do is create an infrastructure where real public-private partnerships can, can grow and exist. Um, if we're incentivizing uh, certain collaborators or partners uh, to really take a hard look at data and help us figure out what the ultimate use cases are, um, not only is it going to help us with our efforts, it's going to create... It, you're going to create more demand because you, we have agents on the other side of the public-private partnership divide who are working with larger communities in, the, in, in industry to explore more 
use cases, and we're excited to see if that's something that can bear fruit. Here's our proof of concept project. This is, what, this is the first data set that we've gotten out under uh, the big data project. It's NextRad level two data. Um, we're excited. Uh, this was announced just Tuesday. Uh, NextRad has 160 high resolution Doppler radar sites across the country. It detects precipitation, atmospheric movement, and uh, each one of those sites disseminates data uh, approximately every five minutes. Uh, NextRed has a number of uses. Primarily, it, it enables storm detections, and researchers and commercial enterprises use it uh, to study the impacts of weather across multiple sectors. Uh, for the first time ever now, um, because of our work with Amazon Web Services and, and Microsoft, um, Azure, the public now has this on my slide says access. That's, let me correct, make a quick correction. It has on-demand access to the entire NextRev archive from 1991 <laughs> to the present. That simply wasn't possible last week. And now it is. Anyone can go on to Amazon Web Services. Um, Microsoft has also ingested this data. Uh, they haven't made it available yet, but we, we, we believe they're going to figure out what their solution is very shortly, and we're excited for that as well. That's 270 terabytes, um, 180 uh, million files of historical data. Uh, we think there are a lot of great possibilities. Uh, Amazon is also working with one of our top tier providers in addition to the archived access to provide a real-time feed. Uh, what is that, the top tier provider? Does that mean the provider of the next red data or a consumer? It's a... It, it's a um, it's a provider. Well, we've already, see, this is part of what we're working through in part of the big data project. I believe it's five. We have five academic institutions, which we contracted with years ago, um, and have an agreement to disseminate the real-time feed. Uh, I believe the top-tier provider that Amazon is working through is Purdue University. Um, I could be wrong, but I, I believe that's the one. And so that was an already existing dissemination um, mechanism, and they've been a great partner of ours. But we're trying to see what kind of possibilities exist for, in the future, not only for archive, but marrying that with the real-time feed. And, um, and what the Big Data Project does within NOAA is allows us to kind of examine what some of our legacy dissemination systems are and if they make sense into the future. Okay. So in, uh, talking a little bit more about NextRed data, um, in July 2014, um, out of the White House, there was a national plan for civil Earth's observation. They went ahead and ranked um, all the observation services uh, identified through the 362 um, observation services in the federal government, uh, just in terms of value to the private sector. Number one was GPS. Number two, NextRed. And, and through this project, we've been able to achieve access uh, to that data set, and, and I think it's a, it's a great first, first win for the project. Um, all kinds of, and, and we're happy to give you, um, there's a link to this report that you can, it's a couple years old, but it shows all the kinds of uses and industry interests we have in that data. Uh, I will note, and if you look at the report, number two's um, next red, but number four is also NOAA, number six is NOAA, Number eight is NOAA. NOAA has probably the lion's share of the data sets that this report identified as of, of most interest to the private sector under their um, measurement of, uh, of, of value. So Amazon is now hosting NextRed data uh, on their cloud. Just going back to this, this basic um, model of, of, of a business model um, of how this works. We know they're working with the Climate Corporation and they're gonna take that NextRed data and uh, Climate Corporation is in the business of helping, among many things they do, helping to price uh, crop insurance. And we know that Climate Corporation is already uh, ingesting some of this data. I think they're working with Amazon Web Services to come up with new applications or to improve their applications for pricing that. 
and they're gonna and they're gonna help pay for the staging of that data, and that's why Amazon Web Services took it in. So, uh, it's we think this at least proves out uh, one way this could work. Each data set is different. Uh, so this will work for some. It won't work for others. It'll work for some companies. It won't. Uh, but that's what the big data project is about: exploring the possibilities. Um, we also know that. Uh, what this particular data set does is allows for longitudinal analysis that wasn't possible before because it was just so hard to get to the archives. Uh, you could always go to NCEI before and uh, ask for a copy of a specific time frame, um, but because of the sheer size, it was all on tape. It was never accessible in one place. Now, it's all on the web, and, and we've provided a link uh, to whoever will stage it. In this case, uh, it, there's a link to Amazon, but if one of our other collaborators wants to pick it up, we'll provide a link to that as well. And it, possible examples is um, uh, looking at migratory patterns of birds. We know uh, wildlife ecologists need this. We know the aviation industry um, can use this to impact, uh, look at the impact of weather on uh, air safety in, uh, incidents. One of the things that Amazon has told us is that the most exciting thing about launching a data set like this is that they don't really know all that could happen. The power is in having a really wide ecosystem without restrictions and just let, letting all kinds of institutions let um, know it's there and innovate upon it. And I hope in a year's time uh, we'll be able to talk a little bit more about the innovations that happen because of the availability of the next red data. Example, uh, yeah, sorry, quick point of order, if you can just make sure to have it on the microphone. Uh, we had a giant spike in uh, online viewership in just the past five minutes. Uh, so make sure that the folks that are remotely participating. Oh, yeah, uh, in the prior slide, uh, am I on? In the Prior slide, the, so in this example, the Climate Corporation is paying Amazon for access to the data on the S3? Well, that's part of the big uh, data project. We don't know. We, you know, we're, we're, not, we're not demanding to know exactly what the business models of each of the collaborators are, but we know they're working together. Exactly how they've developed that relationship, um, I couldn't say. Um, but I just wanted to give an illustration of the kinds of, of working together that could happen. They're certainly paying for EC2 and bandwidth to AWS. And, and just one quick clarification as well, if I can chime in, and sorry for interrupting Brian, but one of the uh, council members was not able to attend here, uh, CJ Moses, who sends his regards, sent a message exactly on this announcement, and so for those of you that are at a computer, just Google NextRad at AWS, you'll see some of the answers to those questions that are coming up. Uh, so what are the next, so that's the first data set. What are the next data sets? We're looking at uh, MRMS, it's multi-radar, multi-sensor. That's kind of what we like to think of as NextRad on steroids. Uh, we take the NextRad level da uh, data and we add uh, air observations, lightning detection, satellites, and forecast model data. And we come up with an output uh, working with um, uh, our facility, NSSL, out in Oklahoma, which is also a part of a cooperative institute with the University of Oklahoma. And you develop a resolution, a, a kilometer um, by every two minutes update cycle with 3D re reflectivity, mosaic, and 31 levels. levels. I'll be honest, I don't know what that means, but it sounds really <laughs> impressive to me. Um, it ingests commercial and uh, Canadian data and we know that this product assists for all kinds of weather um, analysis, uh, particularly with tornadoes, uh, precipitation, turbulence. We know the aviation industry and the FAA uses MRMS uh, to help advance their techniques um, when it comes to controlling, uh, to quality control, icing, turbulence. We also know the, indus uh, the insurance industry is very interested in MRMS data, and we're trying to figure out how we can work through the big data project to make MRMS available. Um, there, we, we've hit some hurdles along the way, but we've, we're developing uh, some solutions, and we hope to, to have something to announce in the near future. What we've heard all, a lot also is coming up with a real-time feed for our GO satellite. Tom mentioned um, our geospationa uh, geostationary satellites. 
Uh, we have uh, two in operation, one in reserve. GOZAR, which is going to be our next generation of geostationary satellites, is due to launch in 2016. Um, it's supposed to have, it, it will have uh, advanced capabilities, and then this slide mentions some of them, whether it's uh, lightning mapping, uh, solar imaging, uh, space weather monitoring, all kinds of visual imagery capabilities beyond what we already have. So right now, uh, if you want a real-time feed to our GOES, you have, uh, a company has to build a receiving station. Uh, that tends to cost, as, as I understand it, upwards of a million, a million dollars plus. If we can make it available on the cloud, uh, so companies and academic institutions can see exactly what NOAA's seeing at more or less the exact time, exact amount, the low latency that we're receiving, uh, we think that would be a tre tremendous benefit, and we're trying to see if that's feasible through the big data project, and we're working on plans to do that. We've gotten a lot of requests for real-time feeds of our numerical weather prediction models. Um, I'm just, we're just listing on this slide uh, the names of some of the models uh, we've heard uh, inquiries about, and we're looking to see if we can make that available on a near real-time basis through the cloud. Two minutes? All right. Whoa. Okay. Well, LIDAR's really cool, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you're right. All right. Here are the challenges. Here's the big one. It's a chicken and egg challenge. What we're trying to do is figure out how to foster a um, market ecosystem for environmental data. And the way you do that is through proven use cases. But how do you test a use case if you don't have a market ecosystem through which to do that? It, 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 it's, it's a tricky one. Uh, the, good, it, the answer is you iterate. You just keep going back and forth, one step at a time. The good news is on the, what we call the dry side, the atmospheric side, the weather side, there are companies out there where a marketplace already exists based upon NOAA data. And so we have that that we can leverage upon. It is harder on the wet side for oceans and water data. That market, that market ecosystem is completely inchoate. Uh, we're I wouldn't say we're starting from scratch, but there isn't a fully formed kind of industry the way there is with respect to weather data. And yet, we think that's where most of the growth is when it comes to environmental data, just because uh, it's been untapped uh, thus far. This diagram just um, shows you what we essentially have to do. We're marrying four different communities if you, communi if you count NOAA as one community. We're the government. We, what we excel at <coughs> is uh, observations, technical, um, technical uh, analysis, and deep scientific e expertise. What the companies uh, that we've identified as our collaborators excel at is infrastructure and an ability to stage data and uh, disseminate it broadly. What they tend not to have, although as the last 48 hours have shown this is evolving very rapidly, is a lot of technical expertise on environmental data and, um, and, and what those use cases are. So what part of the big data project is, is marrying the infrastructure providers with the third party value added service providers to figure out, figure out a mechanism for innovating upon environmental observations, putting it on the cloud, and getting it to our end users. It's a pretty big task because you're trying to marry all kinds of different knowledge bases and expertise together to come up with a robust ecosystem. Uh, I, I, I think it would be... Um, uh, overly ambitious to say the big data project can solve all of that, but I do think it can serve as a catalyst for having the conversations to help um, generate the, the, the conversations in order for that to happen. Here's a specific challenge that we're running into. We're the government. Let's say those pictures on the right represent us. We're trying to have these uh, real iterative collaborations with the private sector. We have different cultures. We have different ways of doing things. There is the op there's um, all kinds of opportunities for miscommunication, 
for frustration, um, for uh, trying to achieve deadlines. Uh, on, you know what one is capable of. Uh, you know, we know that some of our part, that some of our collaborators um, want things to happen very quickly, and we're trying very hard to adjust to that reality. Um, but it, it's uh, it's something that we're continually trying uh, to meet. Uh, we're also trying to get our collaborators in a place where they understand uh, we want to get to yes. We want to find ways to solve these accessibility issues. Um, but regardless of the way we do it, it, the government needs to, uh, it needs to go through its processes. And so there's a level of patience we're trying to build into the system as well. But it's just uh, something we're continually going to have to address. And finally, uh, well, next to finally, we have five different collaborators. How do we manage efficient uh, relations with each of them while also trying to not favor one over another? Uh, we're doing that on a case-by-case -case basis. We would love suggestions on how to make that happen. And, and now, finally, how do we actually define a measure success? And with that, I really appreciate everyone's time. Brian, thank you so much. Uh, of course, uh, NOAA uh, data, some of consistently the most popular and important information produced by uh, the U.S. government, and then from a global scale, there is no government sharing more data to more people. It's more valuable than this data project. This is the biggest data project of any government in the world uh, in terms of getting more of this information out to people. So it, this is huge. This is, it's an anchor uh, initiative for the Department of Commerce, for the entire administration, and I thank you again for this opportunity to go a little bit deeper into it. Uh, again, with the with a look at the agenda, we want to reserve some time uh, for Dr. Bill Gale to share some of his perspectives as well before we, again, do some further investigation. But any quick clarifying questions for Brian, just to understand a bit more about the presentation before we move on? I think I saw Kevin first. Oh, wait, that's all down the line. Yeah, I, my field division is off. All right, Austin. Yeah. Great presentation, Brian. Um, just one uh, kind of uh, point I wanted to make, comment I wanted to make, is what's really cool about this CRADA project is this agnostic to the data. And so, you know, any go large government data set could potentially benefit from this model if it pans out. So we're really excited to see kind of where you guys take it. Who's next? Karen? Okay, here we are. Um, I also really like the presentation. Thank you. And I was just wondering, with the way that the, the public-private partnerships are structured, what would be nice is if the lessons learned in those relationships wind up um, feeding back into the stuff that everybody else can get to. Is that part of the, the crater, crater structure, or are those going to be proprietary then for those, for those partners? It's going to have to take some analysis uh, on what those lessons learned. I mean, we're going to le learn some lessons within NOAA. I, I think we can, um, I think it's fair to say, we can kind of anonymize some of these lessons learned and, and, and kind of developed generalized principles upon which uh, we, we come to those lessons learned. And uh, we're still trying to, to see how long this research and development portion will continue. Uh, we, 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 haven't, we don't have a bound time frame. The CRADA itself lasts three years. But if we come to uh, great success and want to move it to something else beforehand, we'll do so. If we want to extend it beyond that, we will do that as well. Uh, so, in yeah. principle, yes, we, yeah. we, you, that's something we can do. Um, we're still working through how but to define it, it's that. It's just not built into the process right now, where the where the, the there's a, a deliberate feedback loop to the to the data provisioning of, of the partnerships. Uh, not in a formal sense. I think, uh, Kevin. Kevin. Thanks, Ian. Uh, Brian, can you talk a little bit at, at a high level about the economics around the public-private partnership? So, you know, obviously data, this data is super valuable. I mean, just yesterday, IBM acquired uh, the Weather Corp for $2 billion. Monsanto bought Climate Corp for $1.7 billion. You know, there's just enormous computational, gravitational pull behind this data. So, you know, as an example, you know, is there a rev share agreement where AWS is, is paying the government for a portion of the EC2 compute cycles that are generated around the data? Yeah. How? Okay. I, I think the best way to just answer that is we know those questions exist. The cooperative and research and development agreements under which we're having 
the, this relationship allows for cost recovery. We are not currently instituting that cost recovery because when we went through the initial research phase on how to set this up about a year ago, um, there was such a diversity of opinions. There were far more questions than there were answers, and we could not get to a point where we could craft a, um, a uh, kind of one-size-fits-all solution to, to making this work from the economics. We kept realizing we just have to, we just have to iterate. We, we have to have this conversation and discover this on a case-by-case -case basis. And part of what the Big Data Project is, as a research and development agreement, is trying to figure out when that's appropriate and when that's not and what the correct mechanism for uh, making that economic transition happen. And, and when we do come out with our lessons learned, that's going to be probably number one on the list. A quick follow-up question then is how, how long is the agreement? Uh, the agreement's for three years with, a year, with the option to renew on an annual basis. Uh, but uh, the agreement also has provision that anyone can walk away at any time, either from the private side or, or the government. And I, I see it as an open conversation uh, to investigate these issues. I think uh, Vadim and then Katsi after that. Uh, great presentation and also great work behind it. Well, just listening to your presentation, I open up, I downloaded a sample of the data sets sitting here and where you look, it's Python code of how I can visualize it. But what, when I was looking through the presentation and listening, you create that system, eco ecosystem between large companies which would consume it, which would use it for different play, uh, purposes. What I think is really missing, and I'm not sure if you're not there yet or you didn't think about it, is educational. So this data is cool. Everybody is talking today about weather data, but everybody is talking about climate data. Mm -hmm. So do, are you planning to do some kind of outreach to high schools, educations, you know, do hackathon with high school and who can do better visualization? With Python called, I look at it, I'm thinking, you know, high schoolers, you know, they can do a lot of really cool stuff. And it would create a lot of momentum going on the data usage and going forward of how other parts of the government can do something similar. Yeah, those are all great possibilities. The way we are looking at it right now, again, we're, we're, we're open to being flexible and changing the way we do this. Um, but we're looking for our collaborators to help us figure out how to drive that. Our, our, the, the five parties which, we, we see, which I put out there are, are our links not only to industry but to academia and uh, to the greater community. Um, one of the tensions that we face is how much of this should be what our collaborators want to drive as some of the data sets. And the way we set it up, that's gotta be the principal mechanism. But we also wanna investigate how we can, as a government agency, identify data sets that we think uh, have a lot of value potential and, um, and, and, and get those out there for accessibility. One of our collaborators is the Open Cloud Consortium. They're a nonprofit organization. They don't have the same profit motive as our other collaborators, and they've been talking to us a lot about making these data sets accessible to some of the kind of groups that you've been mentioning as well. And we're having some interesting conversations with them. Uh, real quick, before we go to Katya, if I may, um, the, the benefit of uh, tech on our side, uh, CJ Moses is clearly participating remotely and would like to offer this official response to one of the, the questions that came in. So to answer, this is quoting now, <clears throat> to answer the question posed during the NOAA presentation, AWS hosts many public data sets such as the data from NOAA for free, and anyone can access that data for free. Of course, many AWS partners customers may choose to then utilize other AWS services, for example, EC2, uh, virtual machine, machines, or EMR on managed Hadoop clusters. To process that data at marginal hourly rates and store the resulting data in AWS or other storage location of their choosing. So there you go. We got we got at least some remote participation from one of our official yeah, members. Half, well, you can just tweet at it. Have him, okay, CJ, if you can hear us, <laughs> Kevin says that's half the answer. Okay, uh, Kati, please. Uh, that's a good point. Please bring it up again, actually, on mic. There, there's an economic part of the answer that's missing. Mm -hmm. we, I, I totally get how data flows and how compute around the data flows, but there's there's a you know, an unstated relationship about the economics around EC2. I mean, those, those organizations that are using NOAA's data 
consuming EC2 resources are paying Amazon, and there should be, if there's not, there should be a, f a continuing downstream flow of that money from Amazon back to the government. No, okay. Well, uh, let me, let me, well, uh, you know, we, I will, we'll say this. This is exactly the kind of question that I hoped would come up, but I want to be respectful also to the preparation that uh, Bill has done for his uh, perspective on this ecosystem. So keeping please to the clarification of Brian's presentation, it's understanding what is being said with a descriptive rather than prescriptive. Uh, any other questions on the descriptive side of what Brian is sharing here? I, I do believe Katya was next. And how far do those partnerships help to um, standardize certain types of um software and, and, and data formats, and how far do they help to interlink NOAA's data to other data sets? So far, not yet. I haven't made progress on, on that front, but this is an avenue to have those conversations. But this, this, this gets into an intersection with some of the things that Tom um, was talking about in his. I, we're also trying to figure out what the big, big data partnership can be and shouldn't be. You know, it, it, it can be a, a, an avenue for conversation and collaboration. I don't know that it's the solution uh, to solve all these issues, uh, but it's it it's the, be, the the virtue is is that it's an iterative process, and we can bound our goals along the way. Yeah, I'll just okay, and then Steve, and then we'll go to Bill's presentation. I just have two comments. Uh, one about the partnership, and uh, the second one in answer to Kevin's question a little bit. Maybe I can provide some insight about your question first. Uh, IBM is a creative partner, and we are delighted to be a creative partner. We really have enjoyed this process tremendously. We have learned a great deal. Um, NOAA has been fantastic to work with. Uh, Brian especially has been fantastic to work with. Uh, we are all learning a lot from collaborating with them, and I think it's a really valuable tool, and I applaud NOAA for taking on this experiment. Tom, you mentioned that NOAA sometimes is too timid. I think in the case of the CRADA, they're demonstrating that they can be uh, bold and experiment, and I think that's really commendable. Um, you know, it's a hard process, Kevin, to figure out um, how to make money on data that nobody has ever worked with. So just imagine for a moment one of your business associates comes to you, somebody at Socrata comes to you and says, um, I need a few hundred thousand dollars to host a few hundred terabytes of data because I think I can make money on it. And you want a business case for that. You know, what's the business case for it? Well, we don't know because no one's ever worked with that data before. We're not sure if our client really wants it. They think they might want it. Um, and we have to experiment with it. And that's, that's a difficult sell inside of a company. Um, it's not easy to figure out how much money can we make on something we've never seen before. And by the way, in order to use it, we have to make it public first. So we can't just host it in our little private cloud and play with it for a while because it's the public's data. So we have to make it public first, and then we can play with it. Um, that's a bit of a challenge. Um, uh, I, I hope we can work through it, but it is a bit of a challenge. Now, as for the economics of paying NOAA for the data, I would say we as American citizens have already paid NOAA for the data. NOAA is funded through taxpayers' money, and they've been, they're funded to collect this data and make it available back to the public. I think if corporations then pay NOAA again for the processed data, I think that's I think that's the wrong model. I think it's the wrong model because it also sets up an economic barrier to uh, additional um, public use of the information. I think we have to go beyond the CRADA today and to be got, try to explore something that Tom alluded to and it was in my question, which is how do we build ecosystems that can take advantage of this data beyond large corporations? And here I'm speaking as just an American, as a participant in this group. I think that there's a global interest in having much more climate data available for many more parties who have the skill and the technology to take, to take advantage of it and to find things that all of us in the room in all of our large organizations can't possibly find because even IBM with 400,000 employees, we're not 320 million Americans. And I, I think there's a public interest in getting this information out there so that more people can play with it and discover things that even the largest organizations can't. All right, I think we need to continue this discussion uh, because I think it is at many points at the core of a lot of uh, the previous recommendations that have come up. Um, but before I, I uh, provoke with a bit more questions, I'd like to offer the floor uh, to Dr. Bill Gale. We all know Bill, uh, Chief Technology Officer for the Global Weather Corporation. We'll turn it over to you for a few minutes and then uh, 
we'll actually take a question about take a little, little break perhaps before we get into the uh, deeper deliberations. But if we can power through, uh, Bill, I'd like to turn over the mic to you. Great, thanks, Ian. Uh, welcome to my world, everybody. Wow. <laughs> Um, I, I want to thank Tom and Brian for great introductions, and I, I think you can start to see the complexity of the, the data that NOAA deals with. And so I wanted to go through um, really quickly some lessons that we can use to start driving our discussion today and, and in the future. So I've got seven lessons here, and I'm going to add a few lessons that I picked up from Tom and Brian along the way, which uh, I knew I wouldn't have them all right to start. Um, the first is the time value of money, and um, I presented this chart at our first meeting showing that the value of a, a forecast tends to decline with the lead time and then maybe after some period of time increases again. And I realize that there's another way of looking at this chart. So there's the value of the data as a function of age of data. So radar data tends to be really valuable in the current hour and declines pretty quickly. But then as we see with this um, the next RAD project, maybe it increases in value again after some point. And so it's a very interesting aspect of what we're dealing with, particularly on the NOAA side, this, the time value of the information. Now, captive versus occasional users. Our community is characterized by maybe two kinds of users. One is captive users, uh, those of us who work with this data all the time. We know the data. We really rely on it for our business model. Great examples, the company formerly known as Weather Channel, uh, AccuWeather, WeatherBug, names you all know. Then there's the occasional users, so people who come in and maybe aren't so familiar with how to access the data. And we really need to serve both of these, and they really they have different issues associated with their ability to access and use the data. Unused versus undiscovered data. So a lot of us um, are dealing with unused data that we know is there, we'd like to access, and we just can't get at it. And then there's the undiscovered data, which is what's there that we don't know about and that we might use. Both of these things are pretty important. Output versus input data. And again, we've talked a lot mostly about the output side of this, data that exists inside NOAA or Department of Commerce um, that we're trying to get out. But NOAA is also a, a repository of data that comes in from other sources, and I, I certainly don't believe that NOAA should be the repository of all environmental data, but it is an important repository of data that comes in even from the private sector. And so how do we expand our thinking beyond the, beyond the output side of data to also include the input side, observations and other data that's coming in to NOAA and into uh, commerce? Technological barriers, uh, we deal with these all the time in what we do. So that image is of a standard weather observation station, um, typically located at an airport. And those were built in the 90s, and they were built with old technology. And there's a lot of data that's being captured by those that's not really accessible on the outside due to some simple technological limitations. And we deal with that all the time. We've talked a lot about the bottleneck. Tom talked about the bottleneck in terms of bandwidth. So those issues are there, those technological barriers. Intermediate data, and Tom knows this quite well, with um, a lot of the data that we deal with on the NOAA side, there are many intermediate steps in generating that data, and oftentimes those intermediate steps are not accessible to those of us on the outside world, and in some cases they may be useful. And so there's a lot of discussion about which of these intermediate data steps should be made accessible and which just aren't useful at all. And the seventh lesson, international access. We deal with this to a large extent in the weather community. It really is an international activity. Anything that's going to happen in the U.S. Um, tomorrow um, may have started several days ago in Asia. And so you have to know what's going on. And there's an extensive data sharing activity across the world driven by the World Meteorological Organization and other organizations. And so a question for um, our discussions is just how important is the connection between commerce and the international community and how does that impact our discussions? Now a few other lessons that I, I just picked up from Tom and Brian that I, I, I missed in my initial uh, charts. Data integration, I fully agree with Tom that data integration, cross-cutting science, cross-cutting information 
is the way of the future, and it's really going to change what we do in the weather community in particular. So how you combine weather information with risk information that may come from a completely different source, and how you bring those together to provide knowledge and support to decision making. That's really where we're going in the future. Um, data reprocessing. So, and, and again, Tom is right in the middle of this with climate data. So what is data? And when you reprocess data, um, you may have the same data set in name, but the data within that data set is now different. And it's a little bit challenging sometimes to know what is the real data. Uh, how to know users and uses, um, a lot of discussion on that. I think it's a central question. So particularly those of you in the government um, are challenged to know who's using your data and how it's being used. And that's a, a big problem really for all of us in the future. Um, and the final issue is just sort of a conceptual one that um, I know Tom is in the, right in the middle of this and so it, it's his uh, talk triggered this in my mind. Is data the same as fact? Um, we could spend a long, long time uh, discussing that and when do you modify data to really represent what's happening? Um, when do you recalibrate data? When is data um, a bad estimate of fact and when does it have to be um, reprocessed to represent fact? Fun issue. So um, final chart here. Um, how do we use Noah's example in our deliberations? I think there's some things that are really quite interesting in NOAA's um, situation that are relevant to what we're doing as a whole and some things that are really unique. And understanding both of those, I think, can drive a lot of our deliberations. OK. Thank you, Bill. Uh, any quick questions uh, for Bill to clarify in his presentation uh, as with the uh, previous presenters? OK. Well, then, as a, a point of order, we basically have a few options at this point. Um, so great conversations. Just now, we're interrupted. We don't want to interrupt and want to provide a forum for that. Uh, but we've also been sitting down for a little while. So uh, here's a, some quick uh, side chats here. Here's, here's a proposal. Uh, what if we were to take, basically, a uh, 10, 15 minute break now to pick up our lunches, which happen to be standing by. We can provide that to the details in a second. But if we do that, we take our lunches back and basically uh, allocate the time that would have been a uh, We'll say non-productive lunch break to a productive discussion on environmental and climate data. Uh, would that be agreeable for everybody? Could we do that? Take a little break, get some food, come on back, and then you know a few minutes in, a little after 12, uh, we'll queue back up to the discussion. Does that work? Seeing nods of agreement. Any uh, any contest to that? Oh, sorry. Oh no. Okay, we, we may lose a member if we do that. Okay. Well, that's a, that's a real consideration. Um, well, and maybe to accommodate that, we'll ensure that there is appropriate time for you uh, to ask some questions in the, the first half uh, so we don't lose your, your ideas and proposals. But that's a, that's a very real uh, consideration. So, okay. Uh, any other concerns about this uh, audible change to the agenda? If not, I'll turn it over to Burton to describe how we're going to do this. Yeah, so um, we have drinks over on a cart over in the corner. Um, your box lunches are all in your name. So it's, a tight, it's tight back there. So we're going to bring the lunches out and put them at, at where you're sitting. Um, others who have lunches can work with Tanja to get them. But, so take a few minutes to get settled, do whatever, and then we'll, we'll have our lunches here and we'll start to eat them and then we'll come back to the discussion. All right, so 15 minute break. Thanks everyone. Thanks.
of the working lunch, if I can ask in the next few minutes if you can start heading back to your tables, and we will continue the discussion while people continue to enjoy their lunch. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Let us uh, start to reconvene here a bit, and uh, we'll pick up, where, pick up where we left off. Um, so, with uh, an interest to a few key questions that I want to return to, I took some notes on, uh, perhaps I could start uh, by turning the floor over to uh, Kati to uh, uh, bring up some of her questions and uh, ideas. And then after that, we'll, we'll let the conversation flow. And we'll, mm -hmm. please, as a reminder, uh, we have a, a rather impressive number of folks participating remotely, watching the live stream, tweeting at us. Uh, so uh, be aware of the microphones, be close to the mic so the foes remotely, remotely can hear. And we'll do our best to keep track of the order of kind of hands raised, so to speak, uh, to contribute. And please do so by raising a name card. Mm -hmm. We'll do our best to keep track of it. So turn it over to Kati. As Austin already mentioned, the big data project um, elaborated on by Brian would be a, b a great way to also empower some other agencies to share their data more openly. And I wonder if you would consider holding conferences where you basically present success stories of what worked and what didn't work, inviting other agencies to benefit from that as well. Maybe I have that first question, then I have another one. Uh, so the answer to your question is yes. Uh, the, the, it would be of great benefit, and, and um, we are having conversations. I, I will put uh, two caveats on that uh, as an experiment uh, where we don't know where the final product is going to be. Uh, one, uh, so far we have some success stories. I think NextRat is a great success. Frankly, we've, we've encountered more challenges as a success. We always knew that was going to happen. That is not a surprise. And I think those are as valuable as the success stories. Um, and, 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 and we are having not, we are having informal conversations with all kinds of other agencies. We, we get questions on a weekly basis. We've spoken with NIH, uh, USGS, uh, FAA, um, 
we've had very informal conversations with NASA, nothing, no sit down yet, but uh, I know uh, we've talked to some of their folks as well. Uh, and, and so every, a, a lot of folks are curious and we, when we do these periodic check-ins every few months or so just to tell them, uh, say what's going on. Uh, one thing we're, we're learning is, you know, because we're encountering more challenges and success stories, again, still getting some success stories, I think we're bearing fruit, um, we are very cognizant of the idea that we don't want to grow too big too fast uh, because uh, we'll get crushed by the weight if we do. And, um, and, and, and there are a lot of players, not just NOAA, not just the federal government, who this may or may not impact along the way, and we want to be deliberative and, and thoughtful to make, uh, to, to make this um, scalable, if it is scalable, <laughs> and, and, and to build this with as, not, as much institutional buy-in from both the public and private side. Mm -hmm. And over time, you might also like to involve international agencies as well. Again, growing slowly and steadily. Um, the second question and If we can get a couple more staff, that would be great, too. <laughs> <laughs> second question I had. So we already talked about uh, citizen science and the importance for getting new data streams to come in, but also involving high schools uh, and middle schools, to be honest, and also involving science museums and, and other informal science education venues for increasing the kind of meteorological uh, literacy, if you wish, and also ultimately training the next generation of uh, users and providers of these kind of data sets. So in how far do you um, already um, involve these uh, different um, formal and informal um, learning environments? And, and if not, um, do you have plans to do so? So um, <clears throat> I can, maybe the best example is a program that has been um, switched about between NOAA and NASA over the course of the last 15 years. It's called GLOBE. Um, so you're familiar with GLOBE? And, and that's an example where um, um, primary, secondary uh, school people are out making observations from soil measurements, um, looking at soil moisture content, actually doing a good job of digging holes in the ground and, and drying out the soil and seeing how much moisture is in it, to taking temperatures. Um, so we have... <clears throat> Um, looked at those data, brought it in, tried to quality control. Um, it's been very effective, I think, as a, as a learning tool right now. NASA has is, is got that, the lead in that project. Um, other examples of where we're bringing in data um, from citizen scientists, um, networks, for example, measuring precipitation. Um, there's a network out there called Cocoross. Um, extremely valuable, led by a few professionals. However, um, the number, I haven't even counted, it's in the thousands now of people sending in their observations regularly. Uh, another activity that's also gained traction is this um, crowdsourcing on data sets. And we've had some interesting experiments with respect to looking at um, satellite imagery for techniques we use to categorize the intensity of, of hurricanes and tropical storms. And uh, they provide very valuable insight to us. And, and there are other experiments in the international community where people are actually running models, um, doing climate sensitivity experiments. Um, so there's a number of ways that uh, I think we can get um, um, the public engaged. Uh, really limited by our, our creativity. And, and every instance where I've seen uh, these things well thought through, they've, they've seemed to have big payoffs. And I think this close collaborations and leads to data that you can actually use because the quality control which you mentioned and the checking the data and trying to get it into a framework that works, plays well with your other data mm -hmm. is very important there. Okay. Um, well, what I'd like to do at this point, oh, is there a specific uh, question? Yes, Dana, please. I have a question, too. Oh, it's, uh, you want to order again? Yeah. Dana, Dana. Dana, 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 apologies. Okay, thank you. Um, so I have a few questions. Um, so, Brian, what's your microphone? Oh, sorry. I'm going to saddle up here next to, next to Steve. Um, 
So, Brian, you just said um, <clears throat> something about um, not wanting to move too fast and being crushed by the weight. What exactly do you, do you mean by that? Well, am I on? What I mean by that is this is, in theory, a scalable project, but in, in, in experience, uh, not hasn't proven to be scalable, which is to say each data, each data set that, take a half step back, uh, you approach this on an iterative basis, data set by data set. You don't, we're not trying to kind of craft a grand program and then slot everything through that. We're trying to learn lessons along the way. And you do that by identifying use cases and then trying to see if you can prove out the use case and bring that to market. Um, what we are discovering is that each data set has its own accessibility issues. Some of them are technical. Some of them are intellectual property. Some of them are policy. Some of them are um, just a business case. Yeah, in theory, if you could get this data set to do this with this other data set, and you got these three people working on it, each from different sectors, in theory, you could, you could derive enough value to pay for the staging of that data, but that's a complex task. And you have to go through them one by one by one. Each one is a, is, is, a, is a little puzzle. And if you try to start adding other agencies, you make it more complex. You, you're, you're, you're growing the ecosystem uh, um, too quickly for it to organize itself. Mm -hmm. And then all the, your essential players throw up their hands and they walk away because they say, too much. Too much. This, I don't know what you've gotten us into, yeah. but um, <laughs> Uh, we are way out on the ledge here. We know what works, and this is kind of, this is a hairy situation we're now in. Let's reset. We may get to that point. I hope we don't. I think there's real <coughs> possibilities. But I know we will get to that point if we try to say this, this is one size fits all. Mm -hmm. And um, we want to be really cognizant of that as we move forward. Okay. Have, you, have you thought about... Um Shifting, it sounds like right now BDP is set up where the government lands data someplace and then you push it up to the yeah, we, providers. Yeah, mostly we land it with, with, with Tom and Ed here, but it depends. Uh, some of our live feed does not go through Asheville. Uh, okay. That didn't guess, mean to interrupt you. Go I on. guess I'm curious about whether you thought about pushing the primary way that internal consumers within NOAA, NASA, whoever else within the government community consume it is through BDP itself, so, such that that pushes internal users of the data already to consume the data there, and it, I guess it creates more momentum. Like, and I know in Zillow's case, um, when we have data systems internally, we always find more traction um, providing our data externally when we uh, say that the only way you can consume it internally is to create an API, because then a team would, all things being considered all things being equal, they don't want to create the API. They're like, look, I'll just internally pass it to this internal team. But when you force the team to say, no, you have to expose the API, then it's really easy to expose that internally, so uh, externally. So I think there's some real benefit you might want to think about, about saying, you know, you're going to land some data someplace, you're going to push it up to some central place, but that's where everyone's going to consume it, because then you've got a huge community of users that help straighten out data standards, how they're going to access to everything else, and then the external community just drafts off of all that. Sure. Um, I think it's something to look into into the future. Um, it's important to stay focused on where we are. And where we are is just trying to figure out if this is a viable model. Uh, NOAA, uh, in, in addition to just being this great collector of, of Earth observations, ha it, it's, it's, a, it's a science based service agency. It's not a science agency like NASA is. It's a science-based service agency. We're a mission agency. What we do is vital to public safety. Um, our forecasts, our weather warnings, um, uh, people's lives depend on that. And therefore, we have to be absolutely, um, uh, we have to safeguard that there, there's no disruption of that kind of service uh, at the time when people need it most. So in terms of pushing through an external provider on the cloud, it's usually a fairly robust system, but we would have to go through all kinds of uh, checks and, and processes to make sure that those assurances existed rather than go through our own internal systems that have been vetted over a number of years. Uh, not to say that that could never happen, but it's something we're, we're constantly ca cautious of. 
And the second thing is, again, BDP is an experimental process. No one is bound, none of our collaborators are bound to it. They can walk away at any point. And if we were to go and put some of this, kind of our essential um, uh, mission dependent uh, capabilities uh, kind of on a system that's not ours, and they were to walk away, we, you know, we would have a challenge there too. So, by that, by that you mean that AWS may decide they don't want to be in S3 anymore and stop doing it, or, yeah, or Azure that's would go I mean. away? Yeah. Hmm. Okay. That seems really low risk, but, but okay. But, but it's a theoretical one, you know, right. and we, we, we have to take that serious, seriously. Right. And the, my, my last question, just really quickly, is um, how much does, does NOAA, I can imagine that when you think about the value chain for weather data, it's obviously gone through a lot of evolution where you think like 1950s, you would have, you know, no one's going to put up satellites, no one's going to do the research, no one's going to create the forecast. But now there are a bunch of businesses that are in the ecosystem. And do you all look for opportunities to, you know, I still think no one's going to launch the satellites by themselves, and no one's probably going to do the research by themselves. Yeah. Um, but I assume like predictions and stuff, there are a bunch of companies that do that. Do you all, does NOAA, and I don't know who's best to answer this, do you all look for opportunities to take services that cost money now, where you could draw back from that and say, you know what, we're just going to consume that forecast from, you know, these three providers, and we'll take that resource and go do something else that we'd like, that we think, you know, like maybe data management. And that's the conversation we have at NOAA every day. Um, it's, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a field that's growing, it's evolving. Um, there will always be, in our opinion, um, an essential government mission that needs to, that needs to be um, addressed. And in order to address that mission, we're going to need very specific capabilities, um, which we can't uh, do without. But how we define that, it's, it, it's a question um, we, we approach and, and, and grab with on a, on a regular basis. And, and um, uh, you're right, along the chain, it goes from observations uh, to uh, you know, analysis and compute to products to dissemination. And all along that chain, um, we see increasing uh, entry by private sector entities into that chain, and, and, and we look at that stuff. And yes, um, whether it's through um, NESDIS, uh, and we're, I know they're currently working on a commercial space policy uh, that, that has been out for public comment. Um, NOAA has, uh, along with NESDIS. And, um, and it's, a, you know, it's, it's a very high priority um, process that we go through. But if I, can, if I can just chime in there for a second, it's, from my perspective, it's pretty rare that if a government's been doing something in the data world for a long period of time and the private sector starts doing it, it's pretty rare that any government anywhere stops doing that service right, because right. lo and behold, the private sector is doing it. I, I can't even think of many examples any level of any government. That said, the expansion of, we'll say, uh, civic services more broadly by the private sector is, I think, creating a new type of strain on all governments to ask stronger questions like Brian's talking about. Should we really still be doing this? At, at every level of government. And so that's where I think part of the reason this, this committee, this council even exists, is to start looking at some of those uh, questions from the, from the data perspective. But that, oh, I was, I'm just adding on to Brian's point, I, I do believe that Dana was next. Can, can I comment on, oh, just please, on, please. on that? Yeah. Because um, this is an issue that's been worked pretty extensively in the entire, what we call the enterprise. So the enterprise consists of the government sector, the private sector, and the academic sector. And we have worked closely for decades now to actually resolve a lot of issues that made this particular thing difficult. Who does what? Where is the split? Um, we have now what's called a primary value chain and a secondary value chain. This is what we refer to it as. Primary value chain is information that goes directly from NOAA to the end user. Secondary value chain is information that goes from NOAA through private companies, through academic institutions, <laughs> to emergency responders, you know, whatever. It's a pretty complex value chain. That secondary value chain accounts for about 95% of the information that gets to end users. There's another aspect of this, which is how you build up to that value chain, observations, forecasts, um, applications, things like that. And it can be a little vague who does what there. And those lines are shifting constantly. And what we have agreed to as a community is not to draw firm lines, that these boundaries have to shift and we have to have a dialogue that allows us to work together to figure out how to shift those boundaries and it's actually worked quite well. Dana? 
So I want to come back to your mission, which I think is a really phenomenal one. And I, and I have to say, like, the more I've dug into what Noah is doing and what you have the potential to do, the more I am in awe of what you are uh, all about. And I say this as someone who's really embarrassed the fact that I didn't know this as a citizen and as somebody who works at data, in data-related issues before I joined this, um, uh, this council. And the reason I say that is that there's a tendency to put things out in the public and assume that then the public will engage with them. And the public does engage with your weather-related material at, at an abstracted level every day, but with no real insight into what data you have, how you're dealing with it, and what goes on. And I think about that, I think about another strain of things that's underway. Um, in the National Science Foundation is investing huge amounts of money to build up universities to do data science work. We are seeing more and more investment at the high school level to think about how to do different kinds of data analysis. And so then I look at your open data sets and they're huge. They have no way of making sense of it for a layman. And like one of the things I think could be a very concrete and simple way to start engaging some of the public in this is to start providing packaged, wrapped up, old, simpler versions of your data with problem sets and curricula and material that could actually be accessible for people trying to do this. Do it in a way that actually invites them to see the challenges that you're dealing with and imagine that at the, you know, at the high school level, at the undergraduate machine learning level, at the you know, more senior level, and obviously it's different kinds of data sets. The reason I say this is that throwing the data over the wall is really helpful when people know how to leverage it. And the business community that you're talking about can think about strategic ways of leveraging it, but there's a need to build a whole nother generation of people to reimagine not just the business possibilities of it, but all of the civic possibilities of what it means to really engage with your data. And I invite you to think about them as part of your constituencies, in, and it's in it's going to be, require a lot more than just throwing it over the wall for them to really be able to engage with it. I'm going to invite Tom to have, share any thoughts he has on that question. Well, you know, I think that's a um, good incentive on our part probably to work more closely with our sister agencies like NSF. I mean, I, I think if you take a look at, at NOAA in our mandates and where our resources go, um, it probably would make a lot of sense for us to build off what NSF is already doing. So really, uh, in, in some areas we've done this, um, I think more effectively than others. For example, in the paleoclimate area, we've got um, some pretty good relationships with the National Science Foundation. Um, and particularly if they are doing these investments, um, we probably should be going over and talking to their program managers in a much more forceful way. So that's an opportunity for us. Um, and uh, I think we can to take a look at how we might do that better. And if I can be of any help on that, I'm happy to. I spend a lot of time with the NSF folks. I'm writing that down. Hang on. I'm, you know always making goes. lists of what I have to remember. Uh, no, this, no, this is exactly the reason why we're having these discussions. Brilliant. Uh, Steve. You know, I, I keep coming back to just the brilliance of the CRADA because we're all here talking about this issue because we have this vehicle giving us an insight into this information from two perspectives. One is the market opportunity to take advantage of this data, and the second is to build a demand cycle which hopefully results in better data management within NOAA. One of the things that, Tom, when you were describing the mission of NOAA, one of the things that I thought was missing from the mission of what we do well at NOAA is we excel at data management. You know, I would hope to hear in the next five years that that is one of the critical missions at NOAA that gets fulfilled. That we are not just excelling at basic science and providing the public with really meaningful information that saves lives and improves business, but that we are also excelling at data management. But that is a process, right? Some of us who have worked in the data governance industry, we know that's a process, and it's dependent upon a demand cycle. And what the CRADA does is it provides one step for five partners and its subpartners for that demand cycle. I think we're all talking together about another set of demand cycles. And it's not a public-private partnership, it's a public-public partnership. And it's a new role for NOAA, not just as a data provider, but as a convener of data collection, of data analytics, and of data provisioning. And by that I mean, I think it's something that Dana was talking about, and Caddy was talking about, and Bill, we're, we're all sort of talking about how do we get the public to participate in data collection, in data quality 
uh, in data governance itself, in identifying data sets that could be corroborated with additional data sets to f make their quality more effective, how to analyze it, how to find new insights that others can't find. And that's a convening power that government can provide. It's also a vision, in a way, for what a 21st century government department looks like when it's working together with the public. Because, you know, no matter how good we are, no matter how many scientists we have, um, you know, you said in the 1950s, 1960s, it was only a government that put up satellites. And that mission was fulfilled by NASA, NOAA, and others. But today we have thousands of data scientists, and the numbers are growing every year because it's such a growing industry. And there are so many more people around the world that could take advantage of this information to find things that we can't find. But what does that architecture look like? And how do we get there? And I think that's something that we together, I'm hearing the amazing skills in this group, I think that's something that we should study, is how do we build that larger public-public partnership demand cycle for NOAA that helps them excel at data management by creating this demand externally for interacting with the public in both providing more data and collecting more data. Because on a sensor level, IoT level, the cost of putting weather sensors down, I mean, you see it in cities like Chicago and San Francisco and New York, they're putting sensors all over the place. It's getting less and less expensive to collect meaningful information. So the sources of data capture around weather and climate are going to only increase in addition to NOAA. And you've seen already that the private companies like Planet Labs are putting up what they call a photocopy around the Earth, 200 satellites that circle the globe and take pictures every day in high resolution. There are other companies that are talking about exabyte level scale data capture. So we're going to have a lot more data. How do we use it effectively? If I can just challenge that a little bit, I mean, what, is, what is something that con in a concrete way that this council can do to address that? I mean, so just to bridge uh, Dana's previous point and uh, uh, very uh, impressive volunteering and some of your uh, prioritization that you're talking about, uh, Steve. I mean, what, what can we do about that like in the next six months? Like, is, it, is it, are we talking about launching tutorials? Is it supporting some aspect of the big data project? Is this a working group? What, what, what does it feel like here, if, something, if this is worthwhile and this collective council agrees that this is uh, worth some level of effort, what does, that, what does that mean? What does that look like? I have some ideas, but I'll let um, my colleagues answer. What do people think about this idea? I don't have an answer to that question, but I just wanted to add something onto that that might help a little bit in like scoping the question, maybe. Yeah, yeah. And it, it was just occurring to me, um, Bill's comment earlier about you know is data fact, and I think that that's an important thing to capture in the discussions because there are a lot of times when data is up there and you really don't want to use it because it was you know it's, it's something wrong with it, and having that ability to curate the data. Um, with people who, f who discover things about it. I know for a long time during the Human Genome Project, we were trying to assemble the human genome with a whole bunch of data that had been misprocessed, and it was not working, and it took us a long time to figure out that we just needed to take the raw data and reprocess it to assemble it. And so I think that being able to capture that is an important thing to include in a, in a framework um, for, for data dissemination. Bill? Um. I, I think you're making a great point, but I, there's an interesting irony here, which is that um, one of the growing uses of weather data is by machines rather than people. So in the past, it used to be people who were consuming all of the weather information. More and more, it's machines, your car, your thermostat, all kinds of things where you're not, you don't even know that you're using weather information. So we have things sort of going in opposite directions on this. We'd like to increase public engagement, but in many ways, the public <laughs> engagement occurs in ways that the public does not know about. Yeah. Agreed. This data capture, this data collection is going to happen, right? It, it, it's, it's, you know, as you pointed out in the National Action Plan that the administration just released yesterday, um, there is this idea of a climate data repository which has been built, has been set up as climatedata.gov. But there's another idea in there, which is that um, not only could this be done by the United States, but it could be done by many nations around the world. That's why in the National Action Plan, it's put under um, the header of the Sustainable Development Goals, that the planet has an interest in having national or, or international greater collection of 
climate data. We don't have enough climate data today. So it's going to happen that we're going to get much more climate data. I guess the, the question is, um, uh, how can NOAA play a leadership role in convening and collaborating with the public in the United States and around the world? And what does that look like? Because I think that is what, you know, I think about that as a governing challenge for most cities and states and nations today anyway. I mean, that's sort of where this whole open data movement, hackathons, engagement with the public, civic activism is leading to anyway, in which government is increasingly engaging with citizens to solve complex problems. Well, I'd like to ask Vadim to comment, but before I do, if I may, I, I just want to have a quick uh, opportunity for Sean. Uh, just a couple of thoughts here. One is <clears throat> engaging the public is a, is a big word here. Um, and to some degree, all of the agencies and bureaus around the government engage with their stakeholders. And in the case of commerce, it's business. Uh, so what you have seen uh, Brian really stress in his presentation, which I think is really important, is, is our main mission in commerce is really to enable the private sector to create uh, economic opportunity, improve the U.S. industry's competitiveness, uh, and, and help us grow economically. So that's, that in a way is an important part. There's also, in, from an environmental standpoint, there's this global sharing of, of, of data, weather data, climate data that exists, which I think is important, and NOAA is doing a great job in that area. Uh, with regard to <clears throat> also where in the food chain government plays a role, um, and this again I think uh, Brian was getting at, and I want to re reinforce it, because it's, it's in the, where the market failures are. It's not where market failures don't exist. And it's usually where things are going to cost more, no one else is doing it, and, and where the technology uh, is much more complex. So if it's satellites with unique instrument systems in there that nobody else is doing, and that is vital to our interests, that's the kind of higher value added role that government agencies try to do. And this is going on all over. And things that don't kind of meet that threshold, they kind of spin off. Great example is internet time service. Uh, NIST operates the atomic clock. And one, there's one in, in Boulder. That's where, and they have, uh, exactly. And, and they actually uh, uh, operate the servers that provide internet time service. We have now, at NIST, gotten to a point, we've reached an agree agreement with National Technical Information Service through a joint venture partnership to see if we can get a private sector to operate those services, servers, uh, provide those free services at a baseline, just the way Noah has been talking about for big data, uh, we, uh, weather data, and then move to value-added premium services the private sector could develop for which they could charge, and then there would be a, a basis to do that. So I think um, you will see this evolution more toward the higher value and for government as private sector takes on more of the, uh, the routine stuff. And so the, we, we really think the private sector is best, in, best positioned to deal with what the public needs. No, I, I, I fully agree with your comments. Um, I, I think it goes back to something I said during the first meeting, which was that you know, data at rest ha may have some nominal value to someone who stored it, but from a productive perspective, it has almost no value. So data has value when it's utilized. And uh, 24 petabytes of NOAA data has potential value, but what we want to do is we want to have it much more widely utilized. And the public, through private organizations or through universities or through other, uh, may collect data as well, which may have higher utility when, it's, when it is made more readily available. And as Dana said, when people are educated on how to use it. And so I think there is a public interest, an economic interest, in finding ways of collecting and processing and making intelligently available far more climate data because that will stimulate economic growth and jobs exactly as you described. Vadim? I just oh. Has he anything that's responsive just to him? Like you have to ask Vadim. I mean, he's right Vadim, there. Is it okay? 
Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> It's just something Steve said. It's just something Steve said. Just maybe one, just two. I did, not a big long comment, but just I, I, I was thinking about the, the 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 you know the the utility of the data lasting beyond when it's there. And one of the things I thought about when Tom was speaking was the modeling data is really only useful really if you've got actually the modeling software captured with it, because otherwise you're not really going to be able to reproduce it, validate it, and everything. So I just wanted to capture that idea that sometimes the things that we are saving, if it's not the primary data. Um, or the source code for the modeling, it, it's, you know, it's going to have this really short shelf life. So just comment, and as you were, different people were talking, I was adding more and more to my comments, so yeah. I'll try to talk it all together. As you said, yes, uh, for data, for the Department of Commerce, the number one client is a business, how we improve the business. And Bill said, yes, weather data today is used a lot by machinery, right? It's used by thermostat and cars. But the first company which used weather data for thermostat was not a thermostat company. It was a company, it was a very small startup which started using it and had nothing to do with any other business. The first GPS-based device which used data for GPS navigation was not one of the big GPS companies. It was not U.S. company. It was not, at that time it was not U.S. company. Today it's owned by U.S. company. But back then it was not U.S. company. It was a small startup in Israel. Uh, so if you're creating and saying, okay, our uh, uh, business can figure out how to use the data, yes, business can figure out how to use the data, we will continue making faster course and, you know, continue doing course to be faster and faster instead of building next, uh, building forward. But going back to make data available, for me, yes, you know, you throw data over the fence, you put some tutorial which is intended for your best of your users, wonderful, you will make your user better to do the same things they've been doing for the last 25 years. But you're losing all the other stuff going on. And, and today, world, for me, it's really social aspects. How do you make sure that people, you know, oh, I look at that radar data and what I see is I can predict whether I need to wear bike helmet or whatever, kind of helmets when I bike to school. I'll make an app, okay, and I'll share it with somebody else and somebody else will take it over and say, Oh, I can use the same app in Africa to predict whether I need to go and bring five gallon of water or 10 gallon of water. Oh, and it will continue over and over again. Not because big corporation or big company decided we're gonna create a product which will predict number of water village in Africa needs to bring home. But because somebody said, oh, you know what? I need to make a useful app which in the morning will tell me what I need to wear. And that app will be used across the border. And in in today's world, you talk to those kids, and I still call them kids, you know, one of them is my son, uh, and my daughter, both of them. Uh, those kids, they create very, very interesting stuff, which, yes, you know, we look at that and it's kind of useless. But very often, that useless stuff creates something much bigger. And if you let them share, if you create that sharing opportunity on how the no data helps the world, and, you know, sitting here, I download it. I have, you know, I didn't do visualization yet. I need to figure out how to do the pass. But I can visualize the data and I can start playing here today with, with, with AWS and tomorrow all others and more and more data will come over. But how do you make it share? How do you make it, you know, available that they can, whatever, Facebook, Instagram, whatever they want to use GitHub better, uh, to share the information? <laughs> It, it, it doesn't matter. I can name another 20 technology which can be used for that. It's irrelevant. Make it available for all of it. Don't hang up to single technology, but how do you make sure that it's available? The big corporation will end up reading it, and at the end, yes, you will have the big, big, uh, big business, but the, the novel, completely new way of using the data which nobody ever thought before is unlikely to come from current business user of the Department of Commerce. Yeah, but to make all that happen, you also need to make sure that people know what data is. I was playing with the AWS file. I still cannot figure out what the data is. Probably I can go more, I can figure it out, I can figure out how to download, but show me a few examples, show me what actually it means, you know, on basic levels, it would be great. So the start point and then yeah. make, it, make it available, make it sociable, make everybody else to create the rest of the use case. Uh, well, on that last point of examples, and with two uh, cards that just came down, let Wait. me see if I can propose. Oh, you want to come that back up then? Okay, I'm going to come up uh, to a proposal in a second, but please, Dana. I just want to extend yours and push against Tom for a second, because if your mission is really to be focusing on the business, 
you need to be focusing on the public. And I'm going to be crass for a second. I've been teaching in communication programs for a long time. The weather is the joke of everything. And the way, the way that I deal with weather, in, in my, and I have to deal with this in my students, student, the female students want to be the weather person because the male students think that the weather person is sexy. That's the narrative of the weather that I deal with on a daily basis. The weather is a joke. It is something that just happens magically. That has serious ramifications for your ability to be successful, for your ability to invest in these things. People don't understand that this is a probabilistic system. People do not understand the complexity that goes into capturing this data, the necessary resources that are needed to make certain that this data is right. And I say this because I actually think that you do need to engage the public, the big P public, about what's going on here, so that it's not just like, oh, they get mad at you when like you predicted a hurricane wrong, and that's the only time where you become invi become visible, but so that they understand and are committed to the fact that this is a nat national project, and if not a global project, to make certain that we can be more successful on a whole variety of levels, from those abilities to get food in a whole set of regions to our abilities to actually have successful businesses and others. And I think that w w what's at stake right now is that we've lost a lot of that. So my invitation back to you is find different ways of actually engaging the big P public because I think it's really important for the success of your mission to, um, you know, to advance commerce in this country. We need it. Our co we need it. I fully agree. I think. We businesses need the public to demand the type of weather intelligence that she's describing because that's the value chain that we're dependent upon to transform this data into highly utilized products. So I totally agree. I don't, yes, I, yes, I, I guess I would, I don't, I would disagree. I, I would think that the people don't know, I mean, to go, to go to Vadim's point, they don't know that they want an app to tell them which I couldn't quite understand the bi bicycle helmet analogy, but the, the the Africa one I think is really interesting. The five or ten gallon, they don't know that that's even possible, or until someone, some developer, puts it together and, and does it for them. I mean, it seems like it seems like government's responsibility and NOAA's responsibility specifically in weather data <coughs> is to it's public information that's been provided, and I think they need to change their posture a bit more to every bit of data needs to be really easily accessible and don't make any, don't make much, um, um, I don't know, assumptions about how that data is going to be used because I do think that people are going to use it in ways that are quite surprising and the more effort you spend on exactly crafting to the application, I think the application people will take care of it. I think the main, the main responsibility is to get as much of it as you can out there as easily as possible. I am concerned about when Vadim says he downloaded a data set and he couldn't understand what the hell it, it was. That is clearly probably because the, of that box on the right-hand side of your presentation, Tom, the kind of the white box, very little focus on that side, which I totally get why, you, why that's a, less of a focus right now, but that's why the data set is, hard, is somewhat inscrutable for, for a new user getting into it. And that, fixing that, but that's data dictionaries, that's examples, that's not, that's not telling the public they really ought to want an app to tell them whether they need five or ten gallons of water. Put the data out there and, and magic will happen, I think. I think we're agreeing. I, don't, I think it's just a different level of discussion. I think we're just talking about it. Right. Right. Mike. Right. Sorry. I, I think we're agreeing with you. I think we're the, all four of us are saying somewhat the same thing from different perspectives. We're saying we, the pub, that the Commerce Department should be concerned about um, engaging a wider audience. I'm not sure how wide. That's something to be defined. But a wider audience than, um, uh, how to say this correctly? Great that you've engaged the five of us so far and all of our sub-partners, great. We want to widen the audience to engage a larger group. Undefined yet how wide that could be. Could be all the way down to high school students who develop apps uh, that in the beginning are failures but that get transmuted into something that's successful that gets used someplace else, right? That becomes a larger demand for data. I think we're saying kind of the same thing. I guess, I guess, but I mean, I would assume that there's a, I'm not a weather person, obviously, um, but I assume there's a weather palooza that happens every year, right? At the conferences, I mean, I'm in the econ space, there are places where people get together, and I assume that yes. you guys it's go to that thing, this and that's where researchers, you know, grad students who want data would come, and I assume you guys set up shop and say, hey, you know, here's all the data we've got. If you got any better ideas for other data that you want to see or how to tweak this data or don't understand it, come talk to us. And I assume that's your primary dialogue for interacting with these people, which I assume 
if it's anything like, is probably pretty effective. Yeah, I, I, I want to quickly. I, I think what I stressed was the primary mission of the Commerce Department. There's no question we are accountable to the taxpayer. There's no question we inform and educate the public. Uh, and all the bureaus actually do that. But our primary mission is what I said it is. I think I want Vadim, to, then I, Karen. Sorry, I want to just repeat what Dana said. It, it really got there. So yes, when you talk to general public today, about weather da data. They will say, oh, we cannot predict weather. Who can predict weather? You talk to the same general public today, and they will, a lot of them, a lot of public believes that one major retailer can predict pregnancy based on what you buy in the store. And that c completely, for me, doesn't make any sense. From what I know anything about modeling and data, I believe we can predict the data much better depending on what you're buying, or depending on prediction of the pregnancy on what you're buying in that particular store. But how do we go out there? How do we make sure that it's available? When you look about personalization on website, everybody talking about big data, everybody talking about mm -hmm. big websites, they can predict what you do next. No, well, they can do, they can guess, uh, very good guesses, but I still don't believe it's even close to the level of weather prediction which n you guys can do. But how do we take it all out there? How do we make sure that public understand it? And how do we make sure that public start using it more and more? And, and, and very briefly, yes, and they, and they might mock weather forecasting, but they almost always say, is it going to rain tomorrow? <laughs> Do I need my umbrella? But, but what I was going to, I was just going to chime in when, when Stan talked and just join the group of, of agreement about, you know, the, the, we're, we're all saying the same thing. One, one, of the, um, one of the things I was thinking about was back to the RFIs not getting much response, and then also how big of an audience do we try to engage? And I think the thing is we don't know where the next great idea is going to come to, and if the data is out there, and it's well cataloged with the dictionaries or available people to ask about, you know, what does this field name really mean? I think that that's going to be where, you know, we're going to get something that's a big, happy surprise. Uh, Bill, and maybe a little chime in from Tom. Yeah, um, first I'm glad to see that the uh, passion for this field is really catching on <laughs> in some of this group. I love it. Um, I, I think we're really undergoing a big transformation in the, the weather and climate field. So it, it was a kind of a sleepy field for a lot of years. There was a lot of great work that was done in the 30s and the 40s and 50s, and then satellites came along, and that was a big jump. And then um, <coughs> modeling came along, and that was a big jump. But people had a sense that it was um, not moving very quickly. And I think that that's changing right now. And I think all the things that, like Vadim is talking about, there are all these uses out there that people just don't even expect or anticipate. Uh, you know, the traditional people in the field are just kind of surprised day by day, all the different ways that weather is getting used. And um, my feeling, every time I go talk to somebody in agriculture or transportation or whatever, weather is underutilized. There's a huge potential here, and it's going to take big companies like IBM and Microsoft and Google and everybody else to really help get this train moving forward quickly because so much of this, I mean, I'd, I'd love to educate the public, I'd love to have the, all the publics stand up and say, yeah, we understand weather, but, you know, to some extent that's not going to happen, and, or it'll happen only slowly with time. But, you know, those of us who work in this community, in part because there's a lot of commercial potential here, we can make this thing move forward. And it's going to come in ways that we don't expect. And getting the data out that enables the, those great ideas, the innovators, is really key. Brian? Well, just to respond real quick, uh, Stan, you were wondering if there was uh, – you know, a weather plus there is every year. Uh, it is uh, I, it, the the, the, the it is uh, the recognized leader in this firm uh, in this field is uh, an organization called the American Meteorological Society. Our esteemed colleague Bill Gale was the president last year, and Sandy McDonald, who heads this facility, is the president this year. And you'll get a, an opportunity to meet him tomorrow. Uh, so they have, uh, that is a, an organization that has grown. Um, I'm new to it because I'm, I'm new to this whole field, but uh, in, in the short time I've been working at NOAA, I've really uh, grown to understand the leadership that they provide. Um, but I, what, one thing I will challenge the whole group is uh, we keep talking about weather data, and all on, in your comments, um, I think, and, and, and your insights are really uh, on point. Uh, 
I would encourage you to also remember the second half of NOAA, uh, oceans data. That is um, just as important, and there's far more growth potential because even though there are societies and, and organizations that, that form around uh, the ocean side of, of what's becoming an inner, well, it's always from a, a climate science perspective, it's always been uh, inner, uh, intermingled uh, with atmosphere, but now from a business enterprise and a public safety, we're starting to bring those um, interdisciplinary uh, fields together, and the public's starting to see that inter interdisciplinary um, cohesion. Uh, my point, of, of course, is that uh, there's more opportunity for convening. Uh, though there are organizations, but it, that, that area um, is not as mature as the weather side, and I uh, just encourage you to think not only about weather data, about oceans data, from a, um, from a business uh, commerce perspective, but also from uh, a resilience and uh, ecological um, uh, protection perspective. And, uh, and uh, it, I think it's something that we, we, we'd be remiss not to keep on concentrating on. I'm going to go to Dan in a second, but with an eye on the clock, uh, what I'd like to uh, challenge this group is with this fantastic conversation about the way things should be, what specifically should be done differently by the department, in a working group from this council, by individual volunteers. I, I really want us to get to a point of having a, a clearer recommendation for next steps. So I'll just put that challenge out there and look to Dan for his comment. Thanks. Um, I've been <clears throat> a little quiet over here just because I've been still kind of trying to make up my mind on a few things. One of the issues um, here, as we've been talking especially about the NOAA Big Data Project, um, I guess I'm wondering here, you know, is the goal to democratize access to the data or to the data technology? Because I, I don't know if we've kind of defined, you know, the, the infrastructure and, and, you know, that might be an important thing for the department to consider, especially as it's evaluating, you know, what success looks like for it. Because, you know, there's a risk here of over-provisioning the resources needed to get access to the data in, in the way that the credit is set up. Um, I'm not in any way critical of it. I think the best thing to do is to get started and do what we're doing. But I think it's an important thing to be thinking about as we go down this route is, you know, is, is there kind of a, a benefit to a winner-take-all scenario and are we encouraging that with this model? Or if there's not, you know, maybe there's another model that works better. But just basically thinking about this question of is the goal to really, you know, make it cheaper and easier for people to get access to the technology that provides them access to the data? Or is it just the data and it doesn't matter about the infrastructure that infrastructure it's running on. Um, the second thing uh, that I've been thinking about is just, you know, we have these enterprise data inventories, um, which is a good thing. I'm, I'm wondering, and, and we were talking about, you know, setting up data dictionaries, making it easier for people to kind of come in who aren't familiar with the data and use it. I'm wondering, though, if we need to kind of step back and, you know, again, kind of focus on what's the goal of all this. And, you know, maybe one, you know, concrete action for agencies could be to, you know, create what are the big kind of data questions we're trying to solve here. And just having that as even a starting place and, uh, you know, directing um, any interested users either to, a, you know, a forum that's available there, a, a GitHub, you know, repository where people should be talking about this, you know, the American Meteorology you know, at AMS, if that's the right place to go and have these discussions. But let people who, you know, identify what the big question is, where they should go to talk to other people about it. And maybe that's one way to also kind of make sure we're not just focused on, um, you know, making it easier for the high school students to kind of use this data, but really, are we making it easier for people to understand what the big problems are and how they might help solve it? Because the high school students probably not going to be accessing you know, the biggest data set, maybe they're going to be using some, you know, uh, you know, derivative product that somebody else has put out. And so, you know, at least if they know where to go, they're maybe oriented in the right direction. Steve? Yeah, I, I, I really think it's been a great conversation. Microphone. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's really been a great conversation. Um, you know, I, I think back to the mission of the Commerce Department, which is and the mission of the NOAA CRADA, which is to increase the economic utility of the data to stimulate economic growth. I think that's a really, really important mission. And I think we together should form a working group in this committee to study um, uh, how to expand um, that growth opportunity by um, engaging with wider groups that could leverage the data more rapidly. 
It may not be possible, given the 14 months left in this administration, to make much difference. A lot possible. Don't Maybe there is. I underestimate. Maybe we can act fast. We have. I've. I, I'm just stunned by all the things we've already discussed and learned just in the last hour. Um, and then there's sort of a, a secondary byproduct of that, which is to enhance the capability of NOAA to make data governance a core part of its mission, or data management, to improve the data management capabilities within NOAA by not just relying on NOAA itself, but you know, I think what many of us are seeing in the open data space around the world is how the public, um, not just the high school students, but uh, other small developers, other um, companies, are participating in an interactive data governance process of identifying data quality issues and working to fix it collaboratively. And I think that is an opportunity for government um, to not only build trust with the public, but to do more with less. And I think those are the two things that we could focus on together as a, a set of missions, or that's from my point of view. So combining with the previous recommendation, uh, volunteering from Dana about even the connections with the National Science Foundation, some additional consumption of that information, and recognizing, Bill, that you had another comment to share, let me see if I can build on top of Steve's recommendation here for a working group, which feels this, that, that is a good tool in the context of the council. We've seen some good success with that actually from the last meeting. We'll come back to that actually later this afternoon. But let me see if I can refine that proposal. And I'm going to specifically ask Bill what you think about the proposal I'm about to make, given, we'll just say, a unique amount of expertise in, in this arena. So what if we were to, to build on Steve's proposal, uh, establish a working group under the council with the purpose of, uh, let's say, demonstrating how more businesses should or can consume commerce data, broadly speaking, we'll say weather, environmental, environmental data, yes. uh, that could perhaps be a focus, and then bridging to your comment about the humans versus the machines. <clears throat> the focus, the charter, we'll say for this working group, could be on helping people connect, help, helping more people connect machines. I think literally that's, I mean, that, that is a business aspect, and so the representation of that, a success metric, could be something like how we could maybe publish uh, a good story around weather-oriented uh, data with tutorials and measure the success by literally API connectivity. We can track that. We can measure if machines in this context, or loose to say APIs or other types of technologies, are connecting that type of information. But the, the success metric is consumption. We're looking to get more folks to actually engage with this information, which requires education, which requires, a, to, to dance with, a technological infrastructure. You've got to be able to actually download this thing. It requires a dictionary to Vadim's point. So I think if, if that, that's kind of a unifying group, and it may lead to things functionally, okay, talk to AMS and NSF. Hey, what are you all trying to get a hold of? Uh, maybe there's some visualizations in there. Maybe there's a little bit of open source, you know, GitHub issue requests. But so I can kind of, in my own mind, imagine how that would play out, but we still would need some volunteers, basically, to say, yep, this is worthwhile. It advances the mission of the department. Uh, and it is something that the industry would actually benefit from. So that there, there's my proposal. Bill, what do you think about it? I like it. Yeah. Can I add, can I add to that? Please. Um, so we have a bit of a chicken and egg issue in our field right now, and you heard it several times. So Steve said they're kind of out on the edge. They think these markets exist, but they don't know. And you heard Brian say kind of the same thing. They're out trying to figure this out. And you know, I mentioned that we see opportunities in every vertical, but if I go to investors and they ask, you know, tell us how big those opportunities are, I say, well, I think this, and we don't have good data to support that. So all of us are going on faith at some level, and the world doesn't work on faith in that way. The world works on data, and we need economic data describing this market, describing how big it is, what the opportunities are, what we could all do if we really put ourselves to it. And I have said on a number of occasions that I think that <clears throat> um, the developing world is going to be using 100 times as much weather data as they are currently in a decade. And th those of us in the developed world who all already have access to quality weather data will be using it 10 times as often in a decade. Well, that's me. That's me just with my perception of the world. I'd love to have an independent study that says that indeed is going to happen. Here are the commercial opportunities tied to it. Here is the size of the market associated with that. And what that's going to do is it's going to motivate every innovator to come along and say, there's a huge opportunity here. It's been quantified. I know what it is. I'm going to go create something that serves this market. And who's better at doing this? Yes. Commerce. Nobody's I'll, better. I'll make a right? slight friendly amendment to what 
Ian said, and I think he first started off by saying commerce, this working group focused on commerce data, and then he also said environmental. And I think to be most useful, uh, and given the charter of this group, I think we should look at commerce data broadly. Uh, the, the, the NOAA Big Data Project certainly provides great examples and lessons that this working group can draw from, so I would make that friendly amendment. Uh, just, just also very, very small uh, addition. Very small addition. So I completely agree with economics that we need to study the economics and figure out economics, but let's not forget that climate data is a hot topic today. So there is a lot of people who wants to understand change in the climate. Uh, there will still be debate whether, you know, global warming or not. So there, and a lot of developers, they want to be good citizens. Good citizens for their country, it doesn't have to be United States, good citizens for their village, good citizens for whatever uh, place where they grow up. So if we can a little bit use that opportunity of saying, okay, here is the data, you know, people be good uh, citizens, uh, start creating. I'm sure there's gonna be number of people who will want to innovate, not because they see a stra stra uh, economic benefit right there, but just because they think it's good for, the co for them, it's good for their community or it just, you know, when I sit home at night and I'm thinking I spend whole day making Wall Street running faster, I want to do something good for the humanity. Humanity. <laughs> and, you know, there are going to be people like that who will innovate, and a lot of innovation, I believe, will come from there. And for them, it, it's irrelevant what is economics. And then it, probably some of those ideas will be next unicorn for the, for the venture capital, but we never know. Yeah, ideally, you harness both views of the world. Exactly. Yeah. I think uh, just to look at the folks that wanted to chime in, I think I saw, we saw Stan, Tom, Karen, maybe Stan, oh, and then Brian after that. Um, yeah, I guess I would, I'd be interested to understand a bit more about the, where the failure occurs. Like, Brian, on your slide, you had a slide of like eight projects of the most commercially, I believe it was the most commercially relevant. That was across the federal government, but yes. Okay, but, but like half of them were no or commerce, right? Yeah, I wouldn't say they're failure. I think, uh, and I... Well, no, no, so I'm sorry, I, I meant market I, I guess I'm trying to understand, like, number three on that list was Landsat. And you know, I, I think Landsat's bound up in a lot of, I think there's some commercial relationships that probably bind how much we can release. But I'm just wondering, like, I forget number five was like some environmental um, data set. Why is that not publicly available, and I just, I would like to understand the failure and the market failure, not the, not Noah's failure, any personal failure, but what is it that prevents um, us from just making that data available? Is it because we can't afford the servers, the S3 cost to put it up in the cloud? What, because if I understood that, I think we could, because I'm like, if it's, if it's the number four, if some, uh, you know, August body got together and said that's, you know, the number four most commercially relevant data, it should be out there, um, freely available. Yeah, well, maybe I'll speak to that just broad, in broad terms from a deeper mental perspective. It is as, the challenges are as unique as Brian's uh, explanation about how hard it is to get these things released. Uh, my personal opinion, the number one barrier to this type of data disclosure is culture. Yeah. The understanding of why this is important. There is an aspect of that that like, speaks to leadership, in my perspective, uh, technology, processes, and people's actual experiences. You put those together, you get a, basically a systemic uh, struggle. Um, it is not for a lack of, and I'll say this very, very uh, uh, directly, uh, a lack of desire from the President of the United States. We have executive orders on open data. We have prioritizations on open data. And Dan spoke about an enterprise data inventory, uh, loosely referring to uh, projects like data.gov. At best case scenario, data.gov has maybe 1%, maybe, of the U.S. federal digital government inventory. And again, it's not because the President hasn't told us so. So where, where is that disconnect? As you start to dig into the details, broadly speaking, you tend to find Technological challenges, people don't know how to do it. Uh, process challenges, how do we protect privacy? And then people challenges, well, wait, well, I'm not getting paid more to do this. Why is this new work coming in? My actual job is this other thing. And so you kind of put them all together and you get a, uh, uh, we'll say, a, a systemic challenge, but yeah. not something that is insurmountable, which is why I think, to your point, you choose one or two or three, high priority, market driven, we know there's some good value here. Yeah. And then you can organize fo forces, you can organize folks to then innovate, not necessarily at the core of, say, why are we on or not on the cloud? That's just bigger and hairier. But you can say, let's get next, uh, next red out there. 
like that, let's do that. And they, oh, well, look, lo and behold, we can, and apparently we have, in a really extraordinary way. I mean, that, that data disclosure is huge. Bravo to Noah. That's a, a bravo to Amazon and Microsoft. Everyone else was part of it. That's a big deal. But it, it, it's, I think that micro focus is more likely to demonstrate real progress yeah. than the kind of the core diagnosis of really how hard it is for the, any government, really, to, to disclose at the level that they perhaps should be. Um, and so I think, you know, in the context of bridging Sean and, and Bill's last points, I think that part of the charter of this, well, I'm going to loosely call it a working group, although I don't know if there's a better word for it. Um, I think part of the charter would be, first thing, figure out what the right stuff is, top five, data sets, data projects, data questions to be solved. Focus on those and let that one or two or three data sets, platform releases be the measure of success, not necessarily a, a broader aspect of kind of systemic data disclosure. I think that's harder to achieve also to, to Steve's point in, in the time we have left. I think if we can measure it a little closer, we, we may be able to achieve real progress that then itself yeah. becomes the ingredients for us to get to the larger issues. I think, I think on the one hand, I think that working on specific case studies and like uh, weather data with BDP and is, is attractive because you can focus on it and try to get that thing done. I guess I, I also suggest that you, we do, you describe systemic issues, and I would think that we would want to probably try to tackle those as well, because it does concern me that, yes, we can create a lot of light and energy and go after three data sets, or we could, I mean, because what you're describing, it sounds like, you know, higher level uh, mandates around, you know, I think about, um, you know, I think the federal government does it to some extent, I know the Gates Foundation does, where like, I think it's like 5% of any project that's green lighted has to be devoted towards program evaluation. So they build into the cost of it, um, what they know to be good sound hygiene on the project and I would say that maybe data management should be built in to the project cost as well and say hey five percent of this cost is going to have to go to data management if we're going to do this and it also suggests that you probably want to mandate um, dissemination I think the open data standards that the White House and OMB have been have been promoting are around existing data sets and making sure they're at least digitally available I would suggest that we might want to shift toward a posture where any data that the government collects, it is, cost is built in to turn that around and make it available. Because I think like, I think like in Kevin's business around Socrata where, you know, there's a whole bunch of data around potholes and, you know, salary information from municipal governments and stuff that like was just floating around in governments that people didn't think was that useful. And now people mine it all the time and do really fascinating stuff with it. So I would say that if you collect it, then sure, do the mission with it, you know, save the lives, but some percentage, you have to spend some cost to put it up somewhere and put a data dictionary on it so that someone else could perhaps use it. And it may sit dormant for a number of years, but I would suggest that that being available um, makes it so that any little kid who comes along and wants to build an application on it has it available. You know, St Stan is addressing something that I think all of us in the industry know is that a lot of the data sets that have been put out as open data sets were the ones that were easiest to put out, uh, not necessarily the highest value ones. And the highest ones, the highest value ones, the biggest ones, are complicated to put out for all the reasons you suggested. And maybe it takes a group like this that makes a recommendation about how to put out the highest value data sets that helps to tip the balance and move the entire industry forward and get some new focus on what are the data sets that really can change uh, the economy, the public, and the way government operates. And I, th I think that's something, you know, maybe we can pick a couple and look at them as use cases and dive down deep and do more than just sort of make recommendations about what should be done, but also pay maybe do a little assessment on how it could be done. Yeah, um, I mean, just to bridge that one, I will say, once you get into cost, and I agree with you on cost, by the way. I don't want to get into cost. But once you get, that's where I think a lot of, to, to, I guess more to, to Stan's point, that's where it starts to get a little bit trickier because yes. everything costs something, and then it's a real yes. question about prioritization and values and budgets and all the good business questions. But let me see if I can then still provide an opportunity for this council to make a very clear recommendation to take some real movement on how to properly invest in this stuff. And Tom, you had a, you had a card up for a while. I'm going to give you a chance to speak. But let me see if I can kind of present a question to Bridget uh, bridge the question, I think, actually to you, given your expertise and experience. If, as part of this uh, little experiment that we're proposing, working group, work on some tutorials, get some uh, market-driven, valuable data out there, if part of the result was not just, okay, here's data, here's some guides, here's something that now Vadim can then un actually understand how to use in a, in a ready fashion in an agreeable period of time as measure of success, if it was also, and this, what it co this is what it costs to do this the right way. Is that helpful to you? Would that be valuable information? Or it's like, you know, I know it's expensive, I know it's good, but it's not gonna 
functionally change the way the way we do our daily business. Yeah, no, that's a <clears throat> that's a great um, um, investment in terms of what you could do. Clearly, um, uh, what would be really important if you come back and tell us here's what it costs to do that is that you really do look end to end at all the costs. And so, for example, I mean, right now we are still getting punched paper tapes from some of our, we're, we're ready to close that out. Uh, we have modems, we're pulling in, you saw that ASOS picture? How do we collect that from modems? So th there's this whole range of, of technologies out there. Um, I mentioned paleo data, kind of coring, and then there's satellite data. So I think the value for us would be to recognize whatever statements that are generated to, to please take a look at um, the complexity and kind of where you are and where you want to be. Um, one, I, th I think one really important part that I hope doesn't get lost, and that is the notion of as soon as you connect people to the data, you may think you're successful, but if they have some misunderstanding of the quality of that data, and then they begin to use it on decisions, it can really come back to haunt you in, in a big way. So if that, if that could be part of the quest of this um, working group, I think that would be extremely helpful for us. And recognizing that, you know, how much investment in data quality should be made given, you know, where you intend to go with this data, and it depends on, you know, what the end use is going to be. Can you give an example of where that would blow back on you? So sure. Some yeah, so for, for example, um, I do a real particular, you know, we're mandated to do something as simple as climate normals. You may, you, you may listen to the weather forecast, hey, today it was 87, it was three degrees above normal, that sounds simple enough. But there are some states that actually are constrained for the um, electric bills that they can charge their customers based on things like heating and cooling degree days, which are based on normals. Then you get down to, okay, what stations are you using and what changes in instrument were, were um, used in these different, and when the instruments were down, was the cooling fans and that ASOS working properly? So these are the kind, and then quickly it becomes an economic issue. For the, so again, it depends on, you know, if it's just to take a look at, oh, I thought it was three degrees above normal, you're part of the general public, probably don't have to go to nth degree. So it's this notion of, you know, what is the intended use of this data because that's part of the investment in quality. That's important. And that applies to uh, economic and demographic data as well mm -hmm. because, you know, huge amounts of federal funds are distributed using that kind mm -hmm. of information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think in the context of uh, how I would reflect that in the working group, I guess a proposed method to accomplish that would be, uh, okay, so the, the, the product level is data, tutorial, here's how to use it, measured by uh, consumption. But which data to choose apparently has, uh, and measured, has basically three components to it. We want to look at some aspect without boiling the ocean, market value, uh, I'll say uh, adoption or market risk, and the cost of production. That it's not just here's a website of something that's interesting and probably good, but insufficient for what we're looking at. To the core aspects of okay, well, we chose this data set because it has this benefit. We're releasing it, and, and by, by the way, if it was me, I'd probably do something that was already public, but not quite consumed as well as it should be. So that's probably a safer bet, at least from a risk perspective. Uh, and then the third aspect of it is, okay, by doing it this way, it either costs X dollars uh, with these assumptions, or we saved a bunch of money through this other way. Some, some aspect of that to, to demonstrate this is uh, either a justifiable investment that needs to be made to do this the right way, quote unquote, open data the right way, uh, or hey, and I have a hunch for this, just looking at me tell, tell stories about paper tape, um, here's a tremendous cost savings opportunity for the American taxpayer if we just do modern da data dissemination in this fashion. Here's all the great benefits that can be provided at, from a business perspective as well as from a mission enabling. We're helping uh, American prosperity, prosperity and our competitiveness abroad. Those, the, I'd be, the, call the kind of the operational co constraints, the factors on how to do this selection, this, this sprint, how, how to do that well. That's, how, that's why I would interpret it, but I don't know if others have other kind of mechanical it's a, recommendations. It's, it's the same three uh, mission statements that we started with, or the two plus bills. Increase the data utility to stimulate economic growth, improve data governance and data management within NOAA, yeah. and document the economic benefits of that utilization. 
Uh, so I would Ian, stay away from within NOAA. Just that's, oh, fine, uh, fine. Within uh, commerce. Yeah. It, so more Ian, broadly. Uh, before we stand up a working group, just want to bring everyone's attention. Uh, NOAA already works with uh, the Environmental Information Services Working Group under the Science of uh, NOAA Science Advisory Board, as well as the Data Archives and Access Requirements Working Group, also mm -hmm. under the NOAA SAB. What I would recommend to this group, I think there's a lot that we could learn from CDAC, but before we formally stand up a working group, maybe we could take it back to NOAA, see what sort of interaction between these, that group and any sub, um, yep. working group yep. might exist would, would uh, be the most efficient, and also to identify what unmet needs we have yeah, that's that isn't important. being served yeah. by another yeah. group, because you know, we don't want to have two or three different groups all yeah. looking at the same thing. Well, I mean, another, I mean, a quick compromise hybrid approach is if we just make this commerce-wide, not NOAA-specific, then that, one, gives us more flexibility, but two, probably the first step they should do is say, go call the NOAA FACAs and say, hey, what y'all working on? And then could we actually join forces? So that, that's just going to, I think, a good bridge to provide some flexibility and also make sure this thing is set up for success in a short period of time. Uh, yes, Tom? Yeah, and, and to add to that, I think that's where the great um, benefit of considering the Department of Commerce-wide is, and that is, the integration, the data we have becomes extremely valuable when you try to look at it from an economic perspective. I mean, housing starts, how are that affected by, by the environment? Um, <coughs> so anyway, I think that, so Brian, that might be something we could take back to, to say how we want to integrate with our more broadly. I think that sounds right. Okay, uh, and I will say this, we are uh, way over time, but this is a really <laughs> an important discussion, so we'll uh, propose this and then think Bill had another comment. Uh, I think we're at the, this is a great idea. I'm super inspired about it. I want to like not go to the other sessions of today and just work on this today. Um, but there's other fantastic presentations that we, we definitely want to cover with the time that everyone has, has uh, brought here and committed. So uh, I think one of the actions we'd like to do to close up this one recommendation is just to basically get a set of volunteers who wants to be involved in this Sprint, who wants to be involved in this process to determine uh, how we can specifically disseminate. Oh, well, there we go. I can't even get to it. Got four. Almost so. Bill, Kati, Steve, Vadim, Karen. Yeah. You got those first. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, Bill. Yeah, just real quick. I want to push back on this FACA issue because the the ice wig is very scientifically oriented or within the weather community field. The beauty of this group is it it's a bunch of people bringing outside perspectives. So I think it's very complementary to ice wig. I also want to say, I want to push back a little bit on the, I want to be careful about scope creep. Um, so I think uh, we can have a working group that, consult, that consults with lots of different groups. Uh, we definitely want to include lots of different groups and lots of different inputs, and that, because we don't have all the expertise, we want to convene as many different parties as possible to get different inputs, absolutely. To work together with other groups that may have gone over this ground before, absolutely. But I think we do have unique experience and expertise in the room that I would say, in given our mandate, to be focusing on data strategy for the Commerce Department. I don't think you're going to find another group anywhere in the world with as much expertise as we have in the room and within this group. So I, I think we're unique in that perspective. Yeah, let, me, let me add just a couple of thoughts on the Commerce perspective. Remember, the Chief Data Officer for Commerce is an experiment. Much. Uh, the CDAC is an experiment. The, the fact we have a goal on data is an experiment. Uh, it's not an experiment, it's in the, it's in the plan, but, but it is the first time it's ever been done, right? And, 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 I, and, and of course, the big data project at NOAA is an experiment. There's lots of these things going on, and we really want this group to s help us think through for the whole department. I mean, it would be, you know, if you just look at one piece of it, then the rest of the department is not benefiting. We think you have the ability to actually help us look at it really broadly. And that's the value of this group, I think, in my view. Okay. As a compromise, maybe we can have a general scope of Department of Commerce and I can give you, you know, 10 minutes talk on how it is impossible to find any data on the internet from International Trade Committee. <laughs> it's a completely different conversation, but with a closer scope of trying to make a difference to NOAA, with a look on how the finding and how the whatever we find, how the learnings can be applied to the rest of the Department of Commerce. Uh, I think that would be easy to achieve, and it would be something what everybody can benefit, and it's something what can be done within next 14 months of administration. Maybe we could just choose two use cases from NOAA and one from Census or something like that. 
in a, yeah, a, so the, it's an interesting idea. I would ask that you allow Noah to take that idea back and see and, and to identify what the real what the real need is um, before we go ahead and jump. I think it's fine. Yeah, I mean, every any good. This, this diagnostic, you know, you, 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 I think there's a starting point and there's a starting proposal, I'd say, for NOAA data, broadly defined. Um, and it feels like probably a good place to start, but I don't think there's any commitment that it has to be NOAA data. Is that fair? Yeah, I, I really think that the value here is how do we unleash our, our data um, in general? What are the best practices to unleashing our data? What are the best practices to engage customers? What are the best, and customers could include bu mainly businesses for us, but um, you know, what are the best practices for getting feedback? Uh, this experiment is really giving us lots of lessons at NOAA, but there's lots of other things you guys know which we don't know. Um, and to be really useful, it, this is about helping us get the best practices from industry and, and how we can shape our own thinking across the department. Yeah, so I think to demonstrate that use case, I mean, personally, what feels right to me in the end result of this, probably hail data set, some precipitation thing in one area, forest fires in California, I don't know, like that almost kind of thematic story than it is the big data project. That is fundamentally different than I think what this working group is, is envisioning. That's my, my personal expectation. It may just be the technology hat I used to wear, just thinking super small, super quick, let's prove it out, let's demonstrate the right way, document why it's good, have it be market driven. Like that is still valuable without even like really touching on the ambition of the big data project. That, that's separately uh, managed. It's as a different, to Bill's point, it is a different charter than, I, I can't remember the acronym, I, ISIS some, something. Uh, Icewig and Darwig. Yeah, that's like, that, feels, that feels different to me than like, let's get some API consumption for hail data. Like that, that's kind of in a different world. But as, as a practical move forward, why don't this group write up a little charter for what it's yeah. trying to yeah, yeah, do? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Then we vet it internally, make sure we have our inputs, uh, inputs provided so we're all on the same page as to where we go forward. I, I was just going to say, I don't think we want to go too small because part of, the, part of the challenge is understanding what the commonalities are across the different groups. And if you just focus on, on you know, mm -hmm. hail, Mm -hmm. or fire or the combination of those or whatever, you miss being able to capture the generalities that will help everybody across the board. And we don't have to go deep into mm -hmm. all of them, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. just to kind of survey it, I think, across the board is really helpful. Well, th this well, is a balancing I, act here, right? I, I, oh, sorry. Comple I completely agree because if you go very small, whatever, fires, uh, drought in California, uh, it, uh, it would be very great PR story, we'll have very great publicity, have papers printed out and, okay, done. Well, uh, and it's sort of like what you have right now. You, each of the groups sort of has their thing and they specialize in that and the idea I think we're trying to do is, is yeah, make yeah, that yeah, a yeah, more yeah. unified picture. I, I, I mean, I think we, we're getting into implementation scope right now and uh, I think we have a consensus among volunteers yeah. that we would like to start working together and I think we can come up with some scenarios for scope and mission and bet them mm -hmm. with our partners together and refine them until it satisfies many interests. I, I don't think yeah. that we're interested in creating something that no, somebody doesn't want. Right, right, right. Right? I think we want to work together to add value, and I'm sure we can do that in a collaborative way yeah. as a next step. The, I think this discussion about some of these constraints, the balancing act is important because it's also going to be how we ensure that that future vetting actually doesn't lead to you know, uh, excessive red lines. I mean, so Brian's concerns about some of the uh, uh, jurisdiction and obligation, uh, if we get you know, the other point of seeing too big perhaps and having too many cross uh, uh, requirements also has on some level of burden that we can access those folks and that they're going to be scrubbed in. They may not be as committed potentially for any number of reasons uh, to our project as they are on other, you know, polls. So I think that here's that balance that, that I think was worth discussing here. But I agree. Next step is to write this down. Talk to the, some of the the folks yeah, that have take yeah take it to the group and then let's propose it and let's see if we can get this thing stood up. Yeah, we'll set up a yeah. conference call and yeah, 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 invite yeah. folks to participate and just begin talking about it. Yep. Brian, does that, does that feel right to you? To the, uh, the concern you brought up before? Uh, yeah, let's 
you know, let's see what comes out of this meeting, and we'll we'll talk on Monday and see yeah. see what the next steps are. Or tonight? Wait, wait you don't come on. We're we'll here. Talk about it tonight, Brian. Uh, all right, let's do tonight. this. Tonight. Let's. Uh, so, th <laughs> let, let me propose this then. So, thank you all for this extraordinary feedback and participation. Thank you to the presenters, uh, Tom, Brian, Bill, for for sharing your insights and for all those that participated. Um, the next part of the agenda was basically a set of, we'll say, uh, lightning presentations from uh, CDAC members with some updates, and then in the afternoon session we had responses and follow-up to previous CDAC recommendations, and also uh, we'll have a slight audible change uh, to our workforce discussion. Uh, we have some other th things teed up as a replacement, but that, that's the balance of the program for today. Given that we've been sitting down for a little while, maybe I can propose this. We could take a five-minute break, five-minute break, five-minute coffee break, uh, and then we'll come back and just resume the agenda as set up. We're only, we're actually not running that far behind if you look at some of the breaks in between. Um, so then we'll just carry on from there. Does that sound good? So yeah, we're gonna try to, we'll try to clean up some of the trash that's around and, and Tanja has some setup stuff to do. So five minutes, maybe a minute or two longer. All right.
Let's come back together. We need to get started again. Let's wrap up conversations and come back to the table. Let's get started in one minute. If you're in a conversation, can you pull it to a close and let's get started. Here's the equivalent of the wine glass thing. We want to get started shortly, so please, by shortly I mean in a minute or less, so let's get back to the table. We're going to turn it over to Kati Borner for her discussion on converting data into actionable insights. This should be very cool. Kati. Thank you. So this presentation is about, given that you have data, how do you actually get actionable decision-making insights out? And it's on open data, open code, and open education. And the first comment I want to make is that in today's time and age, um, science, technology, innovation, and also the economy itself is global. So the more you have access to global data, not only local data or regional data, if you have access to global data, you have a better chance of getting better decision making done. Um, also, if you have data that's interlinked to each other, that's also key to adding value to open data. Obviously, economic, scientific, environmental, patent, and geospatial data is at the core of the CEDAC mission, and these are the mission statements here. Um, what I would like to emphasize is that very, very soon, I believe, many of the Department of Commerce data sets will become one of those little bubbles. And so as many data sets as you have, as many new bubbles will you see here effectively tenfolding this kind of graph. Um, those of you which haven't seen that before, this is the linked open data cloud diagram. You can um, zoom into the area here, for instance, which is the departmental one. And you, was, uh, you see that a lot of um, UK um, offices, government agencies, already have made their data a part, an integral part of this evolving uh, semantic data, which is semantic index, can be uh, crawled and is interlinked uh, in many cases. Um, what I would like to see is some first data sets from the Department of Commerce linked into this because then they become automatically available to many, many people. Some of these um, circles are driven by, um, so if we zoom out again, some of these um, color-coded circles here um, they are provided by graduate students or faculty members like myself, but many, many of these um, circles are databases which are served by industry and or government agencies, and there is a certain quality and a certain reputation behind those uh, bubbles. If we zoom into another area, then you get to see more on expertise, because ultimately you do not only want to make data available, but also expertise about the data. And I circled here the uh, Vivo system. And Vivo, for those of you which are not familiar with it, this was a $12 million era funded project to create a kind of Facebook for researchers, a profiling system, which um, 
created um, software that anyone can download, install at, for instance, Indiana University, link it to HR, uh, course credit, um, sponsored research databases, and then you will know what I have in terms of funding in terms of publications, how much I teach, what my office address is, etc. cetera. Um, USPTO could take that and also apply it internally. In this moment, it would expose what kind of expertise exists within the agency. Other agencies, um, USDA, for instance, they have done this, and they get a much better understanding of their own expertise profiles, but they can also broadcast this to the world, uh, really helping other people to understand what kind of um, uh, expertise to query for what kind of question. If you're interested to see what institutions have adopted what kind of systems, um, obviously there's not only Vivo, there's also Harvard Profiles, there's Elsevier's and Thomson Reuters um, solution to the um, researcher profiling uh, problem. You can go to NINC and SIU EDU and you can explore what kind of data types have been loaded. For instance, uh, people data, publication, patent, funding, uh, courses data. The Vivo ontology can also hold resource data such as microscopes, um, cell lines, um, anything else you want there. And it's in the process of also getting expanded to hold data data. And I think that's relevant for the effort we have here. Um, so for instance, um, National Institutes of Health, they have downloaded a Vivo instance, filled it with their data because they had the need to broadcast this data and to make it um, available in the linked open data cloud. So this can be very easily done and this software is already paid for. Um, I wanted to highlights that Europe has a number of very exciting data, data projects. And in particular, over the next two years, they will bring online a lot of um, data sets. And you might like to um, click on those links and check that out. Open code. So again, if you have data, then you need ways to actually get patterns, trends, other insights out of this data. And many of you might be familiar with telescopes and microscopes and maybe even own one of those devices. Here we are more interested in providing macroscope functionality. Macroscopes are bundles of software that help you to read and write data, but to also analyze this data, to simulate data, to visualize data. And that's useful for understanding society, nature, technology, to understand systems that are multi-scale, that are too fast or too complex to understand with the naked eye. And um, talking about these plug and play macroscopes, it's really like Flickr YouTube, but instead of sharing images and videos, you share here software artifacts and you can bundle them very, very quickly, just like you can compile your own music library on your iPhone or other phone. Uh, here you would take plugins, which are wrapped code pieces written in C or Fortran or other languages, and you put them in one directory. In this moment, they show in your menu system of your tool and you can use them and bundle them into workflows. And oftentimes, algorithm developers and users, they are domain experts. They are biologists, meteorologists, social scientists, etc. And it takes programmers to implement that plug and play uh, service. Uh, but here we benefit from OSGI, the Open Service Gateway Initiative, which has probably cost more than NSF and NIH together could afford for such a software development. And uh, adding SciShell, you get these plug and play uh, functionalities. If you have macroscopes and you can take ideally um, OCR or otherwise digitized data, uh, that's the le left hand one uh, picture, and you can um, convert it into something that helps you to find your way, to find collaborators, friends, or to identify trends. And these are macroscopes have also been used to, for instance, understand seasonality effects or geographical effects on the spreading of um, diseases here. And then many of these epidemiology um, approaches, um, analysis or modeling approaches can also be used to understand the diffusion of ideas or bra brain circulation around the globe. You can also use those macroscopes to understand how science is used. This is another map from the um, science map exhibit and some of the maps are also on display um, here at the CDAC meeting. Um, you can try to understand feedback cycles in here funding of the chemical industry. Um, 
fu foundational research and then um, commercial research. And you can try to understand delays in the science technology system. And in my 10 minutes, I won't have time to go into details, but I would be very happy to answer questions or to explain the three reports which are behind that one map, which made it as that yellow arrow graph on the right to a congressional hearing. And those of you interested in science fiction might enjoy this map. Ultimately, you want to interact with science and technology data. You want to see what patents were published today, uh, who is infringing in your intellectual property space, et cetera. And so here you have a setup that's driven by Medline data, open public data, where you can enter your own name to see your footprint on the map of science or on the map of the world. And you can also interoperate it um, and select any area on the map of the world. And you will see highlight on the map of science as a data overlay what kind of research that institution or that region is conducting. And similarly, you can select any area on the map of science to understand who on this planet, on our one Earth, is uh, working in that area. Open education, ultimately, if you have open data and open code, you need a little bit of hand-holding for really understanding what to do with science data or what to do with other data and how to operate that new tool or online service. And there are distribution mechanisms already in place that you can readily use as the school system. There are libraries, there are museums, um, there are science trains, if you have one of those, uh, very effective to bring a lot of science to many cities uh, if you have a train station. Bloomington, Indiana doesn't have a train station anymore. It's a jazz cafe place now. Um, you have these large scale uh, display uh, walls and you have other public places that allow you to bring up large scale visualizations of, for instance, Department of Commerce data. If you happen to uh, visit CDC in Atlanta uh, between January to June next year, you will see 100 maps of science and technology plus a lot of uh, maps that CDC has been generating uh, surrounded with um, talks and workshops that really try to improve the data muscles that CDC has. And I highly encourage other government agencies to really open the hearts and minds of many people to the beauty and uh, value uh, and complexity of science and technology. Now, Many people don't want to travel. They might have kids or they're already traveling too much. Uh, and so those people can just go online and take one of those many, many MOOCs, these massively open online courses that are now available. We have been teaching one for four years now, and it's fascinating to see people from 100 countries come in and learn together. And it's enriching not only our research and development, but also their lives. And, um, and I think it also interlinks them to many, many other efforts out there. If you go to Class Central, you will see 50 courses that are currently available in the data visualization area. And you can select those that are taught by your favorite teachers or more hands-on versus uh, theoretical. Um, there's really, you can take your favorite pick. Now, many of you might not take courses all the time. So what I think is also needed, and this is my main pitch here, this is the focus of my presentation, is that you find a way to get science forecasts or data forecasts to everyone on a daily basis. You have to, when they come to, your, to their office, they have to have a screensaver that shows them what new data sets, what new tools, what new online courses just became available. You have to empower them to deal with that stream of incoming new stuff. Uh, and ultimately, I think that will require that you have something like Bill Nye's a science guy or something similar that really shows them how to use this and make it relevant to their daily life. So we started to um, prototype at Indiana University what we call science forecasts. And you will get to see season one, episode one. And again, I hope that many of you soon are going to work on data forecasts, which feature new data sets, which feature new ways of dealing and using that data. So let me go forward, and I think we will have uh, that started by Tanya. Welcome to Season 1, Episode 1 of Science Forecast, broadcast directly out of Indiana University here in Bloomington, Indiana. Today, we're taking a look at a map of the world overlaid with global scientific collaboration patterns. Every time two researchers collaborate, it creates a link. The more collaboration between these two researchers, the thicker that link becomes. We can see this density in the US, Europe, and Asia. 
Let's take a deeper look into the United States. We can see this densification along the West Coast. A lot of here along the East Coast, we have Chicago, and here we are in Bloomington, Indiana. Let's zoom back out, take a look at activity in Europe. Fueled by the European Union and other funding, many researchers are collaborating across countries and across different disciplines, creating a lot of activity here. Let's take a look at a different data set. This time we're looking at Twitter, still looking at Europe. Each dot is a tweet, and the colors represent different languages. We can see in the Netherlands we have light blue for Dutch. Other major urban areas include Paris, London, Madrid, Berlin. A lot of activity in those areas. Our guest in studio today is Johan Bolin. He's using this global Twitter data from you and from me, our friends and family, and people all around the world to predict human behavior. Let's see what he has to say. You can actually look at an individual and see what that individual is experiencing in terms of, of ups or downs in terms of mental exactly. health. Exactly. Yeah, that's kind of the idea. I mean, that's what this graph shows. It's essentially a user that at one point in time on Twitter publicly announced that they were, had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Right. Then our computers picked that up. We took the Twitter handle downloaded the, all of the tweets that that individual had submitted to Twitter over the past uh, two or three years. And then our computers went to work looking at every single tweet, looking for indications of uh, a particular psychological mood state that was evinced by the wording of that tweet. And then you can chart that over time. You end up with a timeline like this where you can clearly see that this individual went through episodes where their, their mood was a lot more manic and had much greater variance. And then very silent periods where presumably they might have been more depressed. Interesting, isn't it? Maybe one day there'll be an app for all of this. It might change when and what you tweet. This is a map of science where continents are not America, Europe, Asia. Instead, they're disciplines of science. We have math and physics in purple, medical specialties in red, and social sciences in yellow. You can see the overlap between all these different disciplines, and the push and pull is created when new links are generated between the different disciplines. Let's zoom in now on medical specialties. We just heard our guest Johan Bolin talk about mental disease, and it is found in this medical specialties area. Next time on the Science Forecast, we're going to talk about the funding and the research in this area. Stay tuned. Thanks for joining us today. Um, interview is 15 minutes long, so if you would like to see that at some point, let me know. Um, ultimately, I believe that um, Twitter data, for instance, you might know Johan Bolland from his work to predict the uh, stock market data based on Twitter activity, and there were a lot of um, interesting news items around that. But the Department of Commerce actually has a lot of the data which could drive these kind of science technology forecasts. You could look at patent data, you could look at census data, and you could totally um, help people to understand, to get a more global understanding of how science technology and innovation works, what's the fusion pathways are, what the densification patterns are, how different types of funding mechanisms impact that landscape. And again, I hope um, this gives you an idea of what can be done today. Thank you very much. Uh, any uh, comments, questions, or feedback for Kati? Oh, Karen. I just have a really quick one. Now, you, you uh, mentioned that the linked open data cloud was like funded better than NIH or NSF could do. Who's funding it? No, the OSGI, the Open Service Gateway Initiative. Um, Where do they get their money? So this is um, a major industry effort, and th this is a modular software development. So typically, this uh, kind of software is used in coffee machines, in cars, in, in washing machines, etc. However, it's just um, a, a way, a specification and prototype implementation to to do software development in a plug-and-play way. And I think what, uh, whatever platform you select ultimately for plugging and playing data sets and algorithms, you want it to be very, very porous, to play well with other architectures, to uh, take on new data sets very quickly, to make it super trivial, easy, a wizard-driven process to take on code um, developed in, in many different programming languages and then have them play with other data sets. And just like on YouTube, uh, Twitter, very, very few items are really relevant to you personally. Similar in such a code uh, marketplace, very, very few algorithms are relevant for you. So you would download 10 or maybe 100 of your favorite algorithms and data readers, and then you may need one more database connection because you have an in-house database which nobody else has. So you implement that one, but then you can already use and benefit from all these other algorithms which are out there. And and then the only the one thing I wanted to just say is what a challenge it was as a program officer at NIH trying to fund things that would do that. I mean, it's really hard to get something 
like that past peer review at NIH, so I think it's wonderful that this can mm -hmm. come into into play, this private sector sort of um, yeah. contribution. And actually OSGI now is used by a number of other um, um, tools, and of course the more tools adopt OSGI and SciShell, the more we can steal their algorithms and their know-how and their programs <laughs> ultimately. Also, It's really all about being compatible with each other, expertise-wise, but also data and code-wise, ultimately. Yeah. Steve? I, I think this is a really, really important point that uh, both of you are raising. Um, we often talk about open data, and we only talk about uh, structured or unstructured data, and we're not really thinking about the code as well. And I think a really key opportunity for, obviously, the Commerce Department can't open source all of its code for national security reasons, but when it comes to developing interfaces for how, the, to Vadim's point earlier, to how the public might interact with the data and to encourage innovation. Um, having some of those platforms developed in open source, open code environments in which the public can reuse some of that code to develop new ways of interacting with the data and develop new types of interfaces um, can not only unleash incredible innovation in the public space, but can also help to, as I said earlier, do more with less, right? And so I think that's another consideration that we ought to think about when we talk about the scope of working group is to not only look at the potential for open data, for opening up data sets that Commerce has, but also about the open platforms that allow the public to interact and develop and co-develop and co-create the interfaces necessary so that leading edge researchers like Kati can uh, also work together with the Commerce Department to take some of the assets that they've developed and make them available for new types of visualization and new types of integration. So. That, I think, is a really, really important idea, that it isn't maybe, you know, it's about how we open up the opportunity for co-creation with yep. the private sector and the public. Yeah, that, that's uh, interesting. Though I heard Kati talk about some examples of using commerce data in ways that I had no, nobody, you know, the innovative ideas. So I don't know how you formalize a mechanism to explore that, you know, I don't know what the right format is, but this is something you guys made, well, co-creation as you call it, right? How do you do that? Well, I mean, a lot of that, well, Tyrone? Yeah, so we, we're already doing this. Um, there are two GitHub repos you can look at right now, Commerce Gov and um, Commerce Data Service, and we're all about that, so tell everyone that you know, come look at us. Well, let, let me expand on the we in that point, though. Oh. Until uh, just a few months ago, the Department of Commerce was not on GitHub. Uh, a few months before that, it was considered a security-blocked platform. Half of the Department of Commerce does not have video chat capabilities through Skype or Hangouts or anything like that. It's blocked. Um, we, okay. Extraordinary progress, I think, in the world of open source engineering and open data disclosure has been made by many, many people over many years. Uh, but there's still some expectation, I think, that's uh, uh, been bifurcated between the rate of acceleration within the department and what the private sector, and I'll just say loosely speaking, the scientific and open source, open engineering, open access communities have seen. Uh, I will also say that same point, even as a former scientist myself, there's some aspects of open access that can, I think it fairly said could be used some, use some improvements as well. Um, but I, I will say that within the department, uh, we are st standing on the shoulders of giants and saying that because it is such a data-driven department and so many experts have been working to publish data for so long, it was a pretty easy conversation to say let's unblock GitHub or any, many other tools. There are still some uh, parts that still believe it to be a real security threat uh, and, and in many ways we respect their uh, interpretation of that one platform. But I think as demonstrated by some of the success that Tyrone was just referring to, there is progress. There are measurable gains. And we're showing this, this is, this is the new method of how we should be disclosing our information. If it's not open by default, it's probably wrong. While at the same point we have to rigorously protect privacy, confidentiality, confidentiality and security. They're not uh, combative. We can actually do both, right? Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, again, I, I echo Tyrone's point, you know, Focus on GitHub. Come on, check us out. See what we're doing. Improve on our content. Give us issue uh, or issue requests and pull, or issue report issues and, and pull requests. Um, but uh, that that method is really transforming right now. Okay. Karen, and I and I just took the floor from Steve, who's right. graciously put his card down for a second. So so I could because I was wanting to respond directly to that because I think that one of the things that has come up earlier is just sort of this sense of inertia in the government agencies, and I know I know what that feels like because I I've, I've worked there for a long time, and it's really really difficult to get over. And you know something like going out to GitHub. You want to go out to GitHub, but then there's also the, this need for you know maintaining legacy things. Maybe it's not so much in software development, but 
certainly is in terms of providing you know data resources there's a whole lot of legacy things you can't give them up mm -hmm. until I don't even know if there's some number of years that you have to be successful doing something new before you can right. give up the old. Right. And that's right. very hard. And we, I, was, I had my card up earlier and put it down because I, with, with a similar thing in mind. It's, it's very hard when you're asked to do something extra, even if you know it's better mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you can't give up the previous one. So I just wanted to sort of... Um, let you know that, that we, we, yes, we feel your pain. Uh, if you have open data and open code, open education goes very well with it. And you might be aware that um, Google and other companies have started to use MOOCs to showcase how to use their APIs, et cetera. And I really believe you need that third leg, if you wish. So otherwise, you're just falling over. I think with three legs, you're really, really stable. So you need the open data, open code, uh, open education. Brilliant. OK. Uh, well, should we move on to the next uh, member presentation? Uh, Kati, thank you again so very much. So I believe, uh, Karen, you're up next. Yes, and I told Kati when I saw her last night when I came into the hotel, I felt very sheepish about being on the agenda right after oh. her. D yeah, data visualization expert, I was sure my slides were not going to compete at all. And I am just going way, way down to earth. So we've been talking about a lot of high-level things things that the whole agency can do. And I'm, I'm talking today from the perspective of a very new company with very limited resources. We don't have a lot of time to do things. If we're going to be successful, we have to do what we're going to do really, really quickly. So I'm going to speak about things from that sort of perspective, which is going to be probably different than we're used to thinking about. It's different than I used to think about things. Um, I want to just say really quickly what, times, what types of things we do in our small business, where, our, where commerce data fits in. We've been primarily using commerce data um, in terms of census data um, and how commerce data helps our product. And then how have the access tools that have been provided recently help our product and help our customers. Um, so I've got two different scenarios here. One is just using the commerce data itself, and I'm not sure if I'm close enough to this, but one is just using the commerce data. The other is using the API that was recently released, and what a difference that has made for our little company. So um, we do business analytics, and you don't probably need to know more about that than, than just that phrase. We, we're, what we're trying to do is help our customers prioritize the leads that they have, um, or give predictions to our clients about how their customers are going to behave. So that's, yeah, I mean, that's a general business analytics proposition. And um, when we were preparing this presentation, we were just thinking about, like, what has hindered, and, and what we think about every day, I guess, is what hinders us from making those predictions and making them more accurately for our customers. One of them is that our customers don't have enough data themselves about their contacts, particularly the customers that we deal with. They're largely small companies, nonprofit organizations, things like that. They don't have a whole lot of data sophistication. I mean, I know a lot of companies do have tremendous sophistication about their cli clients and their contacts, but some of our customers don't. So what we do is tie in census data, and I'm just using this as an example. We use a lot of other data also, but we use census data and other, uh, other streams to bring in more information about our clients' um, contacts to help them predict their behavior. And what I wanted to show here was just the difference that using the census data has made for us in a really concrete way. And the numbers are really, you know, they, they look relatively small, except when you see that we can increase the number of people with predictions we can make for our clients by over 200%, that's a pretty astounding sort of benefit of using um, census data in, in our samples. Like I said, this is really small, it's new business, small data, small resources that we have to put to play, but we can use the census data in a really, really practical way. We're able to serve a wider range of clients then and get clients who would, just by the you know, force of what information they already have in their database, not get much information out. But we are able to give them a lot more for this. Um, and then they can make more informed decisions about what they want to do to pursue those clients. 
And then the second thing I wanted to talk about was just that the, the city SDK interface for us made a huge difference. Now we were able to get the census data because we knew it was there and we knew basically how to get it and we could brute force process it. But what made this a whole lot more tractable for us was the city SDK interface, which lets, it, lets us pull that data interactively on an ongoing basis, renew it all the time, have it ready to go. And um, the manual work had cost us resources. We've got a really tiny team. I tell you, we've got four people on our programming team. So if we're messing with trying to download data sets, learn new things from MOOCs about visualizing things, <laughs> we've just got, we've got so few resources. So having this interface and letting us connect to the data on a regular basis with a regular defined interface was just golden for us. So we're now able to fully integrate the, uh, the, the census data into our product, into what we are able to do in our pipeline and our analysis. Um, and we are able to also look at it more um, sort of holistically on the right-hand side in that little box. You see a, sort of a, a hierarchy that we created uh, around the uh, SDK field subjects that sort of spoke to the, the areas that we were interested in. So we were able to um, build our own little hierarchy about those things and use that in our product. So, you know, as I said, we're able to scale a lot better with that automation. We can use a web interface to refresh everything. We don't have to download data. We don't have to think continually about, about what it means. So our clients pay less for our services, which less, lets us build other services. And we get all the data that City SDK provides. We're still learning about what all is available. And you know, there, there's, there's so much data out there. And as, as I said, with four people on our technical team, that takes a lot of work. But it really does for a small business, a new business with limited resources, this kind of thing makes a big difference in, in consolidating our processes in automating them. So, I, and I just wanted to call out really quickly my colleagues, this is the whole of our company here <laughs> listed, and you, and you can see there's just a, a, a few, yeah, st a few yeah. technical people. So we've got a very small business, but it's made a huge difference for us having this kind of resource available to us. So I wanna really thank Commerce and, and Census in particular for providing that kind of interface. Brilliant, okay. Uh, any uh, comments or questions for Karen? No, oh, is that Katya? Is that leftover from before? You're, I, I was yeah. gonna. I was gonna say, like I said, it's very hard to follow uh, Kati in any scenario. <laughs> well, uh, maybe just a, a little extra context. I mean, you mentioned the City SDK project a, a few different times, and, and uh, I think this audience probably knows a bit of uh, SDKs and what makes one good or bad. But uh, it, it was a challenge to even get that, uh, I'll say, experiment deployed. And it's great to hear that it's it's actually helping a, a small business grow. I mean, that's kind of kind of the core of our mission in many ways. Uh, but I don't know, you know, Tyrone, I don't know if I put you on the spot a little bit. You were part of the city SDK team from the beginning. Um, maybe I just want to reflect a little bit about uh, the kind of Thank the Thank you side so of much. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So I mean, uh, it just means that the, I spent six months on this. It made it all worth it. One of the things I could just mention earlier today, it came up that maybe, you know, it was that it was hard for commerce to maybe invest in a particular new thing mm -hmm. without knowing whether or not it was going to be adopted. And I can totally understand that that's difficult. And it's the same with trying to invest in it when you know you still have to support something legacy wise. Yeah. But I, I can tell you this for our company made a big difference. So well, you're the reason why we do this because City SDK was actually built based upon users feedback on what was not going so right with the census API and what made it difficult to actually interact with census data itself. So like we took those kind of hard lessons and said, how do we improve upon this and actually make it better for people to actually get access to census data and also integrate it with local data sets. So the fact that we have like one example here that shows that we actually did it right and someone is using it, <laughs> thank you. One is enough sometimes. Yeah. So. No, there's, there's more than that. I think that uh, this work is really a great example of how innovative government can be. Because it was just two guys, or three or four maybe, within Census that worked on this project for about nine months to bring this idea forward. And look at the impact that it's having here. Um, the city of New York, I know, is uh, we've been trying to broker some conversations between the city and 
the Census Bureau in the City of New York has uh, an application called a Small Business Atlas, and they're looking at using City SDK for more um, efficient access to census data than they currently do. They're doing, you know, traditional queries and lookups, and it's very inefficient, and they have to, reorg they have to uh, rewrite those every time. And um, I think that this, this is exactly what you want government to function like. Few people not being timid, taking a risk, trying something, and, okay, in the beginning it didn't work out perfectly, try it again. Okay, we learned something new, try it again, you know, and keep going. And, um, I, you know, this presentation demonstrates just the value proposition for it. So we look forward to investing. Huh. Well, <laughs> let, me, let me make this a little broader. So um, in previous conversations, and this came up a little bit in some of the email correspondence between the, the council, and as a reminder, by the way, when you send an email to all council, that's official record, that's official dis discourse, it's as public as anything else we say here. Thank you, Ian. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one of the comments, I'm going to put Kevin on the spot. Uh, you made a recommendation in one of those emails that basically not all APIs are created equal, that there's right and wrong ways to disclose information. We had a census API, but to Tyrone's point just now, it wasn't working. Somehow, the dissemination was not effective. The city SDK project is, a, is as demonstrated by uh, basic Karen's testimony of like, hey, this stuff works, it shows that there is actually a better way to disclose some of this information. So, you know, Kevin, from your perspective, broadly working with a number of different governments, what are some of the, the broader principles for how to do APIs well? Where are some of those systemic breakdowns, perhaps in the federal government, at least specifically commerce, and how do we maybe translate some of these city SDK experiences to a wider set of recommendations? Yeah, happy to share some thoughts. So. <clears throat> About a year and a half ago, we introduced our, our version 2.0 of our API, and we learned a lot of lessons from between 1.0 and 2.0. Um, I, would, I would categorize all of the learnings as the following. One is an API alone is insufficient. That what, what else is needed around the API is some sort of an interactive console where you can experiment issuing commands against the API where you'll see responses back in real time. It's even helpful to have an interact interactive visual experience where you can actually explore the data. You can see the data you know, in, in rows and columns before you actually get at it programmatically. Um, there's all sorts of documentation that needs to be wrapped around the API. Uh, not, not just um, examples of how to use the API, but getting started bootstrap code in common web development languages, you know, like Python and Ruby and, you know, various other tools that people are using today. Um, getting started guides, you know, video tutorials, and then, you know, probably more importantly than anything, community. That, that, you know, developers rely on developers to get insights and accelerate their adoption of an API. And you've, you've got to foster a community around those APIs where developers can talk to each other, developer to developer. And can I just add to that really quickly that one of the problems, too, I see in API land and software development land is that developers are not necessarily the right people to be talking about what the data means and what it means to the company. And it's very hard because I think those are often bifurcated in, in what's presented. The, the de there's a developer's portal which really is talking about the nuts and bolts of connecting to the API and the language, you know, whether it's Python or you know, Ruby on Rails or whatever. And then there's also the semantics of what the data means. And, and it's really hard for a small place to, to bring those two things together. It's, it's something, you know, you've, if you've got a really great programmer, they might not care about what the data actually means, and it's hard to bridge that. Yeah, that's exactly right, Karen. Uh, you know, the, the, the term uh, data dictionary has come up a couple of times today, and in our experience, uh, data dictionaries are great for researchers and analysts and scientists, but web developers actually like self-documenting, self-describing code. And so the, the advantage of having an interactive exploration experience is they can actually look at the metadata. They can see the column names. They can, you know, right-click and look at the headers and see what the descriptions of the attributes are. Uh, so that's, that's a huge uh, advantage that uh, web developers are looking for. There's one other comment that I forgot to make, which is uh, one of the big lessons learned between our first version and our second version of our API is... Um, you really need to develop, uh, you know, kind of a mobile-first mindset in the size of the payload and the expressiveness of the query interface against the API. 
uh, you, you know, you may be publishing a data set with, you know, 10 million records in it, but the last thing a developer wants is to have to get a download of 10 million records and iterate across those records and try to filter them out on the client side. So you need an expressive query interface where you can say, hey, I only want these seven records out of these 10 million, and I actually don't want 38 columns. I want these three columns back. And so you've got to get really, really granular so that a small payload can, can come back for the developer to work with. And I think that this is sort of like that little box that I had there where we did want to prioritize some of the fields. And, and uh, they do have classifications in the, in the metadata that we were able to sort of abstract for our own purposes. But also, we weren't sure what of the data was going to be important because we're looking a little bit for needles in a haystack, not just one, but hopefully several needles. We don't know exactly. Yeah, da Daniel, you were mentioning earlier today, what's the question that you're trying to answer? And I was just thinking, you know, we don't really want to presuppose what the question is. We want to actually just look at all the data and see where there's correlations that we might be able to, you know, get, so get some intuition from. So we really kind of do want all of that, but it's also really good if we can limit it when we need to. Just to add one comment, uh, just remember when we do, you develop API, very often one API cannot serve all of the needs. Somebody would need to have, they only care about one row, but they need the row in 20 milliseconds, and if they would get in 22 milliseconds, you know, it's garbage, not interested. Somebody else needs uh, one million rows, and they can be willing to wait 22 minutes. And it would really depend first on what API is for, second, what is the usage of API, very often you will find places where it's the same data but they're different usage, so probably you need to have either a different API or more flexible API where you can say I want one million rows or I want seven rows out of one million. You might want to have different support of different languages. You know, API which is supported by .NET will not be supported by Java. How do we make sure, and if it's a good example, and whatever, pick any language, Python, Ruby, whatever is your favorite, pl plug it in. Uh, so you do need, very often, creating a single API, it's a good start. It probably will not be the final API you use, unless you have the top of the top developers working on it and they see how it's gonna be used. But just remember that it's just one step, it is, it's iteration. You learn, you iterate, you go next one, you go to version two, you go yeah. into version two, 22, which will be very different than version two. It, and within the same a, API is sort of a collection of calls. You can have all kinds of different things. And, you know, you, it's really tempting to then just say, well, put out a request for information and ask what people need. But I think that that really, uh, I think it comes down more to sort of the personal relationships and figuring out, l really listening to what people do need and, um, and maybe offering challenges instead of our, like, as I said, a company like ours could n never find the time to do, to do any responses to an RFI. Maybe we should, but, you know, we just don't have the resources to do that. So, like, issue a, a challenge about, you know, what, what is it in this data that you would like to see? How should, how should our API be structured? What are the things that need to be optimized for it? So, all amazing points. All things that we tried with the SDK. We had challenges, um, engaging community members to actually figure out what next features are, actively asking people what are the issues, and so what's the, the feature plan for the next set of like things we should be looking at. Yeah, so that, that's what I'm struggling with right now. And I'm Can I make one, one last yeah. comment? Yeah. Uh, I think it's important, which is you, as a government, have to be a consumer of your API for developers to consume your API. You brought that up earlier too, right? So like, all, all I was thinking about was standing for like, what about the internal consumption? All I could think about was the Jeff Bezos, every office needs to have an API, you need to consume an interop. But that assumed that you had an office that knew how to program one. And so it's really e easy for Amazon to make that declaration, whatever, 15 years ago famously that led to AWS and perhaps a few other things. But I, what I'm, there's a, this is kind of like that, that good to great problem in some ways. City SDK is, uh, uh, a measurable success, and I think a huge victory that is underrepresented in terms of its impact uh, on commerce data and its ability to drive greater adoption. Maybe it's because the acronym, that name, I love the name and I hate the name. How many Americans or anyone should know what an SDK stands for or know how to use one? So like on some level it is kind of a niche product, but it also demonstrates the best practices for modern effective data dissemination. I know by the way, we haven't said this yet, the whole thing was produced open source on GitHub, Waffle.io for performance metrics. So you, you can't get to better development principles of community engagement. So if that's the right way, 
but it's an amazing minority. A, a laughable small percentage in terms of the federal government's data disclosure. Now, actually, we're at kind of a, a different set of questions. If, you know, in the previous session we talked about, okay, let's demonstrate some use cases, let's figure out a working group, let's keep going. We actually have that now. And you've basically, in, in the example you've of CDSDK. Of, you've yeah. got a proof of concept, so, so go. So here's the challenge, right? Now let's talk about, and this is what I, I open, open frustration, open call, open uh, opportunity to provide advice. How do we translate now this success to something that is more institutional. Uh, well, Steve? I, I don't know if you know the history of City SDK, because it originated in Europe. It was an EU-funded program that, yes, the idea for City SDK came from Europe. Um, it was an EU-funded program for three years. It got deployed. The answer is we need more money from Europe? That's no, 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 but it, it was, it, it was uh, originally deployed in Helsinki, in Amsterdam, in Barcelona, and Rome. Um, the EU funded it, and they thought it would be self-perpetuating after they did a Kickstarter fund round, and then they, after three years they dropped funding, and it just withered, and it stopped being used, and uh, these guys picked it up, and they, actually, City SDK was developed a little bit more broadly as not just a set of uh, APIs to provide access to data, but also interface elements as well. Yeah. But I think Kevin's point is really, really good, that, um, you know, it's great I love that we have it out on GitHub, and it's open source, and anybody can and enhance it. But you know, the government should be doing that internally, right? You guys should have centers of competence internally to build your own GitHub repositories and use, and that should be somewhat public, so that the government is showing the public how to use its own APIs. Right? And that's part of an education process, in which the government is educating the public by showing, doing by showing. We're showing but, by doing whatever best, it is. So, best practices, so I, I just, sort of. Like, here, right. here's, here's an easy way to get here's it adopted. Here's how we're using it. You know, take some ideas from what we're doing, because we're, by the way, it's our data, so, you know, census data is really, it's really difficult data to use. Yeah. And the, the expertise is finite. You know, like in New York City, there's like a handful of guys who know how to use census data in New York City. Um, so we're not yeah. doing that bad, then. And yeah. so, but we can proliferate that knowledge by teaching others the, by showing others the expertise and illustrating how it's being used by the ones who are experts who know it already. So I'm gonna kind of comment on that. So I've been in this job like oh, two, three sure. months? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I had no idea that Census had, they're, they're using their own APIs internally. They do have agility and, um, What's the other term for it? Sorry. They have like different groups that actually are using modern practices that are actually like open. They're, they're dog fooding in sense. They're, they're yeah. doing it, yeah. but it's not publicized. There's no mechanism out. So it's more of like a process issue. Like how do we actually ex externalize it is, is the issue. Not necessarily like how do we make it happen within government. You just do a MOOC, an internal MOOC. I mean a census MOOC. Um. How much does yeah. this cost to... Um, Maintain this. Uh, city yeah. SDK? City, 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 SDK. SDK. <laughs> the name. I, I, mean, I, I wanted to call it the Smart acronym. Cities Data Integrator, but it was too many words. Yeah. Uh, it's probably just like two or three people that's supporting it right now. Yeah. So the salaries, their salaries, that's it. One, one. Supporting it. So what, and why does it require support once it's built? I, I guess I was thinking it engineers, was just required. To engineers to actually like figure out what next features and implement them for the next. Oh, okay, years. because new feature product development's going on. Yeah. So, but, but if I just currently, wanted, like, like the functionality hosting. exists there, yeah. then it's just server cross, right? Yeah. But they're just but based it's not, on routines, right? It's just sorry? The, the, currently, at City SDK are just uh, accessing data elements, right? It's just like uh, automated queries on specific types of s data groups, right? Unless you, wanted to, unless you wanted to create new functionality, you wouldn't have to do new development. You basically put a new data set under there, and then mm -hmm. this is querying the data mm -hmm. set that exists, and um, that's so it. So, for right? example, like, you, like um, Kevin was saying earlier, uh, there is a particular researcher that says, I really don't want um, access to this particular level, and I really don't want it to be trained in JavaScript. I want a bulk download for Python or something. We have to develop that. Like, that feature is not there right now. We have an MVP that works really well for a particular use case, but there is a, a ways for it to go. We have a roadmap for what the features should be that we need to implement. I see. So, so, but someone, f I, I guess I would think that someone using wanting bulk data, you would just tell them to go get the uh, the summary tape file, 
yeah. and parse it themselves. I mean, that's, but, like, that's what we do. Mm, and, but, and you're right, that's a, that's a more advanced user that's going to do mm. that. But this is a fantastic, I guess my macro point is this looks great. And for I an think MVP. that once it's created. For an MVP. What's that? For a minimal viable product, it is great. Yeah. But it is not like a full-fledged product that we want to actually launch yet. And the, the well, go, go to your macro point, though. Okay. Yeah. My macro point is I'm just wondering why, like, any of these data sets you put up um, that, that Brian showed, I mean, I would think that to, with this as kind of a, as, as an example and the code that exists here, you could put a lot of different data sets under it for very little cost um, and host them. Agreed. So I guess I'm curious why that doesn't happen. Because it's not, if it's not a cost issue, because it's, this is great what you've done here. And I would think you could put multiple data sets under this, mm -hmm. and uh, it would be fantastic. It would be so much better than what exists today. Yeah, I think there, there's three constraints to scale on this particular example. Um, and this will bridge a little bit to previous questions that were made. Um, one, the number of commerce employees who even know what GitHub is, yeah. is <laughs> with, with no disparagement, no disparagement at all. It's a pretty, it's a very, 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 very small percentage. as compared to the number of folks that would benefit, that know how to benefit from City SDK. Right. So there is just good old fashioned exposure, culture, experience, have you done it before? Kevin, you made this point actually, even if there's another tool that's better, you know, how, how long before someone actually starts to adopt it, well, I'm used to this other thing. I'll say there's just a human human engineering part of that. So that's, that's yeah, there's, there's a little bit of that. Okay, second piece, I, t from a technical perspective, and, and Tyrone, correct me if I'm off here, I believe that the uh, functional benefit of City SDK is a lot of the data translations. When census says parcel, you ask for zip code, we can help you map that. Mm -hmm. To scale that out is effectively really complex subject matter ETL. And to scale that to the big data project, that is that, e I mean, I don't know, Tom is still at the table. The level of extract, transform, load, data, uh, the, the data integration, your last slide. That's massive. massive. And just one, probably, I'll say loosely division or discipline, let alone some of the stuff that, that the ambition of that project seeks. And so for, there is some degree of a technical ch uh, scale problem that this, the ETL part uh, issue consists. Um, and I think the um, one part that has to come up and uh, is gonna be, I may be able to defer this to tomorrow's discussion, is a perception of whether open source engineering uh, is secure. It should be adopted at all. On some level, and this gets a little bit to the culture, um, there's a lot of uh, bureaus in federal government who are blocking GitHub. It's not an accident. Get, Commerce did not block GitHub from reticence, it was blocked from proactive security perspectives. They thought that it was a, uh, a challenge to how folks should even be collaborating across bureaus in the first place. Is it a secure cloud? Can you provide record retention? What happens with the FOIA request? What if somebody puts private information uh, out? Um, look at some of the, the social media controls. You know, actually, I'm gonna look, there's a gentleman in the back corner named Mike Kruger. If somebody, he's our uh, director, <laughs> deputy director, the director of the Office of Digital Engagement, and many things social guru for the department, if an official account tweets something terrible, they're not gonna necessarily hold that one person accountable, they're gonna call Mike and say, Mike, what the hell's going on? And so he has to have a system to actually be able to enforce uh, the actions taken in the public domain by a, a specific employee, in that case on Twitter or something like that. So you, you look at those kind of systems and you, it's, it's a little more complex. I, I don't mean to bring this up as, as excuses, I'm just trying to answer the question, why isn't this more widely adopted? Well, you start pulling the string on and it is actually pretty complicated in a bunch of areas. Uh, going back to my first point about the um, constraints systemically on open data, a lot of folks just don't even know what the hell GitHub is or why they should use it. Yeah. And so like, how do you even like, start to be able to get to, oh, this is actually how you do open data. So I'll, I'll come back for a second. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm just trying to jump in to just say the thing is that, well, there might be whatever security concerns with GitHub or with mm -hmm. other things, mm -hmm. you got them all over already. Yeah. I mean, yeah. right? I mean, I was an OPM employee whose data was compromised. It's not like the standard is, you know, <laughs> is. You know, it's not just that, Karen. It's, it's you know, we. <clears throat> We forget that it's not the technology mm. that causes the data breach mm. a lot of the time. It's it's human error or mm -hmm. it's humans. So you know, for a long time, they, they, right. he talked about video chat in this, not in being this case not too. being enabled at the Census Bureau, and it's because they're afraid that that a video chat will show Title 13 data on someone's desk 
or someone will accidentally talk about it. But that's true in the meetings we have in our offices, too. And, and we're sort of missing the point when we focus so much on the technology, and to your point. Well, and especially to the detriment of, of something that's so important as what we're doing in terms of software development. I mean, it's that, why is this held to such a, such a different standard? You know, certainly a, another constraint is just cost, right? It, it's expensive to redevelop existing applications with, even with a new efficient API. It, it just is. But, you know, it might be something to consider for new applications. You might consider some type of internal rule in commerce where new applications that use census data use city SDK or some, you know, some type of mm -hmm, mm -hmm. where you say, okay, we, we really can't change the past. Uh, it's too expensive to redevelop all this old stuff right now. But for new stuff that we're developing, let's insist upon using these APIs as best practices and you create some kind of rule like that. And that might be a way mm -hmm. of... Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to come back to that in the context of recommendations that could be made because I'm still trying to stay focused on how this discussion can be translated to, to real measurable action for the department. I, I have an idea I want to come back to. Please, Vadim. So we talked before about having data dictionary and data governance and working on what data represent. So I just pulled some data SDK example here API, and it looks wonderful. It's uh, essentially you put in the address, you pull out the data. But as I'm looking through the data and, you know, looking through data, which returns one of the, for example, one of the result is a state, and the state is 06. That's the only API which I know which doesn't return state is a two-letter code. It returns as a digit, which I need to go probably to some other data set, which is not defined here. It's probably somewhere else. And I need to figure out the 06 means California, I pulled my address. So going back to taking it to the next level, yeah. I think it's wonderful. I think it's a great first step. But we really need to start working on the data governance data definition and making sure that, you know, when, sorry, it has to be changed. When you put out state, you don't put 06. You put the state itself, and the same goes for country. There are ISO codes for both state and country, just use default one. <coughs> uh, but it goes to a lot of other ways how it's represented and how it's used. It has latitude, longitude. Yeah, I know what it means, but it should be defined somewhere, whether it's min in minutes or whether it's minutes, seconds, and everything else. Agreed. Great MVP. Create a good issue. I mean, we're all about the feedback, so every feedback, every use case you have, we will actually you know, prioritize and implement. Okay. <laughs> and I, I think um, I'm trying to distill this into the kind of the operational reality of where does the Department of Commerce, federal government stand today with these, I'll say, great examples of success, but those that are not being deployed as widely as we want them to. It's never, nothing's happening as fast as we want them to, right, in the tech sector. Um, it feels like there are two types of recommendations that can come out of this discussion. Uh, one, that happens to be a wonderful convenience of the Census Bureau themselves planning, I'll say loosely speaking, a massive data, uh, I'm not going to say overhaul, I don't know what I have to call it, there's a bunch of projects for data improvement that are going on with or without us. And they're amazing, and they're doing it the right way, and they have the brilliant folks working on it, and they're committed to it with the right levels of investment, by the way, over multiple years. So, I'm oh, sorry? And vision, yeah, extraordinary vision, uh, uh, at all, basically at all levels, from the senior leadership down to the folks that are uh, pounded on keys in uh, dimly lit rooms. Um, so I think in the census case, there is opportunity, not to demand necessarily, but to just really take back to the leadership there. And they've been a, a census bureau, a number of folks have been employed by that bureau here today, um, to just ask a set of questions about, you know, how do we expand on the success of City SDK? That that's the type of recommendation that we think it's great, got more to do, but how, how do we expand that out within the context of the census and, uh, operations? We think it's a great victory. Basically, it's more of a question than a statement. What else can be done with it? Um, and I have a hunch, by the way, that there's probably some folks that you've met with previously in previous meetings will say, well, there's actually ways in which we can build up levels of dog fooding, APIs between different programs. There's, uh, if you remember from the last CDEC meeting, there was a discussion around said science, said cap. And if you remember those from the last CDEC meeting, they, I think there's straight, very direct ways in which the City SDK project and the tools behind it can be integrated in some of those uh, initiatives. Again, not as a, as a statement, as a question. Like, this is great, what else can be done? A second recommendation I propose is uh, a recognition of the fact that, uh, you know, not, that there are very federated governance structures, even within commerce, even within NOAA, talking about some of the different folks doing things uh, for many ways for, on, on, for different reasons. Um, I, I think there is room for us to define more of what good is 
and I'm not going to suggest writing another guidebook. I feel like there's 15 great examples of we know what open data, how, what good open data looks like. It is out there before, but at some level, I don't feel like that really exists for it, the API data translation ETL thing. I think that's a little more cutting edge uh, in terms of its uh, agreement as to what good looks like. And I think about the documentation of Project Open Data. We know what open data, good open data looks like. You know, non, non uh, proprietary, uh, as, as granular as possible, well attributed, good metadata. Metadata has very detailed definitions. But on the API side, I don't really think that exists. At least not that I've read or found. As like this is what a good city, this is what a good SDK is. This is what a good API is. Um, and I'm, for those that are looking, working more in that space, I don't know, Dana, Kevin. Uh, Vadim, I, I, I know, I don't know, Stan, if you're there as well. Are, are there good examples of that out there that are more just industry accepted? So if we were to come up with a one pager of this is what a good API looks like, it has these characteristics, this is the right, this is an example of success, w would that be a wasted exercise? Does that already exist somewhere? Uh, no, I don't think it's a wasted exercise, and I do think it exists, um, okay. although in slightly proprietary form by oh, a yeah. company that I know well. Huh. Uh, but uh, <laughs> you could certainly copy and paste the, uh, the best open practices source? and put yeah. them somewhere else. Yeah, yeah we, we certainly have. Uh, oh, yeah, we also certainly have best practices on APIs that uh, we use. And uh, you, I, I would encourage you to think beyond a binary, good or bad, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. perhaps think about um, best practices in using APIs. Um, Data dictionaries, well defined, you know, a high, performant, uh, open. You know, what are the criteria? And uh, because if you make it good or bad, right, then the bad ones don't get utilized and they don't get improved. So uh, rate, yeah, create a, a rating system, yeah. sort of a scale, yeah. and then do some type of rulemaking, policy making internally to tell your um, different organizations um, here's how you can use the different APIs at different sets of ratings, right? So. Some of these can be used internally for pilot projects, but can't be used for production code, you know, things like that. But let's I, also be clear that APIs have a lot to do with who the audience is and what they're trying to get out of it. They're social, they're social products as much as they're technical products. And I mean this to say, like, I think that there's a, a lot that can be done by coming together and having an exercise about what are the best practices internally and what are the standards across your organization or maybe layers of standards. But I don't think it's a matter of just mirroring another institution's approach to all of this mm -hmm. because it has a lot to do with the nuances of who you're trying to go. Yeah. Even something so simple as like, how much data do you include in your API? You can include everything and then the cost of you know download, the cost of storage, and it's like really those fields are just not needed. So why are we making those the primary part of our API? So like, it's a lot about it, trying to understand the social processes around the technical artifact, but it should be thought through. But I just don't just mirror something that's happening in, in companies and yeah. think you've done it right. The, the, what, I, what I was going to say is that it, it, I think it's a process question more than a technical question because I think you guys, you know how to do the technical part when you need to and I think that the, the biggest issue is figuring out the internal process for coming up with what it is you do want to deliver, what people need to have delivered and how to um, keep that renewed, how to, how to be responsive to it and it's, it's not so much a technical question as a process question. Yeah, I want to be very careful when you say we know know it. We is 46,000 people and you're talking about five people. So uh, I just want to be careful about the scale of what, what that is. You have a working example of how to do <laughs> yes. it and since you yeah, have yeah, but, but this is, this is, I think, why this conversation that I just found extraordinarily fascinating about the, the best practices for APIs and, and including Dana's comments about how you actually develop and what you need to consider while you develop an API. Because I think uh, that kind of information, if it's put together by this group, would be extraordinarily valuable to the department very broadly. I, I just wanted to I add that in general there is, sorry. No, no, you, you, were, you were. There are a number of recognized. companies you know, around the world in Silicon Valley, small startups, whose <coughs> business is managing APIs yeah. or creating APIs. Their business is not providing data, their business is not, their business is actually creating that middle layer, which is called API, or create, taking one API and multiplying it into five different types of API for different languages. Uh, maybe it would be, so first of all, it's, I, I completely agree, it's extremely important to have a methodology or have a rules of 
what does, does it mean to have good API? It now, it's not gonna work 100%, but it's gonna be a starting point. But to get there, I do think if, you know, all of us here, we can give you a number of companies who have examples, we have examples, but how to collect it, but then it should be applied back to your use case. As you said, there are five people out of 40, what did you say, 45,000 or 4,500, yeah. whatever, out, out of some number, yeah. a large number. Well, so it's not that, well. our, what we consider to be our guidelines for API for you is gonna be different. Okay. Not a question yeah. asked but it's very important to create it and it's very important to have as much input from different companies. And a lot of those small startup companies that would love to provide their input as long as you provide back that thank you very much for company mm -hmm. ABC. Sure. Uh, I think Austin had a comment and Stan as well. And Dan? Yeah, just a real quick comment. I think we've got an action item coming off our conversation around MOOCs which is, uh, you know, we have an in-house person that's on our team right now, Eric Newberger, who's very good at kind of the Bill uh, Science Guy type <laughs> instructional videos. I mean, he's actually really yeah. uh, impressive. And so I think we can use him for some of the yeah. videos around API usage. I just wanted to kind of throw that in there as a as an action item for us. Go check out some other MOOCs. There are great ways to see what works online and what doesn't work online, especially if, we, if it comes to more technical aspects, how do you best present this all? And um, again, typically I don't have time to go into other people's classrooms, but now you can do this very easily, and, and yeah. it's really wonderful to yeah, see this. Yeah, you sent them over, yeah. So the, your suggestions, uh, we're big thank you to Kati for basically giving examples, not 100% uh, of every video applies every time, but just like, here's, what, here's some examples of what good looks like, and uh, we did forward that along, and, and thank a lot of uh, to Kati's feedback, we are setting up this basically educational program w within the department to get more of these lessons deployed. Yeah, uh, Stan. Yeah, I was just gonna say, based on your um, comments about some of the systemic issues, Ian, about um, why things don't happen, I mean, I, it sounds to me like your problem is more push, not pull. So examples of good websites and APIs aren't going to go pull people to, within commerce to go do more of it it sounds like you have more of a push problem of um, a mandate to, hey, if you have any data set that you're gonna produce, it has to, be, it has to be public, and here's a bunch of examples for, and if you don't know how to do that, then I don't know, go to the CDO and our CIO at Commerce, and he'll help you figure that out. He or she will help you figure that out. Here are a bunch of examples of how to do it, um, and then, of course, there's a, cost component to that, I suppose. Um, but I guess the CIO and the CDO's office, would, their job should be to how to do that in a really lightweight, low-cost way. And then maybe the expertise lies more with them to how to do this in a cheap way, rather than having to, to, uh, to the prior point about commerce being a large organization. And you, you know, so yeah, I don't think you can get 43,000 employees to understand APIs, but can you get five and, or 10? and then all the other groups say, hey, I'll just go to you, and I've got a data set, I'll drop it out here, and can you build an API on top of it? So I think it's a very astute observation, and my instinct is to respond to it, but I'm actually gonna to defer to somebody who has been tracking this for some time to see if we have as much of a push problem as uh, Stan described. So Dan, you, you, it's kind of your job, right? Um, what, what do you think about that diagnosis? Um, well, so let me just take a step back. I mean, I, I just think it's interesting that um, again, we're kind of at this conversation about whether we're talking about the data itself or the infrastructure. Um, and, you know, we were kind of having this conversation before about the NOAA stuff and how, you know, we have this big data partnership and we're really focused on the infrastructure and the API. It seems to me it's that same thing where we're, we're kind of moving away from the data and to the infrastructure. I think the reason I think it's important to, to really just acknowledge where the problem is because we need to know, um, you know, where are the agencies focusing their problem solving? Are they talking to users about what data they need? Or are they talking to them about what technical needs they have? And what policy we have in place right now has really mostly been created around the data itself and a lot less so around the technical infrastructure we use to create that. We've pretty much left that completely up to the agencies and said, you know, that's, that's kind of secondary. But the more I hear the conversation today, it seems like that's almost maybe primary for a lot of users. And I'm just wondering kind of, 
you know, there's two things. I mean, one, who's responsible for it? Are we doing this well? And, and are we measuring this and, and, and being effective there? Um, and, and then two, you know, just are we making sure we're, we're moving so we're not focused just on data or, again, not focused just on infrastructure, but really on, again, what are we trying to achieve and not just measuring usage but outcomes? And because I think that's, you know, again, it, it just comes back to that. And um, no matter which part of this problem we're focused on, we still need to make sure we actually have a very clear uh, goal setting from the agencies about at least for us, these are the problems that we have and this is how we want the data to be used. And then capturing that from the users as well so we know what they're trying to achieve and then working towards that. And just a clarification, when, when you're describing data versus technology, I guess I, I think of them oftentimes pretty bound together. So are you suggesting that a bunch of people within commerce believe that they're producing open data, but they're doing it in a way that technologically is not useful? Yeah, I'm saying that the open data policy um, was pretty agnostic about the technology used to achieve it. Besides a couple of requirements about, you know, making sure it was on data.gov and a few linkages like that, the, it was really focused on, you know, is the data quality good? Are we talking about timeliness issues? Is there a point of contact? So some of that organizational thing, those organizational parts. But it was really a lot less on are we, are we building APIs? You know, are, are they responsive to users' needs? Um, do we have... Um, you know, just uh, availability even, you know, whatever kind of infrastructure questions or other, you know, technology things that were unrelated to data standards, none of that's really addressed in the policy. Yeah, and, I, I, and I'm just kind of with Stan, I think they're, they're inextricable, right? I, I don't think that you, like, it's either or, they're, you have to consider both in the same breath. Most of the data that's on data.gov is not well indexed or linked. Uh, a lot of it's just HTML links that go out to other websites. Um, there's tr it's woefully underinvested. Yeah. Let me let me start by building off of the comment that Dan made, which is the reason bulk of the data is collected is to satisfy a mission need, which has nothing to do with the infrastructure or the broad-based dissemination through the data science pieces that we're talking about, the moving the, the data. So we have lots of data, which we know a lot about. We know what data we're collecting. We know the science of that data. We can do statistics on it to any level of extent, the classical way, and use it for the purposes we collect. The infrastructure piece is now getting added on. There's this new buzzword, cloud, and, and the CIO. The classic CIO role uh, you know, is extending to providing cloud infrastructure and so on with FedRAMP. And there's this classic, what I'm going to call the infrastructure piece of it. But the part we have really very little expertise in the department really is moving the data. Uh, and this is where data science, data engineering, all of the stuff you guys are talking about, we're talking about this whole day, is really trying to get us to. And I will say that there are very, very, if I go through the 12 bureaus we have across the department, there are very, very few people that understand this, very few. So our job really is to, uh, this group is really, I will say, the bully pulpit in a way to help us understand, get that common understanding and share those best practices and recommendations that we can then, you know, and, and it's not about setting a rule. <laughs> uh, we are a highly federated department and much like any democracy, everybody has their own uh, controls. What we have to do is have a persuasive business case to actually sell it. And, and if this is really good business practice, here's a starting point. I love the idea of a starting point. We need a starting point because we'll then have to customize it to our needs and we'll then partner with industry like NOAA has done with its partners and so on. Everybody's gonna start doing that. We need to catalyze that movement across the department. And, and I just wanted to chime in and just say, you know, I, uh, I really appreciate how much the, the, the individual compartments of commerce know about their data and are able to use it and analyze it oh, and sure. everything. Yeah, and, but, the, but the thing I guess I would contend with is that that isn't translatable to other groups. You know, like, I think that that's a compartmentalized sort of knowledge. And that's, 
to me more important than moving data. It's it's exactly. trying to translate that knowledge about what it means and how to compute on it, how, how what it means statistically. That's more important, I think, than just moving the data. It's the around. general principles we're looking for, which cuts across all of this data set. So maybe I'll do this uh, to close off, sorry, I'm going to have a number of pop-ups here, uh, to close off on just this piece because we are, it was a very interesting discussion, but we're also running a bit over. I'm going to have uh, just one more, two more comments, mm -hmm. I, I promise. Um, I will just maybe chime in and say, from my personal perspective, and a lot of what was recommended at the last session, the last meeting, was that of all these different aspects of the infrastructure, the processes, the technology, the people, the skills, um, my personal recommendation, my personal experiment uh, that I, I, I've, I wanted to propose and I've had tremendous support from just about, actually in many ways, just about everyone at this table, um, has been if we focus on the people side of that equation, the tech will follow, the processes will be reformed, uh, the, the leadership will understand the value. And so th th I'll just bridge to a, a conversation we're going to have later. A lot of these opportunities is the reason why we proposed at the last session the Commerce Data Service. Can we bring a set of engineers to integrate principles of open data, principles of cloud anything, at the operational level, side by side with the subject matter experts within NOAA, with the, the patent uh, lawyers, uh, side by side with the Trade Administration uh, Foreign Commercial Service, and have that uh, expertise literally working in the same projects in support of those bureau admission so that they can actually learn by doing. Not that we get to adjust the guide, we also need the guides. Did you do that already? Well, I'm going to give you an update on that. So <laughs> glad you asked. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, there's a, a couple of closing comments here. I, I did record a couple of actions from this discussion. I, I feels like we're going to be publishing, we, I'll define we in a second, publishing uh, some best practices and using a, uh, APIs, de defining success by scale, uh, and that the process component is as important to the technical component for that guide. Um, as an action item, just continue an initial set of experiments around MOOCs and open education and how to incorporate more of the best practices of, uh, we'll say, effective data dissemination. Uh, there's a question, an outstanding question about how do we catalyze the success. I think catalyze is the right scientific term because we're literally trying to say it exists, we want to make it faster. So what, what does that look like? And probably looking at City SDK, probably at Census, to see how that can be uh, deployed more, uh, more quickly. Um, yeah, that's it. Those are the action items that I've recorded so far from this discussion, but I, I'd, I'd like to defer to Kat, uh, Kati excuse me, for some additional comments. So we work with a number of um, industry and, and government agencies which all are interested to improve their data muscle. So mm -hmm, they have mm -hmm, been doing mm -hmm. some kind of business and now they have to catch up to IT um, services. And Oftentimes that's very, very hard. So if you just tell some of your um, employees to take an online MOOC, you know, they still have to do their deadlines typically. And though that typically does not work, if you have them come in as a cohort, like a set of 10, and they all take the course together, and there's a real commitment from the leaderships that they really have time available, not only to take the class, but to also do the homework and to do the final and so on, that makes a huge difference. So you have to have a cohort come in. And actually CDC is doing this right now, so you can talk with them and how it works. And there are some other use cases I can uh, show you there. And so that's number one. The number two that you might also like to consider is um, the courses. You might only take one course every four years, realistically, because you do have other things to take care of in your professional life. Um, but what you really, really want is that daily reminder, hey, the world has moved on. You have to change your behavior. And so what we have been doing at Indiana University, we had a, for 10 years, we had every Monday, we had a network science talk. And over those 10 years, we hired and we, we now have, a hundred network science researchers. So you might be able to get a few more in 10 years. Mm -hmm. I hope this for you. But this is the kind of um, dynamics that's in the system. So you have to invest in the long term. And you have to have something that's always there. And so one piece that you might like to consider is to have Monday talks. And it's th these could be lunch talks or these could be Five to six or six yep. to seven o'clock talks, and of course that's very family unfriendly, but the good news is you can have a milkshake right afterwards. And that milkshake actually creates the community you want. And of course you could do this also after lunch, but it's harder because you probably rush back to teach or to do your other business. Um, in order to kickstart this, um, you can invite cool people, you know, you invite some of these people which are famous on YouTube and which are really, really good in t teaching about data, or you invite Neil deGrasse Tyson or Bill yeah. Nye, the science guy, and yeah. I think you have the reputation to and get those people to engage with you, and hopefully they also get something from you, for instance, data. Some people, some people like me, we work for data. 
Yeah, I'm just on the last point. We were trying to get commander data uh, from Star Trek to come out at one point. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know whatever happened to that. Um, so uh, on that last set of points, uh, I would like to re specifically respond in the context of presentation that actually Sean is going to make in, in a few minutes, actually. So I think it's a great idea, and I'd like to provide some additional information on that. And I'll also say, um, as a related action item, the recommendation around incorporating education to not just be part of, say, does the working group, but even uh, bridging the, to Karen's comment, uh, aspects of the data service. Uh, I think actually Tyrone can, and I can speak to that a little bit later as well. Uh, so I think they're both you know, very, very good uh, recommendations that we, uh, and, and, and at least in that sense, coincidentally are aligned with and have some, some information to report. So any, any final comments on, on this string before we go to the next section? Dana. I hear a lot of action items that I feel like are randomizing if you don't actually have the culture that can embrace them and process them together. And so I think that Kadi's points are actually more important than uh, to get to the questions that you're um, at than I think you're acknowledging, which is to say that I am worried about like an API standards across, the, uh, across commerce only if everybody's bought into it. If you guys can't build standards of your own data sets about how to put a date together, um, I'm not confident of your ability to put a standard around an API, and I definitely don't think we should be telling you how to do it. And I say this because all of these things are social processes as well as technical processes. And that means that there's actually some moving and organizing of the ship internally, and Kadi's ideas are totally reasonable. I think there's other ways of doing it where it's really about getting buy-in collectively to commit to this before you have external organizations telling you how to do things. So I would say you're, you're asking us to do this. I think that in some ways we're the wrong people to be thinking about things like how to advise you on building an API. I actually think that there's got to be some intrinsic internal elements, or I think that these things will fall apart. Well, there, there is an internal element, a very strong internal element. You've heard the word commerce data service mentioned a couple times. Uh, that is going to be uh, the nexus, and you'll hear some more information as we go along. But getting understanding, you know, part of any new endeavor is to understand what is out there, and to speak from not doing your homework as to what is the best practice would be wrong. So I think it is incredibly important for us to get what industry best practice is. Because if we are going to be serving industry, there's what better than for us to know what industry best practice is and then develop our own solutions consistent with our, you know, our unique needs. And that's why I would say it's a dialogue, not like a, not just a like one-off and internal. I think this is one of those reasons why having that circulated relationships, these things can be co-constructed. That's totally reasonable, but you just have to get that internal, like everyday, you know, practitioner buy-in. There, there is a lot of movement internal to the department as well. So there's a change going on internally, and and so that th your inputs are valuable to that process. I just wanted to add, we, we, we do have a, an internal working group of the data leads of the different bureaus that get together once a month for that kind of sharing of ideas and stuff. So totally with you on that. We just, we, we need to ramp up more. And with with I, a slide pending in about 20 minutes. But I will say this much. Um, with all of, as John said before, this is the first time any large government organization uh, like Commerce has declared data as a core pillar of the way the department functions and its core mission success. It's a little weird, right? Uh, and even with extraordinary leadership from Secretary Pritzker, uh, Deputy Secretary Bruce Andrews, there is still a culture of uh, different domains and a history of, of working separately and independently that was the reality of the business function long before the tech showed up to, to, the, to the department. And so and this is the fun part about data, I think, to some of the meta questions that were brought up earlier. It's sometimes it's not just about the technology. You're pointing about the process. Well, the process is reflected the fact that the culture is probably not going to get aligned in any way, anytime soon, but just because the reality of just the human nature and the very, very diverse functions uh, and missions of the 12 bureaus of the Department of Commerce. And so there's the kind of like, well, given that they're never going to agree, on, and you said uh, dates, I'll add counties to that. I, I just by my own measure, there are many different ways that we count, define, and identify a county, as in like a city, county, state, within the department. I, I mean, assuming there's roughly 20, can we have a single county definition in the Department of Commerce? And the data working group actually talked about that and explicitly said, nope, not going to happen because we're all going to need our own unique way of doing things. And I think that, that that's a human reality more than a data reality. And so from that doesn't mean that global well, we shouldn't have, you know, should we not even just try to have standards? No, I, I think that there's, 
the, I think the city SDK is actually a great example of how to help folks o overcome the natural differences which have to exist by business expertise and subject matter expertise and weather versus census counts. Um, and so I, I think that these models of kind of not ignoring human nature but working with it <laughs> is, is part of that kind of sweet middle where some of the specific data inventions uh, initiatives within the department can, can lead to very uh, measurable success for some of these products. It's not just one visualization, it's why do visualizations matter, right? It's a, a different set of questions that can be longer lasting than any yeah. one specific leader. Dana, you're right, it's just not a predicate. That is, in an, an institution like commerce, there will always be people who will say, well, that's a very nice idea, Ian, I'll just wait it out until yeah, your yeah. term is over and then we'll just continue. Um, so, you know, there is an institutional, you know, Bureaucracy has a positive function. We have bureaucracy because it provides impersonal rule of law, right? That is, we, we have it to prevent the autocratic rule of law. Uh, and so we, we want it preserved, uh, but it often means that some people will interpret these innovative ideas as an autocratic rule of law that needs to be resisted by the conservative government. Uh, that's the reality of modern bureaucracy. So you're right, we have to get buy-in, but we also have to realize that, it, that full buy-in is never going to be achieved. And well, it's going to take a very long time. Take a very long time. Um, uh, you know, some things like uh, definitions like that, oh, I could tell you so many stories of so many companies have tried to defini define terms. I told Vadim, Vadim last night about HBO and uh, the difficulty they had in defining what a season is. You know, is it... 10 shows, 10 shows in a pilot, 10 shows a pilot in post-production. Every production company had a different definition, and those definitions have financial implications because they def define what's in cost and what's out of cost. And you know, they went a year trying to figure out what's a season. Finally, the CEO had to say, this is a season. It's very complicated um, to organize that stuff. So we can't make that a predicate for progress. We have to pursue progress at the same time. And I don't want to think about what the argument was for the counties. But also, you want to be able to push back when you hear just that, you know, just some obstinance about changing something mm -hmm. because it's the way we've always done it. And, and you know, but there, there are some things where people are just going to be doing that, just, just going back to what, you know, this is what we've always done. This is how we're always going to do it. And you need to be able to have a, a good, you know, a, g a good ability to push back with strength. Like, you know, we're not going to do it that way anymore. And don't, for don't forget when we are talking about standards, right, 20 ways to define counties. Uh, okay, maybe 20 too many, but maybe there are re legitimate reason why we have five ways mm -hmm. to do it. Mm -hmm. So maybe instead of saying everybody has to go and define counties one way, Maybe the five way, whatever the number is, mm -hmm. maybe five way is the right way to define counties, but then you need to have map from one way to another way and just making sure that you know how to go from one way to another way that if you have one data set using county type one and another data set using county type two, all you need to do is to essentially insert the map between them in the middle and you can map it. And it's not ideal, but sometimes it has to happen. So any final uh, recommendations or suggestions from, from this string? I mean, we took a couple of I say, relatively tactical ones. We're recognizing the larger context. Um, but I also just want to, with an eye on the agenda, we have basically two more presentations left. Unless, unless you're feeling like the marathon is going too long, we actually have some brilliant insights from the trade area. Some fascinating things have happened in trade recently, not just uh, from uh, the data side, but worth talking about more broadly. I uh, also have a feedback report from uh, Dan in terms of a homework assignment that was given to this council at the last session. So we're going to see our report card on how we're doing. Uh, and then there's also, I'll say, uh, uh, final parts on uh, the department's data plan, aspects of workforce, the commerce data service. Uh, I don't think public comment is today. Public comes tomorrow, right? Public yeah. Comes tomorrow. So we got like four sections left. So uh, let, let's take a quick pulse here. Do we want to take maybe a super quick break and then uh, power through the rest? I'm seeing nods of agreement. Okay. So let's take a, what time is it? Let's take a five minute break and then we'll come on back and power through the remaining portions of today. Thank you. Fruit, bagels, stuff like that. Uh, we have dinner scheduled tonight. It's
All right, good afternoon. If I could encourage the folks that are here to return to their seats and let's get through these next great presentations and we'll call today a victory here. All right. Um, thanks for the, the marathon runners that are powering through here. Uh, we have just a few more presentations, and then we'll uh, be off to good things. Uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Tyrone Grandison. Ty. Ty. Hi. Deputy Chief Data Officer. Uh, hey, let's uh, let's talk about uh, a, a project that you've been working on um, and supporting. Awesome. So, Exports Working Group. Um, I have many good news. Uh, many good news. The good news is that the working group, you know, has a plan for deliverable that kind of validates the initial hypothesis that we actually had. Um, a little bit of a background. So the working group started with Vadim and PayPal, um, process, some stuff happened. Steve and IBM came in, and things have been a little bit slow externally, and this is like one of those cases where, you know, things with external partners go slower than things within government, which is phenomenal. So we had an initial discussion within commerce with three bureaus about what they wanted to do in this particular space, and we came up with a new project called the New Exporters Project. And the mission is, is very simple. You know what, I could do interpretive dance, that'd be probably easier to, <laughs> to demonstrate it, but okay. Uh, so, <laughs> um, quick story. So imagine that you have a small business uh, you're manufacturing furniture, you're doing a good job, you know, you win awards for it, but at some point, you want to actually like grow beyond just your local demographics, right? You want to get market intelligence that tells you these are the particular countries, the particular people or businesses that I should be exporting to. Now, wouldn't it be amazing if you could actually have that intelligence shipped to that particular person either in an email or snail mail or something else, you know, from partner or from the Department of Commerce itself. So that's the mission of the New Exporters Project. Uh, the good news is three bureaus, can I name them? Yeah. Okay, ITA, EDA, and BDA, so International Trade Administration, let's get to that. <laughs> Economic Development Agency and the Minority Business Development Agency. Right. All have similar problems in terms of outreach and getting people to, to trade, export more. Uh, Jeff, that guy right there, has spearheaded this team um, that has taken a small experiment looking at Dunn and Bradstreet data to figure out, can you actually say something interesting about the people that are not exporting that data set that would actually get a benefit, a really significant benefit from exporting. And we can't publicly talk about the result yet. We're gonna vet it internally first. And I can promise you that by the spring 2016 meeting, we'll have a demo for everyone here. Right, I know. So the good news, a few months, we're gonna get something done. I wanna encourage everyone to actually do the same thing in their own working groups, to actually have like a deliverable within like a six month period. And that's it, that's what we've done so far. Well, real quick, what's some, even without getting to the results from Jeff's amazing work, what's the ambitions of the project? How do you know that we've succeeded? What's, some, what's a good end goal for this thing? It's basically when we have like X number, we haven't shown that X is, X number of people exporting and getting revenue from it. So we want to actually create businesses and create revenue for businesses, small businesses. Huh? Questions? Is that a Bradstreet data set that is public or? Nope, it's an ex, it's we, we, used, we use demo pilot data yeah. that is a sub, a free sample from a larger data set, but they, they do sell it. And the, increase their exports, but don't know they should be using it. Yes, exactly. And the, the, the mission is, the, the idea is that we're gonna probably like use, and Vidim can speak to this or not, um, hopefully apply the same thing to PayPal, to PayPal data, and actually get like the similar results. Apply the same thing to ITA and the data from the other bureaus, and actually get like another list of like who these companies should be. Sorry. Yeah, just to clarify, it's, it's to help identify companies that aren't exporting but should be exporting based on attributes that they have that line up with country that companies that currently do. Yeah, I think of it as a supply and demand. So on the supply side, we have 
companies that may or may not be exporting uh, as much as they would like. The demand side is, I'll call it loosely, overseas opportunity assessments. Uh, the ITA in particular has uh, a number of people who will say, for example, Canada wants civil aviation, Morocco is growing renewable energy, Brazil really wants a lot of automotive parts. And we say publicly, and, and unfortunately non-searchable PDF files, to the previous point about how we're publishing this information, that these are basically ways to get a lot of money. If you sell these parts, ship your stuff here. The funny thing is that, of course, a lot of small and medium-sized businesses don't have the data expertise or the fancy consultants to tell them if you are a, you know, and I'm not necessarily talking like car manufacturers, but if you were like, you know, the, the widget on the side of the door that gets assembled in the part uh, of the car, that part is actually in demand in Brazil as well, but you probably don't know that. So that's the demand side. So basically, if you say, okay, overseas opportunity for your mark, for your good, domestic uh, supply of pr products being created, can we do a join? Can we do a good old-fashioned data join to say these, whatever, top 100 companies, hey, you all would probably benefit from knowing that these overseas markets would really demand for your products. Now, whether how we communicate that information, whether it actually helps them or not, like that's part of the experiment, but that is a, we're going through basically early iterations of what that would look like, where's the data, and then we actually find some really amazing things. For example, the Trade Administration actually has a lot of this uh, opportunity data that they're increasingly digitizing and made available through an API. Oh, that's kind of fun, right? So now we're actually getting to a point where we can more readily triangulate opportunities and experiment with ways to potentially and responsibly communicate these opportunities directly to the companies. But, but where do you get the demand data? It's coming from, uh, what you're, you're measuring, you're, are you measuring aggregate demand in another country to evaluate opportunities for products and yeah. services? So, so there's so a, a, a domestic program called the Foreign Commercial Service. Uh, it's basic, think of it as like a chamber of commerce kind of thing, yeah. but to, throughout the world. And they, on their own mission, publish these reports all the time. Okay. You, you, can, you can arguably say 500 to 1,000 people, that's what they do all the time, is publish these overseas opportunities. And then how do you find the companies that could take advantage of those opportunities? Well, so, yeah. 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 Either DMB companies or companies that um, we're going to get from our data partners. So partners would be, hopefully, in the future, PayPal or FedEx, or it's going to be um, companies that we we actually get from internal data sources, either the, sorry, Census Foreign and Trade Service, is that uh -huh. it's called, yes. Or somebody else actually has that data that has the import-export data going. And is there, are there any criteria regarding the, the, the ability of the company to actually take advantage of that opportunity? So in terms of size and skill mm -hmm. and capacity, well, some of that, and we have to be very careful to protect mm -hmm. private information and be true to the information that we're collecting. Everything so far is in the public domain, open data all around. So yeah. it's super easy just to say, hey, what about this, right? Once it gets to the point of, I'm just a hypothetical example, calling somebody and saying, do you have demand on your line to ship more stuff to so-and-so? That gets a little weird mm -hmm. uh, to me. Um, so there's, there's a responsible way to do that. But just in the open data space, I think there's ways to basically help companies grow to help folks understand those. An example would be uh, NIST, the uh, National Institute for Science and Technology has this thing called the Manufacturing Extension Partnership, MEP. Basically, it's a network of about, we'll say loosely, 30,000 companies of which 3,000 in any given year are actively working with NIST to figure out how they can grow their exports. And they actually have a relationship under agreements where they can say, hey, government, do you have data on so-and-so? Please give it to me, we'd love to use it. That is an example of a good communication mechanism that if we happen to have a list of opportunities, a list of companies that would want to export, uh, and oh, by the way, the list of the MEP, just draw the straight line, any company that happens to line all the way through, hey, let's just have this call them that we're already speaking to them anyway, maybe there's a way that we can help them understand more of the data about overseas growth. I really like this approach. I, I think I mentioned this idea in the first meeting we had. I probably didn't uh, tell you where it came from, that the Danish government has been looking into uh, doing something similar from a different point of view. Uh, they're looking at reducing the regulatory burden of financial reporting to small businesses by eliminating financial reporting entirely. And instead of doing financial reporting on a quarterly basis of results, they're going to capture transactional data directly from the businesses. They're working with software providers to catch, to, to uh, build backends into platforms and then capture the transactional data. And they think about mining that data to identify um, opportunities for those companies to expand either domestically or internationally based upon their current sales. You guys, we, that would be impossible to do here. Nobody would, you know, we'd get into the whole, you know, Bernie Sanders, whatever discussion about Denmark, forget it. Um, 
So what I love about your solution is you're trying to do the same thing, but from much more achievable pers perspective of gathering data from export markets and demand. I think it's brilliant. It's really great. And well, we hope so. I mean, to, oh, please, go ahead. To continue on your point, so what Denmark is working, they're working with software providers to capture data from them. But for in the same place, for them to provide data back to the companies would be the same software providers who create the analytical report to the companies, right? So if Denmark would capture the data, analyze it, push it back to the same software providers, or different. No, they were actually thinking about... Um, Hold on one second. <laughs> I'm, I'm just hypothetically. And it would show up back at the merchant reporting. That's the, way, the, the best way for the companies to know. Since in the United States, as well as in Denmark, more and more companies are moving toward analytical services which are hosted by different companies, hmm. and there are a number of different companies which host a variety of analytical services, uh, you know, your revenue, your import, your export, whatever. So as soon as the Department of Commerce will show that the data is available and will show that data is can be used, my, there is a belief that a lot of those analytical companies which display reports, whether it's financial reports, whatever, they will say, hold on, I can show my customers something else. I can show companies something else. I can show a company how to grow. And because analytical companies depends on the revenue growth of their customers, which are mer whatever, merchants or companies, they would love to, pro to say, here is the way for you to grow. You will grow, I will, my percentage will be better. So as soon as first hurdle, first you know, couple iterations are done and it shows that there is a benefit and can be done, I truly believe that next step there will be very wide adoption, not from the companies, but from the analytical providers, mm. uh, report providers, you know, summary providers. Cognitive saying, oh, it, providers. It just, you know, it's free for us, but you know, we can go out and say, we help our customers to grow. Agreed. The, the context here again, this is, a, this is right now the only chartered working group of this council. And, and Tyrone's report is basically, here's what we're working on under that working group. Um, so in, in that framework, uh, there's, a, there's a few next steps here. One, uh, does this council still support the, the charter and the working group's progress? Are we heading in the right direction? Uh, if you would like to contribute to this active experimentation, this is a charter group, you're welcome to do so. Not just, by the way, with your folks, but because it's a working group, there's some basically legal mechanisms for you to bring in other, other partners, other companies, other people, to, that they can contribute to this working group as well. So that, that's an open invitation. Um, yeah, let's cut myself off there. So let's start with the first one. I mean, from uh, the, the direction of the council, does this feel like we're heading, heading uh, in, on a good path? Oh yeah. Hell yeah, okay. Hell yeah. Uh, any ideas about other ways that, that we should uh, contribute or bring other folks in to work on this stuff? What other kinds of folks would you like to have included? What, what, you know, so if we wanted to invite our friends, what types of friends would you like? Uh, Jeff, what kind of data do you want? Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hmm. That's interesting. You know. I'll, ha I'll come up with a wish list. Yeah. Can we think of order to get back to you? Okay. Yeah, we'll take that action. Would there be any role for foreign companies to take advantage? Is there any um, uh, how, how do we coordinate this activity with foreign nations and foreign companies? that our companies might be exporting into or partnering with abroad? Well, functionally, what, one of the reasons I like MEP as a type of collaborator on this is that a lot of them do have those relationships already established, so we can kind of tap into a group that already is coordinating. Mm -hmm. um, but I think to some extent, uh, borrowing a line from Brian, we're so new at this thing, we're just trying to get like even the, the local thing, the example to work. Uh, before we kind of think too ambitiously globally. But I, I think it's going to naturally come out of that first set of joins. I think we're going to see them when we actually uh, get to the point of actually conducting some outreach. Would our, would, would, what, kind of, what kinds of companies would we be piloting this idea with domestically for international export? Who, who are the guinea pigs in the beginning? Uh, given the sources of clean and open data, it feels like small, small and medium-sized manufacturers. That, that's convenient, but not the only way we're going. So far, that feels like that's the direction we're going. Oh. Is, um, I was a little bit unclear when you described the process. Is your understanding of the demand side coming, you said the foreign commercial service, and that sounded like qualitative data, where, like you got a bunch of people hanging out who just know that we're shipping a bunch of aerospace to China, and they write that up. 
is that how the demand side? Because I'm wondering if there's an opportunity to, to, to infer the demand side from actual data. So is there a data mining task to understand the demand side where we know from the current accounts which countries are consuming which SIC code products and then look for other companies with the same SIC codes that aren't exporting and then tell them, hey, you know, that's how you infer the demand side. I'm going to ask Jeff to answer yeah. that question. So everyone, Jeff Chen, currently on loan from the General Services Administration. Hood. Yeah. Cool. Um, so I think uh, the first thing is to remember um, the delivery format. Thank you. Um, I think the first th th first thing to remember is uh, what is the delivery format? Um, how is that information going to be used? Um, so whereas, uh, if we were to build a recommendation on Gen Online, um, that would there would be like a digital format. In this case, there's very much a. Uh, uh, personal touch associated with it. Uh, we're providing um, a prioritized list uh, based on uh, data mining methods to figure out which companies are most likely to export. And that could be due to a wide range of aspects, um, such as um, like income, um, like revenue generation, employment, um, whether or not a company previously exp uh, imports. Um, and so those factors all weigh in together. Anyone who is familiar with any sort of classification methods are uh, will understand that that produced some sort of probability. Um, so, in terms of inferring, um, there there is some degree of uh, that market intelligence is associated with the, the market research API. Um, but that's just the first cut. There's far more information within the department that we can probably leverage. Um, but we're really just focused on this initial MVP of seeing what would that pilot look like in terms of the outreach? How, do, how does that list translate into the standard operating protocols within the, the agency? And, and directly to your question, it is more qualitative at this stage. Um, there's a tremendous opportunity for quantitative, but then it gets into the what, what's the best data we can get most quickly to start to show some results. Um, the foreign trade uh, aspects, uh, the Census Bureau has some good stuff in aggregate form, but not necessarily at the company level. Um, and to be very clear, then this, this was actually some of the most interesting coverage. I, mean, I don't know if everyone even knows this, but this council was picked up by the Wall Street Journal just on this working group, which I thought was kind of funny. Um, and in that announcement, uh, we, we some very carefully crafted language to say, if there are individual companies that have their own data on how other companies are performing and want to leverage this type of service so that they can do the outreach, I think to Vadim's point a little bit about how these kind of market uh, 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 interlopers, that it's not necessarily the government that has to do the outreach. It could be... Any of the companies that we know that could also do that outreach, and they may have more of that quantitative information, Stan, that I think you're referring to. I'm just thinking, of, I'm just thinking about how would I react if uh, the Department of Commerce sent me an email saying, yeah, right, exactly. you know, that, yeah. that would this just go right, spooky, into the spam, right? In, right into the spam box. So, so how do you reach out to these yeah. companies in a way that's authoritative and trustworthy, that they understand, that, that first, how do you explain to people who have never heard about this program what the program is, that they may be contacted, by the program, do they opt into the program? Well, the um, program, I think, that? even then is, is a great question. I, I obsess over that question with this project. And I think it has to do more with the business proc uh, process than a data process. Uh, for example, if there are existing relationships where small businesses are leveraging, and, and this, is, this is all in the public domain, some previous experiments have been deployed with folks like, um, uh, we'll say FedEx, because they have a whole system around basically helping small companies export for the first time ever. If they already have a relationship with FedEx, then the message isn't coming from Uncle Sam, it's coming from FedEx, if we choose to engage in a relationship with them, because they've effectively already opted into that program. Now, that I don't mean to say that any favoritism to FedEx versus UPS or whatever. That's just an example of the messenger is super important. And I think that if we leverage that network, you can achieve the same success without it having to come as a phone call from Tyrone. Uh, which would be, you yeah, know, different, right? That's one way. I'm sorry? With the government, yeah, with the government here to help you, right? <laughs> Never a good idea. Uh, let, me, let me just throw in real quick. So we're working with International Trade Administration on this. Like, that kind of communications is what they do. So we're not really going to speak so much to how they communicate to the business community. We just want to tee up this tool that they can use to target companies that should be exporting that aren't. So we're, we're kind of staying out of the, at least at this stage, this is very preliminary at this point. I realize we're 
being mod we're being videotaped here, and this is all public, but I w wanted to ask permission. Is this uh, something that we're allowed to talk about? Um, may I talk about this program and presentations well, it's all open. around yeah. the world? Yeah. yeah, I mean, this is, so the, okay. and again, we made the announcement um, at, after the last meeting that this was the goal of the working group. This, this is already public. We've been, basically, published it months ago. Um, how we communicate it, extremely important. Uh, and we will not do it ourselves. We have to work with others that are, have respective expertise, such as the International Trade Administration, NIST as well, uh, just to close off another hypothetical. These are kind of in-process, working-level questions that we're asking, is who should deliver the message, right? That, that's, I think, really the point. Um, if oh, I could, yeah, if I could just say something. Yeah. Um, I think that the, that the key point is that this is work that's chartered by the, by the committee that we're asking you to participate in and contribute to, yep. and that as you reach out and as you have discussions and come up with ideas or proposals, you're reporting them back to the committee mm -hmm. um, or to Ian and the co-chairs um, in a way that's gonna be publicly documented so that we eventually are in the public forum throughout the development and, and evolution of the, of the group and of the work. Do we... Um I'm just, I'm sorry for asking so many questions. No, it's okay. Uh, do we also consider the exports of other countries from other companies from other countries in the competitive <coughs> So are we providing, uh, too good. you know, competitive ah. intelligence to companies saying, you know, companies like yours are exporting to Brazil for this type of thing, but, you know, there already are uh, seven other competitors who are already, you know, from these from Belgium and, and Germany and, and Paraguay, what do I know? Yeah. You know. How do we, um, because one could imagine that if we advise companies that there is this open market and they attempt to sell their products in that market mm -hmm. and it doesn't succeed, I mean, there are a lot of factors that yeah, can lead yeah. to... Well, let me, uh, let me respond in this way. The, I, I'm not sure we have the right folks at the table to authoritatively answer that question with a, the departmental perspective, um, but it is an aspect of this trade thing which is going to be... Uh, explored as we go through this this experiment. I mean, we ha it's going to have to come up. Um, I just don't think we've gotten there yet. You know, do we consider, so let me be more specific, the core experiment, the use case, is a small to medium sized American manufacturer probably that is not exporting as much as the market potential uh, would suggest they can benefit from. It's a long, long statement, but a simple statement. We, you're not exporting enough, maybe not at all. How do we get you to start? That That is the use case, that is the obviously the user persona that we are targeting around this experiment. Now, that may not be the right user persona, and we may have to evolve to it, and I guess I hope the user persona grows, but that is the core user it, uh, so far for this working group. Uh, Ty and Jeff, is that an accurate statement? Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, just looking at the, the available data just from a limited sample, a random sample that we uh, collected, um, we estimate something like 15% of the markets uh, uncaptured. So there's, there's, there is certainly room to grow. Mm -hmm. And let me also just say this, maybe as a transition also, uh, not, not to cut off the conversation, but I do want to provide some uh, ample time for the other presentations. Uh, there is kind of, um, there is some interesting uh, market dynamics in the world of trade, which in many ways has nothing to do with this council, but is so big, I just can't resist the opportunity to at least just tell you a little bit about what's been going on. You all have very busy lives, you may not have seen it. Um, but there's basically a report. So this, I'm going to kind of close the chapter a little bit on the new exporters project and just shift to a, a, just a brief advertisement for some cool things that have been going on, and then we'll shift to the next portion of the agenda, if that's okay. Uh, so I'm not sure if all of you have seen the details of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, TPP. Um, so the, the news around this uh, landmark trade deal. Um, not completely finalized yet, but there's some really fascinating stuff about data in that trade deal. Uh, and I'll just report now just a few extracts from it uh, not as an authority on the topic at all, not, a, not in the slightest, but I can say that there's some pretty cool stuff in there that I'd maybe like to elevate and see, make sure that you're aware of it, so if and when the, the, you follow up and hear about the TPP, that you can just say, hey, wait a second, I'm actually curious about how this part will impact the department and uh, your businesses in the world of data. So uh, first of all, it's, uh, the first, it's the first time in any trade agreement that uh, the trade secrets in cyberspace have been explicitly covered and requiring copyright protections on digital products, uh, basically extending the intellectual property laws that have been uh, established. So IP on digital products, explicitly discussed in the TPP, first time ever, first time ever in a trade agreement. So that's kind of cool. Uh, more uh, fun physically, in terms of data storage, the TPP also includes provisions for the modern digital economy and rules against forced localization of servers. The whole localization deal, 
Uh, if any of you have tried to sell a, a data product overseas and had to deal with the localization, local storage of that data server in that country, the TPP explicitly uh, removes that barrier. Good or bad, it's, it's covered. It's in the trade agreement. So in the world of data, it's just something that I'd encourage you to, to look into. And happy to provide uh, some experts on the topic if you're curious about how this affects uh, the market. So with that, unless there's any questions on that, I think I'm going to push it. Driving ahead, final two, thank you, Jeff, uh, final two presentations and, and, and opportunities for feedback. Uh, we have a little report out from Dan on a homework assignment that this council had at the last meeting. So Dan. Great, thanks. Um, so at the last meeting, one of the action items that we came up with as a group was the need for um, you know, proving the value of open data and, and collecting open data stories from um, companies that are represented by people in this room. Um, so we first tried to do that by sending an email and saying, hey, we send in a fully fledged uh, blog or article report explaining the value of data to your company. And of course, we got all of zero responses. Um, so then uh, Ian suggested that I volunteer to um, write the stories myself. Um, so I reached out to um, some of you, about a third of you in the room, um, saying that I wanted to do this, and a lot of you responded, and I thank you for that. Um, and what we have to report today is, so what we've done is, we've done one write-up um, of Zillow, um, and what I wanted to do was show you this post. It went up um, earlier this week, and accompanying it was also a video um, interview that uh, the Census Bureau put together. And so basically, um, I wanted you to see exactly what we're trying to accomplish here um, so that when I follow up with all of you, um, you'll know kind of what the in-state goal is, um, what we're trying to do with these stories. And also, you can see now we have this capability of doing these, these videos, um, which we'll play this one in one second, um, that I think is really valuable for a lot of companies to show what they've accomplished. And so why don't we watch this video, and then we'll just talk a little bit more. Voracious consumers of American Community Survey, the decennial census, open data is part of Zillow's DNA. We started Zillow 10 years ago with the mission of empowering consumers with information and data around what is the most expensive and often most emotional purchase of their entire lifetime. So much is tied into that decision and we want to make sure that consumers armed with data are starting on their best foot. And we started out with every single address in the United States back in 2005 and a mission to attach to that address every single bit of information about it. Step one is finding the absolute best sources of data from trusted resources that we can partner with. The basic email draft. And then take that data and build it into products that consumers can use. Government data products and particularly the American Community Survey are really integral to our economic operations here. I think that works really well. Our job is to go out and pull in all that information. Information on just about every home in America that comes from a number of sources, including the Census Bureau. What's really important about census data products is they're telling us about the people who live in the homes, not just about the homes themselves. Economic data, are you unemployed, are you married, are you single, incomes, who you're living in the dwelling with, how many are millennials, where are those millennials moving, why are they moving there. Really important for the housing market, and they're, they're not knowable from the data that Zillow collects on its own, and that's where uh, census data is incredibly important. We then turn around and create analytic products on top of it, like home valuations or housing indices or things that aren't in that raw data, but are things that we create, and we then turn around and provide that for free. A real estate agent you just reached out to. How much of a mortgage can I afford? How much do I need to save for a down payment? Whether now is a good time to buy or sell. What's the home's estimated value, and what do we expect to happen with that value? Whether it might be better for you to rent than to buy. Where do I want my kids to go to school? How long will the commute be from work? Yeah, so in the downtown core. Quite honestly, a decade ago, before the housing bust, Americans didn't have access to data to help them make some of these decisions and answer some of these questions. Now with Zillow, they do. We find our research getting used in debates about how we should be doing a better job around housing affordability. 
debates that you wouldn't have had before because you weren't able to precisely understand how bad is it compared to historical standards. And that was only possible by using income data from ACS. You're able to edit that I get real delight out of the fact that I get to deploy data and analytics in an area as important to people as, as housing is. The American Community Survey has been an enormous part of our ability to provide all of this information to consumers. We're very grateful for this data. It's been so important to us being able to do what we do and to continue doing what we're do doing for decades in the future. So if you, <laughs> if you want to be a YouTube star, this is, this is your chance. Um, but, but seriously, um, you know, I, I think you can see, I think these are, you know, it's, it's a very, you know, I, I think it was a quick process to make the video. It wasn't a big time commitment on, uh, you know, on Stan's part. And, you know, we can help really get this message out. This, uh, the blog goes up um, on the uh, ESA website. There is a uh, newsletter that it goes out to of about 50,000 people uh, total between um, Department of Commerce, and we'll, we're cross-posting on uh, the Center for Data Innovation. So it'll get a lot of exposure for people that are interested in data. Uh, I think it's a positive story. And, and what the goal is, is that we're going to try and do one of these per month until we get through everyone in the committee that, that signs up for this. Um, and then maybe we'll package it together as a, a single report or something. So we'll have all of these open data stories. And hopefully this will be one good tangible outcome that we can have from this. Whenever anyone's asking what's the value of open data, we can point to some real valuable stories here. Yeah, and this is part of a, a broader communication story around, or strategy around, not just the work of this committee and not just the work of the data team, but both of those importantly, but about the importance of data and the government's role in producing data. And I think that you mentioned 50,000. That's where we're starting from. Jason, our press press uh, director, is 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 driving this with his newsletter. Um, there are other blogs, other other elements to it that we're factoring into it. We're hoping that all of you can tap your networks and extend extend that further beyond the 50,000. And we're building that 50,000 too to higher numbers. So it's it's really about not just the work of the committee, but the whole reason we have the council and that we have Ian and his team in the Commerce Data Services. So I just want to make that pitch. Can I just ask that you also do this of some of the government groups? Like, I'd actually love to see the videos of like what cool things are happening inside commerce, not just externally. So I think it goes both ways. Oh, yeah, well, definitely. Yeah. And, and that's, that's, that's when I said there are other videos and other blogs, that's what they're all about. So, I mean, you know, we have an idea, for example, of, of looking at, at what NOAA has done to increase the warning time around tornadoes from three minutes to 27 minutes. That's a data story. It's a wonderful data story. <coughs> and, and it's the kind of thing that makes, makes you kind of perk up and say, wow, now I get where some of my tax dollars are really being spent well. I mean, it's saving lives, you know. So we'll be, we'll be seeing a lot more of this. I just want them to be as pretty and slick. Good job. Mike, will they be as pretty will they be as pretty and slick? <laughs> and they're and they're easy, right? Couple hours oh, max. Yeah, yeah, good team. <laughs> no, it's job. Mike Morgan and his team that do this and, and that's central. <laughs> easy for us. Like really I mean Michael showed up for like an hour in her office and then like we were kind of like, I wonder what he's going to do with that. And then, like, I don't know, like a few weeks later, we got this. Our CEO saw it. I think it got posted somewhere. On did it go on YouTube? Or well, we it? coordinated uh, with your social media team and our social media team. We didn't want right. to just throw it out there, like you said. So yeah, but suddenly it was out there. We're like, holy cow! Like, was that that was that that thing we did for like an hour back then? So it was really really easy. So I was really impressed. Hmm. So uh, we'll just take a minute if anyone wants to tell me there interested and I'll put your name down on the list. Otherwise I'll be following up again with you. But the only question is like, is it just open data stories or is there more is there other stories to be told? Because um, if it's just open data stories, I think that there's different components of it. Like this is where it's what the boundaries are. Well so there's definitely lots of opportunities to tell stories. What we're doing right here is economic value of data, how it's helping companies you know, that, that's what this particular project is. Okay, yeah. And same here with Arjuna. You guys could visit the, the, our DC office. Great, thanks. Thank you. Bill? Okay. Cool. Oh, Bill? Yeah? Is that 
Is there one more? Oh, great. Fun. Excellent. Kevin? And we can we can definitely do that. It doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be your product and it can be a combination too. Yeah. So each one can be individual. Yeah. So uh, unless we want to take any final break, I think we can just power through. But I'd like to reintroduce Sean and uh, ask for the Great support from the great team in the back to tee up the next presentation. Take okay, away. thank you. There you go. Very good. So let me, let me kind of give you a sense of why I'm here. Uh, I think there was some introduction in the beginning. Mark Dome stepped down and you know we have these uh, goals in the department and each goal has an executive sponsor. And one of the uh, executive sponsors, um, um, for, for the data goal was um, Mark Domes. And Mark left about a month, month ago, yeah, something right. like that. So uh, department leadership, uh, Penny and, and Bruce decided that uh, maybe I should step in because of the places I've been dabbling with, uh, with Ian, with a few other things. And, and so uh, it's, it's something I've been doing for about a month. But in that month, a few things to do uh, and before I get to what we wanted to do, I want to say that version 1.1 of the Department of Strategic Plan was released, uh, I'm going to say in June, but the formal release was in September. You have a, a copy of it. But the interesting thing I'd like you to do is look at uh, page 6, which really is a summary of what we are doing. This is a living document. And you have five goals, uh, four mission goals. And as you previ previously heard from Penny and from, uh, uh, from Mark and from Ian, you know, data is one of the four mission goals of the department. That's exciting. That's never been done before. So, and, and the Commerce Data Advisory Council is really helping us uh, figure out how we should go about uh, uh, in this space. And, and uh, there are lots of challenges internal uh, for sure, but we also need to understand best practices. So uh, that is really uh, what we're after. Uh, we have uh, changes that go on in this document, but what I do want to say is uh, our focus on data now has, our objective is to make positive impacts of commerce data on society. That's the, the number one thing, and I'm going to flip a couple of slides here. And we have three broad objectives. Um, and by the way, our taxonomy is goal, objectives, strategies, initiatives, and metrics. And this is a huge department. There's a lot of stuff that goes on. Um, and the objectives really are threefold. Fueling economic growth by unleashing our data. We have a lot of it whether it's census or weather or climate or patent or trade, uh, we have a lot of data, or scientific and technical data. And we want to make it easier for businesses and, and communities and citizens to access, analyze, and use the data. But there's a second element to this, which is creating their data-driven government. How do we combine and use data to increase the efficiency, effectiveness, and security of our programs? internally. <coughs> and by the way, this is some efficiency. And finally, we want to figure out how do we deliver data services by leveraging advances in data science, software development, and standards to accelerate product innovations. And, and this is internal to the department. Uh, so Ian leads our efforts um, uh, in all of this, but particularly figuring out how best we deliver data services and use data services across the department is really the catalyst that Ian, Ian and his team, the Commerce Data Service, really is going to bring to us as a department. So those are our three broad buckets of things. And if you think about those, <laughs> I call them buckets, but it's objectives. I was laughing how small the text is. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, right. You have, you, well, you should probably get hard copies, and you can go online and get it. 
Um, but within, we did a preliminary survey of what fits within this broad framework uh, in terms of fueling economic growth. And there are at least five very significant things the department's doing in this area. And, and then, uh, and of course, Ian is going to talk about the content of these five different things. Uh, create, and this, and in each of these areas, you'll find specific things we're trying to do. So our overall taxonomy is, for each of those big strategies, we also have initiatives, specific measurable initiatives. So if you look at this, this is the department's data strategy, strategic goal. There are things that the department is doing, the bureaus are doing, which is not necessarily everything that the Commerce Data Service is doing. Those are, the bureaus are on the hook to do those things and they're gonna do them no matter what. They are being held, they are, they have signed up for it. Uh, we're gonna kind of socialize this particular taxonomy the way we've got it here with the bureaus in the very near future. Um, but this is something that they're gonna be doing. And you will hear from Ian uh, how the Commerce Data Service is plugging in and adding value to several of these things, right? At the bottom is the, is the delivering data services piece. Um, and there you will find, uh, in addition to Commerce Data Service and other things that Ian's gonna talk about, something called National Technical Information Service. That is one of the 12 bureaus in the Department of Commerce and it was established in the mid 50s with at the time when paper was the was the currency of of the day reports were the currency and many of you when you went to grad school probably had reports that came out of federal funding and you had to send it to NTIS in Springfield Virginia well that's where uh, that is that same agency and and that agency is now being transformed to actually uh, help us provide data services to the department. So in, in a sense, partner with Ian's Commerce Data Service in a way that we can use some of their unique capabilities. What are those unique capabilities? Uh, one is they have a history of partnering with the private sector. Um, and um, second is um, they have a unique authority called the Joint Venture Authority. Uh, I, heard, I saw a slide sometime in the morning which talked about acquisition and a linear process uh, for acquisition. We all know that probably uh, the way modern software development is done through agile, DevOps, and other kinds of processes, uh, you need a much more um, different process for collaboration at all, at all times during this uh, iterative process. And the Joint Venture Authority allows you to actually do that. And this agency has that Joint Venture Authority. So we are transforming that agency to align very smartly with the Commerce Data Service. And one more thing I'll say before I turn it over to Ian uh, is that collaboration and coordination is really a key element uh, across the department. At the highest level, the Deputy Secretary can mean something called the data leadership team. The data leadership team is the heads of the key data bureaus in the department. And they meet uh, roughly once every couple months. The next meeting is gonna be next week, Thursday. Um, and that is at the highest level where we kind of come together and say, Here's, here are some issues, what are the deliverables for the next 12 months, uh, you know, here are some issues we're grappling with. How do we coordinate better across the department? Uh, and folks on that team include the Undersecretary for NOAA, the Undersecretary for NIST, the, uh, the uh, Mark Domes, who was the Undersecretary for ESA. Now probably John Thompson will show up, I'm not sure. But, so there'll be a bunch of people uh, who will come to this meeting. Another level down, we have the data working group. And this is the group that Ian is, has convened and, uh, for the last year or so. Uh, well, he, is, yeah, he yeah, hasn't yeah. been at that long, but it's been convened for about a year or so. Um, and, um, 
And, and that team is really working level folks, program manager type folks across the 12 bureaus. I've been to some of those meetings, there are 30 people in the room, 20 people in the room. They're all excited to be in that room and to be led by Ian. So you talk about internal coordination, fantastic. And they've had some interesting conversation about geospatial and all kinds of stuff, data.gov um, data and so on, and, and great group. There's a third group there that Ian and his team are trying to initiate. It's called the Data Science Affinity Group. These are the geeks in the department. And um, probably yeah. Tyrone and Jeff are, are the folks who are going to be uh, really leading this effort. Um, and, and so that's another level of coordination. So there's, there's a whole bunch of coordination going on, collaboration going on, stimulation across the department. And uh, just want to leave you with that thought. Uh, with regard to getting standards, um, I'm going to say that this group really focuses on common areas of concern issues, and um, uh, to the extent that standards have a role in tr across the department, uh, I I'm going to say more about best practices. I think they are much more keen to adopt best practices when they pick it up. So if, if one one, uh, uh, you know, there are probably three or four different uh, open source products people were using for geospatial. When they had these briefings, they all felt, oh my gosh, we're all used doing the same thing with slightly different approaches. Might as well talk to each other. So it actually stimulates change far better than some edict coming from Ian and saying, okay, you shall do it this way. Because that usually means nobody will do it. And the minute yep. Ian disappears, yep. it disappears, right? So we are. I think we're doing all we're doing what we can to institutionalize uh, these changes. So in fact, they are permanent because this is really important. And uh, so the next 12 months internally, we're going to be focusing on internal institutionalizing this stuff. Anyway, I'll, I'll turn okay. it over to you for Great. the rest. Can I take the clicker there? Yep, there Thank you go. Thank you. There we go. Okay. Um, so uh, again, this is the entire department's data objectives and associated initiatives on one slide. However preliminary it may be, if there's one story of, hey, what's, what's the Department of Commerce working on? Here it is, right? Um, so I just want to make sure that that, that is registered, that it, it took a lot of the guidance, frankly, from your uh, previous recommendations for us to even arrive at this point and be able to uh, solicit active feedback, uh, not final necessarily, but active feedback from every single bureau to contribute their perspective as to what, what they're working on, how can we even achieve this perspective. As far as I can tell, not only is data the first time, this is the first time that data's been a key pillar for the, any Secretary of Commerce, this is the first time there's ever been a data call on the data. What's every, what's every bureau publishing? And, and do you plan to publish it this year? They never, they've never been asked like this. It's never, the question never came up. And they appreciate it, like, oh yeah, we've been doing this for a long time, thank you for showing an interest. Uh, so that's kind of fun. That's kind of fun that just our sheer asking of the question is providing coordination and collaboration in a way that didn't previously exist at the department. So uh, with that as context, I wanted to bring it home to what is this council uh, working on. So I, I uh, slaved and on, f jogging on the treadmill, looking at our past recommendations, uh, knowing my wife with uh, questions about what do you think about this? Does this make sense? I just I surveyed anyone I could find to say, hey, how is this stuff all coming together? And I wrestled with it, and I basically would like to propose that of all the recommendations that were made in the previous uh, two sessions, the, the roughly 24-odd recommendations that we published officially and are tracking uh, in our, uh, our, our Federal Advisory Committee status, I can boil it down to these four. I can digest it, I can bucket it, I can categorize these are the four things that you all have said we should be doing better. Improve the way data is being generated and acquired, so the, the in, in, ingest side. Improve commerce's dissemination of data, so how you get it out. Uh, and these, these last two are more of the operational. Institutionalize a corpus of data skills within the department. Uh, that, a lot of that does relate to last uh, session's discussion on the Commerce Data Service and other services like it. Uh, and then this is, this is a bit of a, of a catch-all. Act more like a, a business when managing data. And so that re, uh, captures previous recommendations of things like measure the return on investment, understand the, the metrics for release, institution pro, uh, institutionalize a product roadmap. Those are business practices. That you, you can't say product roadmap in many parts of government and have a recognition of exactly what that means in the context of what uh, was being said uh, earlier. One of the questions actually that Tom Carl brought up in his presentation was the reticence around how NOAA wants to say they're going to release certain data, but isn't quite sure of how to do that in a way that doesn't expose themselves to excessive risk. All of you that have worked on product roadmaps 
know that that's a question you all struggle with in your companies. So was, you know, we may, we may come around to that question again, uh, provided, obviously, uh, Tom's at the table, but that, that's an example of, in my mind, a business operational decision, which is really new and different for most government agencies, especially around products or data products. And so given that these are the, the previous recommendations, it is interesting now to even to see my own notes on the recommendations today. They seem to, in, um, I'll go back through them more closely, but they seem to pretty well align with these, these core areas. Um, and so what I'd like to do now is within that framework of like, okay, this is what we said we were gonna do before, let me give a brief report out as to how we're tracking against those recommendations. So what I have here on a unfortunately hard to read uh, uh, small text is a split of, I'll say recent accomplishments from the departmental perspective, stuff that the, the 45,000 uh, employees have been working on that directly relate to your recommendations, oftentimes as a direct response to your recommendations. And then the immediate team that has been basically your data team, your, the folks that you've been engaging with uh, through this council, what have we been working on as more, I'll say, tactical product level responses? Uh, and, and before I go into it, by the way, if you were to jump back to this slide, you can just imagine kind of a mosaic. You know, not, not every item here is something that your core team is working on. You know, picking at 40, 20 percent, whatever the number is, it's kind of like a patchwork. Some of these things are with direct involvement from your data team, and some they're just good practices. They figured it out on their own. We're just trying to guide them in the right direction and amplify their successes. So, examples of major games at the departmental level: uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. We talked about that. Uh, that's a big deal. I mean, even if you've never you know, looked at trade very closely, it's worth just a quick search. It's really amazing how. Uh, transformative that agreement is, especially as it relates to the digital economy. There's some really specific call-outs in there that are kind of a big deal for our nation and you know, some of the points that Steve's brought up, the international economy, it's, it's a big deal and it's got really amazing stuff in there. Uh, we are continuing to engage public innovators through data competitions. My last count, I think we had five, actually six active data challenges right now live with uh, a, a number of different organizations. Uh, NOAA has one basically looking to uh, better leverage their own data to fight uh, folks that are basically going after endangered, uh, endangered whales, basically whale protection uh, uh, data analysis. We have some for reference data, helping NIST better unleash some of their, uh, uh, we'll say, scientific tools. Um, there was a competition even around city SDK that uh, just uh, went through a recent phase since the last time we met, and, and these continue. So from a public perspective, some degree of citizen science, uh, public competitions, we're doing it pretty actively very actively, in fact, more so than I can even find with most other uh, federal government organizations. Uh, from a uh, storytelling perspective, that was one of the recommendations made at a previous uh, CDAC meeting, uh, really a uh, fun geospatial community impact map. Basically, the White House, uh, as part of a larger coordinated effort between different organizations, wanted to provide a set of visualizations for the hyper-local communities. What's it, what, how does the federal government help in my community, my town, could I plug in my address? and figure out if any of this of your quote unquote government services are really affecting my community and they were able to measure it. Lo and behold, there's a lot of ways in which federal government is touching every community and Department of Commerce is by far the most active involved uh, set of data in that map. It was basically, it was almost like an advertisement for the Department of Commerce's geospatial data. Um, from the Economic Development Administration, EDA and the Minority uh, Business Development Administration, uh, we announced uh, collaboratively about $20 million of smart city grants, uh, and uh, I won't take you through all the details of those, but if you look closely at them, a lot of it is about technical infrastructure, broadband access, uh, using information to improve transportation systems, kind of smart city stuff. And that was itself part of a larger smart cities initiative, so again, commerce taking a lead there. And then, then there's just good old fashioned products, just tools you can use uh, that came out, uh, two that stand out since the last time we met. Uh, we have a world population uh, clock, basically. It's uh, one of the most popular data products from census is the pop clock, population counter. We have a world version of that now released. It's uh, had tremendous adoption in, in many different uh, educational, social, and business purposes. Uh, something called a business builder. It's basically like if you're a startup, where is some information that can help you figure out where to locate, when it, what uh, the demographics are like, basically making census data more accessible. And the patent office released something called Patents View. Now, this is cool. So. The last time we met, there was a presentation from a guy named uh, Tom Beach about the PTO pro or, uh, Open Data Mobilization Roadmap. It was basically their perspective of how the Patent and Trademark Office is seeking to improve their products. And uh, at the time I said it, I still believe it's one of the best data plans I can find anywhere. 
in terms of how a large government organization should get more information out there. This is on their roadmap. So uh, Colin Parrish, who unfortunately could not make uh, this session, provided a lot of feedback to PTO uh, in terms of uh, how to leverage that strategic document. Um, so we are very grateful for the feedback that was provided. Lo and behold, they're continuing to march on with that plan and basically letting folks understand more of where the patent application is almost like a, like a workflow. Like where, where, where's my patents? What's the backlog? What's the performance, so to speak, of uh, those that are submitting applications? That was launched and I think is a really, really transparent uh, demonstration of accountability. Just performance metrics, how much we're working through the patent backlog. They're publishing it now on something called Patent Sphere. So those are, I'll say, my top five favorite examples of departmental wins and successes that directly relate to your recommendations about improve the generation of uh, collection of data, improve the way it's been sent out there, uh, and act more like a, a business when managing it. Let's talk now about the corpus of data skills. So uh, these are some initial uh, report outs, initial I'll call them, uh, well, accomplishments from your nascent startup that you all are basically I'm like a like a board of directors oversight board uh, for this little thing we're calling the Commerce Data Service. Uh, I joked in the previous session that I feel like we just closed our Series A, uh, the angel round, and now we're trying to hire great engineering talent. Very transparently, we, we have uh, not hired as much engineering talent as quickly as we would like, uh, but with tremendous support from a just wonderful set uh, of folks at the Department of Commerce. We're working basically in, in unimaginable speeds to get these folks uh, hired and put on board and put to work helping the bureaus accomplish their goals. Uh, I mean, from a legal perspective, the Commerce Data Service, uh, not legal, from a kind of uh, organizational chart, it's two people. It's two people right now, myself and Tyrone. Um, and, then, and the pure data service. We, we would not be here if it was not for Burton, for Austin, for Tanja, for the leadership from folks like Sean. We are part of a larger team, but the, the engineering folks that would be building products uh, I mean, I don't, I think also maybe we're trying to get you in a, a coding, coding school, but I don't think he's going to be directly building, yeah, he's not going to be building those products just yet. We're trying to recruit those engineers to be hands-on keys, uh, coding in open source fashion and building these products that are going to help people. In the spirit, I mean, we talked about the first win, uh, City SDK. Um, actually, this is an old version. I should have said City SDK. It says Smart Cities Data Integrator. It's a terrible name. Um, City SDK, that's what we're talking about there, and I think we've already discussed uh, that degree of a win. Um, we have in these initial experiments of what types of products we could work on, I'll say at a high level, we've identified, uh, and not even we, just that the bureaus have identified, just in working with us, uh, a set of really interesting cost savings opportunities. Basically, the old way of managing some of these data products, you can save a lot of money if you b build these new things in a way that can help people do their jobs. Not, not the core reason necessarily where we're going into these, uh, it's to support the delivery and accomplishment of each bureau's mission. Uh, but along the way, if we save a bunch of money, that should probably be a good thing. And we have. We've identified some really interesting cost savings. Um, talked about the working group already for the uh, new exporters project. There are a number of partnerships in this sprint to get as much uh, free talent <laughs> and uh, paid talent as possible to work on some of uh, these data products. We've partnered basically with a number of universities uh, at different stages. We have uh, competitions. We have some stuff going on with Berkeley. We have some stuff. University of Maryland, Harvard, and uh, a few others, probably even more. We actually just brought on a project manager to help ma oversee some of those partnerships. Uh, they're creating some really interesting stuff, and I actually may defer to, to Tyrone yeah. in a bit to tell one of those stories. So interesting enough, like we just had the launch. So we have at least like five products right now, like in a beta stage that we're going to launch in the next couple of weeks. Um, we do have a few interesting ones that are focused on you know, how do you actually detect gentrification in a particular census tract? And how do you actually figure out, as a business, like where you should actually establish yourself? Mm -hmm. um, and that's all stuff that we're working with, with um, dedicated teams of data scientists that actually want to help us get commerce data out there. Um, this week we also worked with the White House Council for Women and Girls, and we launched this, this product that was all about how do we stop the, the school to prison pipeline for young girls that you know have no other way out. So we, we are launching products. We are we have a pipeline going. Mm -hmm. It's going well. We have some initiatives going with Patent Office and Berkeley that will lead to a product probably in like two or three months. So we are we are ramping up slowly. Um, and uh, as was brought up uh, a few times earlier, we have started a set of pilots around data training. 
So this looks like guides, videos, co-location, sending people to General Assembly for short tours, bringing them back in to work alongside our data scientists before they go back to the bureaus, kind of like a detailed sabbatical, micro sabbatical types of engagements. A lot of experiments, trying to see what works, um, various levels of success. Um, but I will say kind of the, the, the high level, even at this startup stage with a lot of borrowed lent support, thank you Census Bureau, thank you PTO, thank you so many folks just taking a chance on us to see can we build stuff that's going to fundamentally help people and transform the way data is, is uh, fueling economic growth. And, you know, again, from these early experiments, it's been super exciting and it's justified greater levels of investment. Um, so I'm not, you saw this, I, I talked a little bit about the, the value proposition of the commerce data service. In our last uh, meeting, again, it was, hey, I think we're going to go do this. Okay, I'm reporting now, we're doing it, it's going to happen. And at the next time we meet, I promise you, we're going to have a team. We're going to have folks that have probably at that point even built some great stuff. Uh, there is the highest level of support and attention, Secretary Pritzker, but he's personally involved in making sure that we get the engineers we need to carry out this plan. Uh, and in collaboration with the bureaus, we're finding the right projects to work on. They're going to actually help uh, those bureaus accomplish their goals. So as uh, was brought up uh, and, and mentioned by Sham, we have these themes for how the department's going to achieve its mission on the data side. Uh, and so given that there happens to be three, uh, and given that we have, at least in the, the near-term horizon, uh, at least three CDAC meetings left, I'll just briefly advertise that we're probably going to try to organize those next meetings to align with that strategic deployment. Do a deep dive on fueling economic growth, getting to deliver, delivering data services, and then creating a data-driven government. Uh, the next session is a brief advertisement. We'll talk about this more tomorrow. We already have it basically reserved in New York City. Uh, there is a focus around entrepreneurship that has uh, been discussed from the co-chairs and some previous uh, uh, discussions, conference calls. Uh, so lo and behold, fueling economic growth, great, great way to talk about that in, in New York City. So uh, keep that in mind for January. Yeah. We're in the process of doing it. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, We're not very close. Um, January 14 and 15. We have the date and yeah. we're, I can't announce the venue yet, but we're getting closer. Getting closer. Um, and uh, before I get to the kind of the, the final question for today, and I'm with an eye on the clock and respectful of your time, um, even within the Commerce Data Service, there are, there, there's, I, we have a desire to be disciplined about exactly what we work on, what are the top three or five projects, so that we don't bleed ourselves into scope creep with the inability to deliver very distinct wins in the time that we have left. And for those of you that have stood up engineering teams, you know they're not going to be pumping out, co they're not going to really be pumping out products from day one, so to speak, in terms of way that directly measures with it, let alone where we have the time to iterate with active customers in a way that can show really sustainable adoption, right? So if you kind of do work backwards from a, uh, at least a feeling, a sense of us running out of time, there's not a, lot, it, not a lot of time really for us to get, recruit these engineers, put them to work, and create great value. So we have uh, a rigorous process. I can happy to go through it if, if it's so desired, but I'll just say at this point, we have a rigorous process to distill what are those five things you're going to go build? Who exactly is the customer? What, what is the criteria for success? Uh, at a high level, I'll, I'll just mention them very briefly now and, and then turn it over to basically the closing, closing uh, call to action here. Uh, those five trade data project, we have the income data project, and actually we, turned, we heard about the income data project at the last meeting. You all gave very good feedback on it uh, in terms of what, where we should be going and how we should be approaching it, so that continues. There's a patent data modernization product, basically continuing the roadmap again, as was discussed uh, previously. Uh, the final two, uh, commerce data usability uh, and uh, interoperability architecture. These are the final two projects that speak more to basically the UX user side and then the back-end ETL side. So that right now is our going in assumption. But within those five, all depends on the people, right? And so if we can't get them, I may scale that down to maybe two or three. Uh, but we're going to figure that out together. So uh, as the last piece here, and this may be more of a rhetorical question with an eye on the clock than an actual question. Um, Secretary Pritzker, if you don't know, she, she's a, a marathon runner and triathlete. And she has this phrase, she wants to make sure everyone's running through the tape. I did not know what that means because I'm not a runner. It, it means when you run through the end of the marathon tape, you finish, you finish what you started. Okay. So... With that said, uh, how are we going to run through the tape? What is our measures of success as a council? First session, we didn't know, what, I mean, to make, I think we're also trying to figure this stuff out, right? We're all, we're all new. Second session, we got to some really extraordinary depth of details on things like income, on patent, on workforce. Uh, 
now here, we've had an opportunity to dive deep into, I'll say, loosely environmental, oceanic, and atmospheric data. We're going to talk tomorrow about the good old-fashioned topic of cybersecurity and privacy. So these are, these are the core aspects, I would say, characteristics of data. But how are we going to measure success as a council? Why are we here? How we, can we agree on the uh, st direction we're heading strategically? How should we measure our impact as a council? Uh, and how are we going to best uh, measure those overarching metrics? Uh, now, I, I leave that uh, somewhat provocatively as the last question of the day. Uh, happy to discuss that now if anyone would like to propose some ways to approach this. Uh, or, again, out of respect for the fact that we're three minutes over, uh, if there's anyone who just wants to let that be the, the open call, happy to return to that tomorrow. I just, I just over here. Yep. Yeah, okay. There we go. Anyway, second. <laughs> Any other, well, and bef with that then, and before we get too far on that, uh, while we still have this fresh in the minds, any feedback about the way we're approaching the department's data from a strategic perspective and an operational perspective? Does it feel right? Does it sound like the kind of, are we listening to your advice appropriately and reflecting that in our direct actions? Uh, yeah, anyone, please. Yeah. Well, I just want to ask if um, this new um, European uh, Court of Justice ruling and, and the safe harbor is going to fit in with some of the you know, trade and data services. How, I don't know if you know anything new about what the Commerce Department's thinking about that, but I think that will be an important issue coming up, obviously over the next three to four months. I can, oh. um, the department has made a set of public comments in regards to that event. Uh, I am not the authority to, to speak on those details, but if that is something that you would like to have addressed, just like we, you, some folks asked last time, let's talk about cyber. If, if that is an action, we can absolutely have the appropriate experts come, we'll say, to one of the next meetings and address that topic if you'd like. Uh, is, that, is that fair, Sean? Yeah, that, that's actually fair. And in fact, um, there's a whole policy discussion that goes on through a different chain of command in the department, through the International Trade Administration, through uh, all the way up to Penny. Uh, so as I think as Ian said, if you'd like inputs on what they're thinking about, you know, I think we should get them to talk about it, but they're, they're exquisitely proactively engaged in this process. Well, I would, I would just put it to the committee to see if anyone else thinks that's important. I, I, I do think it's going to be a very important issue on, you know, cross-border data flows and just, you know, to one of the key points, fueling economic growth. Yeah. Actually, um, I would also, yeah, I, I didn't mean to cut you off there, but, but I think uh, Alan Davidson would be a great person. Alan Davidson yeah. is yeah. the director of digital economy. And he, uh, okay, yeah. so yeah. he's the, the guy who is championing the free flow of information cross-border data flows, uh, so he would be the right person. But is that a clear action? Is it, it not, not to say it's just one, one voice, but would other folks like to hear our stance on EU Safe Harbor here? I see one nodding, two, three. Okay, so we'll take that as an action item. Uh, other feedback on our plan? Uh, Vadim? Sorry, thank you. Uh, just looking at that plan, what I'm a little bit co confused is, so fuel economic growth, yes, it's external, we're fueling economic growth. Creating data-driven government, it's internal to the government. But delivering data, data services, isn't it should be part of fueling economic growth? Wouldn't be delivering data services being a way to fuel economic growth? For example, if you take unleashing weather data and climate data, that's fueling economic growth versus commerce data services that delivering data services. Uh, I think those two are very similar. So that separation uh, is unclear to me. And even more, I would say that you know, delivering data service, the data government is not in the business of creating KPIs. Mm -hmm. Data government and Department of Commerce in the bidding is in the business of fueling economic growth, mm -hmm. creating data API, creating open data sets, fuel, fuel, uh, creating new innovation is a way to fuel economic growth. Mm -hmm. But it's not separate <coughs> strategy and initiative by itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in the end, if you create five new APIs and three new services, and nobody are using it, and there is no results, who cares? Yeah, there, that's a great, great piece of feedback, and I, I think um, there is an implicit assumption that one leads to the other, but uh, I think that to say that, I mean, we can reorganize this, uh, that, for example, delivering data service is how you achieve fueling economic growth, basically kind of feeding it, great feedback, yeah. It's what I would call uh, the supporting pillar yeah. for the first two, and, and the thing is, 
what's in that third bucket is really the cross-cutting piece that cuts across all the bureaus in terms of capability. So rather than stovepipe the capability within 12 different entities, some of these cross-cutting capabilities are, th this is where you know, Dana's suggestion about how do we get to common standards mm -hmm. comes through the big data enterprise framework. This is the convening across the bureaus to, to work on problems that are not bureau specific. So maybe just visualization here because what I'm hearing you're saying, say, say, yeah. essentially saying that they, uh, delivering data services is horizontal and above of it we have two verticals which is fueling yeah, economic yeah, growth yeah, and fueling. Yeah, yeah. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. It just. Great feedback. And I lost track of who was next. Okay. I'm going to, I really agree with this. What I see here in the list are, are all the right words, and they're all the right ideas. Um, but I'm reminded that the Department of Commerce is funded through programs. Like, most of your budget is programmatic. Like, we talked, Dana and I talked about this earlier. And what you've got on the board are a lot of programs. And what I'm not sort of seeing is, what is the cross-organizational organization itself that links people together. I, th I think I sent you, you know, I'm sort of thinking in my mind the IRTPA example that I sent you in the email. Uh -huh. So for everybody who doesn't know, uh, has anybody ever heard of IRTPA before? No. Austin? <laughs> Intelligence Reform and Terrorist Prevention oh, Act of 2004, yeah. right, which came out of the 9-11 Commission, yeah. and they identified that across the federal bureaucracy there were 22 different agencies who all had different definitions of a terrorist. They all had different data repositories, they all had different processes, they all had different programs, and none of it was integrated. And so they created an integrated council as part of IRTPA. It was uh, the Bush administration, Bush uh, issued an executive order creating this council to share information between all the different parts. And they set up a data reference model, version 1, version 2, version 3, eventually it became NEEM which is now the national law enforcement data reference model that's used by law enforcement all across the country. And so what was effective about the way they approached um, data sharing was they recognized that they needed a culture of cross-organizational data sharing, and that could be facilitated by a group of people that have met on a regular basis to talk about the issues and then develop common reference metadata standards so that they could facilitate sort of like a master data management model to facilitate data sharing. And so in a way, you know, I think you have all the right bullet points on the list here, but I'm missing that organizational structure that brings people together to talk about how do we achieve this across the organization. Because what I'm afraid of is that this list of programs, um, how does it survive in the next administration? And, you know, so I'm thinking, like, we should try to build something that is systemic, that has some change, new structures that bring, that, that that bring people together to collaborate on how to improve information sharing, on how to change the culture, how to bring skills together as a set of recommendations. And maybe that's something we have to talk about in our working group to help you guys out. But you know, I think we want to deliver something that goes into the future. This is something where I think your inputs and thoughts would be useful. Um, but it's, remember, there are 12 bureaus with probably 12 different lines of appropriations with 12 different authorizing committees uh, and maybe even more authorizing committees than the 12. So to uh, create institutional frameworks um, that cut across these different bureaus is not the easiest thing. So the, the, uh, the creation of the Commerce Data Service uh, involves really convincing the value proposition of the service to the bureau so they're willing to cough up the resources to stand up the commerce data service. So it's, again, going back to this chicken or egg kind of deal, the, we are now at, a, at an interesting place that the bureaus, many of the bureaus, the key bureaus, have actually uh, invested resources some with a very, very hard-nosed business approach to it. Yeah, you shall do this, this, and this. And some with, okay, I'll give you this. Let's see what you can come up with. So we have that. This is what is helping Ian to stand up the Commerce Data Service. And now the proof of the pudding is going to be in the next six months when the folks show up and they execute and deliver and show demonstrate the value proposition of these cross-cutting things. Mm -hmm. 
Once you do that, that's when the buy-in from the, the verticals, <laughs> uh, to use Adam's point, the verticals will then buy in. Hey, this is a value proposition that really works, and we should now you know, go more along those lines, or we should continue to do our own bureau-specific things. It's all going to depend on the, the, the next, uh, I'm going to say the next 12 months. And, and you guys have a tremendous role to play, in addition to the Commerce Data Service, to make sure we do it the right way. I very much appreciate that feedback. And of course, the way you're currently structured and organized is absolutely imperative to consider in any type of organizational structures are recommended. And, and you may need you know, some type of different groups and different parts that work together. You know, but I'm sure there'll be a value in having some of the innovative groups, like what Tyrone is doing yep. or what Census is doing, mm -hmm. sharing what they're doing with other groups that may not be aware of yep. not just what they're doing, but how they accomplished it, what the trade-offs were, how they had to compromise, things like that. You know, th there's a value in sharing these organizational, we do it inside of our companies all the time, you know. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. And I, I'll share an anecdote. I probably shouldn't say who sh shared this with me, but uh, very recently I was grabbing a beer with somebody, and they said, you know, this whole data service, no one's ever tried to set something up like this at the Department of Commerce before. And I looked at this person, and I just knew that's not true. But why did, I mean, it, it's, it feels like that for a lot of people. And it's just like, okay, which part, if you're, well, the whole shared service thing, that we can actually try to work more directly, we the bureaus could try to work more directly with uh, headquarters, so to speak, and find a way to, to fundamentally break down some of these institutional silos. And I know for a fact that, that, that there are many shared services, from the hiring work to the, basically everything on the Office of General Counsel or the lawyers, those are shared services. But it's kind of perceived differently uh, for any number of reasons. And it, it is rather fascinating to see how much a, in, my, in many ways, for those who were in tech companies, a relatively simple idea. Let's hire 10 to 20 engineers, have them work on some stuff that's really valuable. That shouldn't be revolutionary. But it, can, it just feels so big. It feels so different to the folks that are, have never really experienced that, to have those engineers working inside the department. Contractors are easy. This is a, how do we build the, the skill sets internally? and have that be the way of doing business going forward. And one of the measures of success for sustainability, if someone's about to go build a data product, and I guess this is the, I know it when I see it, like, oh, we're about to go build something or buy some data stuff. Hey, has the commerce data service been brought in on this? It, it may not be working on it, but if somebody asks them, kind of like the way now, hey, we're gonna go talk to some company. Hey, has, has legal approved your ability to go talk to that company? Everyone asks that in government. No one asks that about, do you have data expertise? Are you buying software? Have you bought that software before? No one ever asked that question. And it's just like, wait, how, how did it get to that point? So that, this is a little bit of the success metric that is more on the pull side to, to Stan's point. This is less of a push. Because actually there's a little bit of a push for some bureaus. Uh, Michelle Lee was here at the, the under, uh, she's undersecretary? Yeah, but what, what's her, undersecretary, Michelle, I just want to say director. Undersecretary Michelle Lee was here last time and she, she's given a push <laughs> very explicitly, thou shalt Data service, you will work on these things, and these are the return on investments that I want, and if it does not work, you're out. Yes, I got it. F former employee of Google. Okay, I get it, right? Others were a bit more exploratory. But I, I think that, you know, that example shows that there, there is room for leadership push, and I think to Stan's point, there is, we can maybe evaluate more of how to, how to do that, um, but th at its core, this is a poll game. This is a, can I s establish the demand? Can I establish the demonstration that this is valuable? And can we you know, build up a team that itself becomes in inseparable from people's expectations for how they should be approaching these products? Um, another confession, I really struggle with this a lot, is being, this is a personal confession that I guess I'll close with. So much of my private sector experience, uh, I did not realize how clear ownership was. Uh, you work for a small company, what do you, for those of you who are probably hiring, you know, some of the smaller companies, I don't know, so the smaller tech companies at the table, new employees come in, they ask for a salary, they probably ask for options. It's a thing, right, ownership. Ownership of the company. I want to own a degree of the success. Uh, it's different, more mature companies, you know, lo loosely the GEs of the world, right? It's the, the uh, ownership is a little bit different, but they're also a little bit larger. It, and it's really funny to see the degree of ownership cultural change between the startup experience I have and the Department of Commerce, where ownership is so federated, no one knows who's in, who really owns very specific things. Or if there is clear understanding, the ownership is federated between 10, 20, 30 people. W without exaggeration, the number of folks that have been great, and again, really fantastic, to help us launch the Commerce Data Service, without exaggeration, I am, we are working, Austin, Tyrone, uh, uh, Jeff, the, the folks that are working on this, we are up to about 68 people that are involved in some way with the launch of the Commerce Data Service. 
not good or bad, just that this, just descriptive. On some level, you have to ask, you know, how many people is it going to take to to launch to hire just how many ten people? It takes sixty eight people to hire ten, really? <laughs> like, you know, not just good or bad. It's well, that's how the Department of Commerce is institutionally defined ownership. So right? just just as a point of context, yeah. uh, because Ian is standing mm -hmm. up a cross department mm -hmm. entity, right? I ran a lab which had four hundred and fifty people. I had my own budget, and even if I had to hire 20 people in six weeks, there's no way in the world I could have done that, right? And many of some of you have worked in the government, so you know this. Uh, hiring 20 people is like standing up a whole group would have taken me about a year. With all the authority, all the money in my hand, with, with the being the executive in charge and, and had the best highest priority access to HR services in my, de and I'm from NIST, so I can speak to, the NIST is pretty good at this stuff. Uh, but it would not happen in the two months he, <laughs> he is trying to do his stuff. And, and that's why I think Penny's commitment, uh, Bruce Andrews's commitment to really have this happen uh, is gonna be very useful. Uh, it, it is a, uh, oh yeah, and uh, actually I don't know if those are still questions, but uh, just a, a, to one extra uh, add on that. Um, it may not necessarily feel, you know, we meet every few months, right? Uh, so it's hard to necessarily uh, gauge the daily grind. Uh, it is a revolution and uh, a, a fun one to bring and deliver the, this data service as a means to deploy so many of the recommendations that you're making. It would not be possible without the deep trust and experience that has been earned by folks like Austin and Burton and Undersecretary Mark Jones when he was still around and Ty going through the details, uh, Jason establishing the connections to communicate what the hell we're doing, Tanja who has the institutional knowledge at Census to help us maybe understand a better hiring mechanism. It's, it's amazing. It, 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 it is absolutely a team effort. But it, to, to Sean's point, uh, man, it feels funny. For, if, if on some level it's happening so slowly, folks are like, wow, I've never seen anything like this done before. How did you get it done so fast? And we haven't even launched yet, formally. Um, so that, that's, you know, I, I bring this up as a report out, right? The, 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 this agenda topic was what's our status? How are, how are we acting on previous recommendations? A, a means to deliver on the recommendations are the people. We're focused, this is a people game. Get some folks who know how to build some of these data products inside the department. Uh, they will deliver on a tactical level, a product program level, uh, some of your previous comments, the specific recommendations, and they're working our hardest as a big team to try to get these, these folks on board so that the next time we meet, it's less of a, here's the federated aspect of how the department exists. We can report out more on, here's the great stuff we've built, and here's the impact it's having on the American people. Uh, any, f any final comments? There's still some, some uh, Austin, 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 Kevin. 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 I just want to throw in real quick. We're thinking a lot about how do we make sure we enshrine this so it lasts to the next administration. And part of the challenge is what we're kind of toying with long term is like where does the CDO and the Commerce Data Service ultimately need to reside in order to protect it. To, so we're thinking about those things. And then the, the other challenge is like we've got to prove our business case to hopefully eventually earn a budget line. And that's the other kind of really key piece. So just throw that out there. Copy, Kevin, sorry. If you go back to the other slide, you asked us for feedback on Yes, that one. You don't have training, professional development, uh, community formation. You need that. Uh, yeah, th there's a, a set of, it, yes, it's a very good point. Um, we, it's, we're not adequately communicating our intentions there. Th that's a very good point. And I, I was just going to add, if you reorient the slide so that the data service is the foundation that feeds fueling economic growth and data-driven government. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's two things that you need to either add implicitly or explicitly. Um, I'm concerned about the data quality at the ETL layer. I mean, you know, seeing the O6s in the JSON payload here on Vadim's computer. I mean, you know, the, 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 the advice that we give our customers is think about that first use experience. When somebody sees that data set for the first time, they don't want to have to go decode type coded information. So thinking about how you do that in, uh, in the stack. And then if you think about becoming a data driven government, consuming your own data services is, is the proof in my opinion.
Oh, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for the uh, fantastic participation and contributions. Uh, I've recorded no less than 12 actions here, uh, and I'll try to distill them in time for us to frame. What's that? Oh, oh really? Oh, yeah. Uh, 13, then, this time around, uh, to clean this up. Um, as a reminder for tomorrow, I'm going to turn over to, to, for, to Brent for the official uh, transition here, but uh, just because we've, we've closed over certain topics, if you have a specific interest in going back to, uh, <coughs> excuse me, a specific area that we just couldn't get to, you know, uh, Kevin, Steve, you were just trying to talk about the money of data, and then we had to go someplace else. I mean, that was actually really interesting. We didn't really get back to the benefit of user logins and what that can drive. So, that, you know, there's never, almost never enough time even after a long day. So if there's specific stuff that you want to have addressed tomorrow, please let me know. Uh, we have a few guests coming in. Uh, Steve Cooper, the department's chief information officer. Uh, and Matt Scholl, uh, basically cybersecurity expert and runs a number of programs uh, at NIST, will be uh, presenting as well. We have a couple of, uh, uh, we'll say, specific report outs from some of the, the members, and that, that's going to be our closeout. Yeah. And we also have the public comment session, and that's, yes. that's sort of evolved into a roundtable on, on the meetings, and we, that's what we've perceived. That's why we add 15 minutes to it. We usually start with whatever comments we get. Um, these will likely be coming through Twitter. Um, but, but then, it, you know, that's another place to come back and revisit issues that um, have come up for you during the, the today and tomorrow morning sessions. So with that, I think we are formally adjourned for the day. We'll convene again at 9 a.m. tomorrow. Thanks, everyone. You may. Do we have to turn our badges on the way out, or do we keep them for tomorrow? This badge you keep for tomorrow. The other badge you do too, right? Yeah, your security badge. Hold on to your security badge because that gets you in more smoothly than you came in today. This is just for us in here. No, no. Yeah, it was good. Great session. Oh, yeah. We're adjourned. We're adjourned. You, you can bring a luggage here.